Preface of With Clive in India or the Beginnings of an Empire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary Ullman. With Clive in India by G. A. Henty. Preface. In the following pages, I have endeavored to give a vivid picture of the wonderful events of the ten years which, at their commencement, saw Madras in the hands of the French, Calcutta at the mercy of the Nabob of Bengal, and English influence apparently at the point of extinction in India, and which ended in the final triumph of the English, both in Bengal and Madras. They were yet great battles to be fought great efforts to be made before the vast empire of india fell altogether into british hands but these were but the sequel of the events i have described the historical details are throughout the story strictly accurate and for them i am indebted to the history of these events written by mr ormy who lived at that time to the life of lord clive recently published by lieutenant colonel maleson and to the standard authorities in this book i have devoted a somewhat smaller space to the personal adventures of my hero than in my other historical tales but the events themselves were of such a thrilling and exciting nature that no fiction could surpass them a word as to the orthography of the names and places an entire new method of spelling indian words has lately been invented by the indian authorities this is no doubt more correct than the rough and ready orthography of the early traders and i have therefore adapted it for all little known places but there are indian names which have become household words in england and should never be changed and as it would be considered a gross piece of pedantry and affection on the part of a tourist on the continent who should on his return say he has been to geneva Firenze and ween instead of genoa florence and vienna it is i consider an even worse offence to transform arcot cornpour and lucknow into arcat cornpour and lucknow i have tried therefore so far as possible to give the names of a well-known personages and places in the spelling familiar to englishmen while the new orthography has been elsewhere adapted G. A. Henty. Chapter One Leaving Home of With Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Leaving Home. A lady in deep mourning was sitting, crying bitterly, by a fire in a small lodgings in the town of Yarmouth. Beside her stood a tall lad of sixteen. He was slight in build, but his schoolfellows knew that Charlie Marriott's muscles were as fame and hard as those of any boy in the school. In all sports requiring activity and endurance rather than weight and strength, he was always conspicuous. Not one in the school could compete with him in long-distance running, and when he was one of the hares, there was but little chance for the hounds. He was a capital swimmer, one of the best boxers in the school. He had a reputation for being a leader in every mischievous prank, but he was honorable and manly, would scorn to shelter himself under the semblance of a lie, and was a prime favorite with his masters, as well as his schoolfellows. His mother bewailed the frequency with which he returned home with blackened eyes and bruised face, for between Dr. Willett's school and the fisher lads of Yarmouth there was a standing feud, whose origins dated so far back that none of those now at school could trace it. Consequently, fierce fights often took place in the narrow rows, and sometimes the fisher boys would be driven back on the broad quay shaded by trees by the river and there being reinforced from the craft along the side would reassume the offensive and drive their opponents back into the main street it was but six months since charlie had lost his father 
who was the officer in command at the coast guard station and his scanty pension was now all that remained for the support of his widow and children his mother had talked his future prospects over many times with charlie the latter was willing to do anything but could suggest nothing his father had but little naval interests and had for years been employed on coast guard service charlie agreed that although he should have liked of all things to go to sea it was useless to think of it now for he was past the age at which he could have entered as a midshipman the matter had been talked over four years before with his father but the latter had pointed out that a life in the navy without interest is in most cases a very hard one if a chance of distinguishing himself happened promotion would follow but if not he might be for years on the shore starving on half pay and waiting in vain for an appointment while officers with more luck and better interest went over his head other professions had been discussed but nothing determined upon when lieutenant marriott suddenly died charlie although an only son was not an only child as he had two sisters both younger than himself after a few months of effort mrs marriott found that that the utmost she could hope to do with her scanty income was to maintain herself and her daughters and to educate them until they should reach an age where they could earn their own living as governesses but that charlie's keep and education were beyond her resources she had therefore very reluctantly written to an uncle whom she had not seen for many years her family having objected very strongly to her marriage with a penniless lieutenant in the navy she informed him of the loss of her husband and that although her income was sufficient to maintain herself and her daughters she was most anxious to start her son who was now sixteen in life and therefore begged him to use his influence to obtain for him a situation of some sort the letter which she now held in her hand was the answer to the appeal my dear niece it began since you by your own foolish conduct and opposition to all our wishes separated yourself from your family and went your own way in life i have heard little of you as the death of your parents so shortly afterward deprived me of all sources of information i regret to hear of the loss which you have suffered i have already taken the necessary steps to carry out your wishes i yesterday dined with a friend who is one of the directors of the honorable east india company and at my request he has kindly placed a writership in the company at your son's service he will have to come up to london to see the board next week and will probably have to embark for india a fortnight later i shall be glad if he will take up his abode with me during the intervening time i shall be glad also if you will favor me with a statement of your income and expenses with such details as you may think necessary i enclose four five pound banknotes in order that your son may obtain such garments as may be immediately needful for his appearance before the board of directors and for his journey to london i remain my dear niece yours sincerely joshua tufton it is cruel mrs marriott sobbed cruel to take you away from us and send you to india where you will most likely die of fever or be killed by a tiger or stabbed by one of those horrid neighbors in a fortnight not so bad as that mother i hope charlie said sympathizing although he could not repress a smile other people have managed to live out there and have come back safe yes mrs marriott said sobbing i know how you will come back a little yellow shriveled up old man with no liver and a dreadful temper and a black servant i know what it will be this time charlie could not help laughing that's looking too far ahead altogether mother you take the two extremes if i don't die in a fortnight i am to live to be a shriveled old man i rather take a happy medium and look forward to coming back before my liver is all gone and my temper all destroyed with well, lots of money to make you and the girls comfortable there is only one thing i wish if it had been a cadet ship instead of a writer ship this is my only comfort mrs marriott said if 
it had been a cadetship, I should have written to say that I would not let you go. It is bad enough as it is, but if you had to fight, I could not have borne it. Charlie did his best to console his mother by telling her how everyone who went to India made fortunes, and how he should be sure to come back with plenty of money, and that when the girls grew up he should be able to find rich husbands for them, and at last he succeeded in getting her to look at matters in a less gloomy light. I am sure, mother, he said, uncle means kindly. He sends twenty pounds, you see, and says that is for immediate necessities. So I have no doubt he means to help to get my Alfred, or at any rate to advance money, which I can repay him out of my salary. The letter is rather stiff and businesslike, of course, but I suppose that's the way, and you see he asks about your income, so perhaps he means to help for the girl's education. I shall go away very happy if I knew that you would be able to get on comfortably. Of course, it's a long way off, mother, and I should have liked to stay at home to be a help to you and the girls, but one can't have all one wishes. As far as I am concerned, myself, I would rather go out as a writer there, where I shall see strange sights and a strange country, and then, then be stuck all my life at a desk in London. What is Uncle like? He is a short man, my dear, rather stiff and pompous, with a very stiff cravat. He used to give me his finger to shake when I was a child, and I was always afraid of him. He married a most disagreeable woman only a year or two before I married myself, but I heard she died not very long afterwards, and so Mrs. Marriott got talking of her early days and relations and was quite in good spirits again. By the time her daughters returned from school and she told them what she was now coming to regard as the good fortune which had befallen their brother. The girls were greatly affected. They adored their brother, and the thought that he was going away for years was terrible to them. Nothing that could be said pacified them in the slightest degree, and they did nothing but cry until they retired to bed. Charlie was much affected by their sorrow, but when they had retired, he took his hat and went out to tell the news of his approaching departure to some of his chums. The next day, Mrs. Marriott wrote, thanking her uncle for his kindness and saying that Charlie would go round to London by the packet which sailed on the following Monday, and would, if the wind fair and all went well, reach London on Wednesday. School was, of course, at once given up, and the girls also had a holiday till their brother's departure. When the necessary clothes were ordered, there was little more to do, and Charlie spent the time, when his boy friends were in school, in walking with the girls along the shore, talking to them of the future of the presents he would send them home, and of the life he should lead in India, while at other times he went out with his favorite schoolfellows and joined in one last grand battle with the smack boys. On Monday morning, after a sad farewell to his family, Charlie embarked on board the Yarmouth Bell, a packet which performed the journey to and from London once a fortnight. She was a roomy lugger, built for stowage rather than speed, and her hold was crammed and her deck piled with packages of salted fish. There were five or six other persons also bound for London, the journey to which was in those days regarded as an arduous undertaking. As soon as the Yarmouth Bell issued from the mouth of the river, she began to pitch heavily, and Charlie, who, from frequently going out with his father in the revenue cutter, was a good sailor, busied himself in doing his best for his afflicted fellow passengers. Towards evening, the wind got up, and shifting ahead, the captain dropped anchor off Lowstoff. The next morning was finer, and the Yarmouth Bell continued her way. It was not, however, till Thursday afternoon that she dropped anchor in the pool. Charlie was soon on shore, and giving his truck to a porter, desired him to lead the way to Bread Street, in which his uncle resided. For in the last century, such things as country villas were almost unknown, and the merchants of London 
for the most part resided in the houses where they carried on their business keeping close to the porter to see that he did not make off with his trunk for charlie had received many warnings as to the extreme wickedness of london he followed him through the busy streets and arrived safely at his uncle's door it was now dusk and charlie on giving his name was shown upstairs to a large room which was lighted by a fire blazing in the heart standing with his back to this was a gentleman whom he had once recognized from his mother's description as his uncle although he was a good deal more portly than when she had seen him last so you are my grandnephew he said holding out what charlie considered to be a very limp and flabby hand towards him yes uncle charlie said cheerfully and we are very much obliged to mamma and i for your kindness hump the old gentleman grunted and how is it he asked severely that you were not here yesterday my niece's letter led me to expect that you would arrive yesterday we came as fast as we could uncle charlie laughed but of course the time depends upon the wind the captain tells me that he has been as much as three weeks coming round mr tufton grunted again as if to signify that such unpunctuality was altogether displeasing to him you are tall he said looking up at charlie who stood half a head above him and thin very thin you have a loose way of standing which i don't approve of i'm sorry i'm loose sir charlie said gravely if you do not approve of it but you see running about and playing games makes one listen i suppose now that's all over and i'm going to spend my time in writing i shall get stiffer i hope so i hope so mr tufton said encouragingly as if stiffness were one of the most desirable things in life i like to see young men with a sedate bearing and you left my niece and grandnieces well i hope quite well thank you sir charlie said but of course a good deal upset with parting from me yes mr tufton said i suppose so women are so emotional now there's nothing i object to more than emotion as charlie thought that this was probably the case he was silent although the idea vaguely occurred to him that he should like to excite a little emotion in his uncle by the sudden insertion of a pin or some other such means the silence continued for some time and then mr tufton said i always dine at two o'clock but as probably you are hungry i have observed that boys always are hungry some food will be served you in the next room i have already given my housekeeper orders no doubt you will find it prepared after that you may like to take a walk in the streets i have supper at nine by which hour you will of course have returned charlie as he ate his meal thought to himself that his uncle was a pompous old gentleman and that it would be very hard to work getting on with him but the next three weeks however he consoled himself by the thought kind is as kind does after all and i expect the old gentleman is not as crusty as he looks charlie had handed to mr tufton a letter which his mother had given him and when he returned from a ramble through the streets he found that gentleman sitting by the fire with lights upon a small table beside him upon this mrs marriott's letter lay open so you have soon become tired of the streets of london grandnephew he said there is not much to see sir the lamps do not burn very brightly and the fog is coming on i thought that if it grew thicker i might lose my way and in that case i might not have been here at the hour you named for supper Humph, the other gentleman grunted so your mother has taught you to be punctual to meals but no boys appetite teach them to be punctual then if never at any other time and why sir he asked severely did my niece not write to me before i don't know sir charlie said i suppose she did not like that is she didn't think that is i ain't thank you sir i like sir and said his uncle what right had she to either think or to like her duty clearly was to have made me acquainted at once with all the circumstances i suppose i had a right to say 
whether I approved of my grandnieces going tramping about the world as governesses or not. It isn't because a woman chooses by her folly to separate herself from her family that they are to be deprived of their rights in a matter of this kind. Eh, sir, what do you say to that? And Mr. Tufton looked very angry indeed. I don't know, sir, Charlie said. I have never thought the matter over. Why, sir, suppose she had made you a tinker, sir, and you turned out a thief, as likely as not you would have done, and you've been hung, sir. What then? Am I to have such discredit as this brought upon me, without my having any option in the matter? I suppose not, sir, Charlie said. I hope I shouldn't have turned out a thief, even if I'd been a tinker. But perhaps it was because my mother feared that this might be the case that she did not give you the option. His uncle looked at him keenly, but Charlie, through some difficulty, maintained the gravest face. It is well she did so, Mr. Tufton said. Very well. If she had not done so, I should have known the reason why. And you, sir, do you like the thought of going to India? Yes, uncle, I like the thought very much, though I would rather, if I may say so, have gone as a cadet. I thought so, Mr. Tufton, said sarcastically. I was sure of it. You wanted to wear a red coat and a sword and to swagger about the streets of Calcutta instead of making an honorable living and acquiring a fortune. I don't think, sir, Charlie said, that the idea of the red coat and sword entered into my mind, but it seemed to me the choice of a life of activity and adventure against one as a mere clerk. Had you entered the military service of the company, even if you didn't get shot, you could only hope to rise to the command of a regiment, ranking with a civilian very low down on the list. The stupidity of boys is unaccountable. It's a splendid career, sir, that I have opened to you, but if I'd known that you had no ambition, I would have put you into my own county house through there. That wouldn't have done either, for I know you would have blotted the ledger and turned all the accounts topsy-turvy. And now, sir, supper is ready, and the old gentleman led the way into the next room. Upon the following day, Charlie was introduced by his uncle to the director who had given him his nomination and was told by him that the board would sit upon the following day and that he must call at the India House at 11 o'clock. The ordeal was not a formidable one. He was shown into a room where eight or ten elderly gentlemen were sitting round a large table. Among these were his friend of the day before. He was asked a question or two about his age, his father's profession, and his place of education. Then the gentleman at the head of the table nodded to him and said he could go, and instructions would be sent to him, and that he was to prepare to sail in the Lizzie Anderson which would leave the docks in ten days' time, and that he would be, for the present, stationed in Madras. Much delighted at having got through the ordeal so easily, Charlie returned to his uncle's. He did not venture to penetrate into the latter's county house, but awaited his coming upstairs to dinner to tell him the news. Come, said his uncle. It is lucky they did not find out what a fool you were. At once... I was rather afraid that even the two minutes would do it. After dinner, I will send my clerk round with you to get the few things which are necessary for your voyage. I suppose you will want to, what you call, amuse yourself to see the beasts at Exeter Change and the playhouses. Here are two sovereigns. Don't get into loose company and don't get drinking, sir, or out the house you go. Charlie attempted to express his thanks, but his uncle stopped him abruptly. Hold your tongue, sir. I am doing what is right, a thing, sir, Joshua Tufton always has done, and doesn't expect to be thanked for it. All I ask you is that if you rob the company's till and are hung, don't mention that you are related to me. After dinner was over, Charlie went out under the charge of an old clerk and visited tailors' and outfitters' shops, 
and found that his uncle's idea of few necessities for a voyage differed very widely from his own the clerk in each case inquired from the tradesman what was the outfit which gentlemen going to india generally took with them and charlie was absolutely appalled at the magnitude of the orders four dozen shirts ten dozen pairs of stockings two dozen suits of white cotton cloth and everything else in proportion charlie in vain remonstrated and even implored the clerk to abstain from ordering what appeared to him such a fabulous amount of things and begged him at any rate to wait until he had spoken to his uncle the clerk however replied that he had received instructions that the full usual outfit was to be obtained and that Mr. Tufton never permitted his orders to be questioned. Charlie was forced to submit, but he was absolutely oppressed with the magnitude of his outfit to carry which six used trunks were required. It is awful, Charlie said to himself, positively awful. How much it will all come to? Goodness only knows, three or four hundred pounds at least. In those days, before steam was thought of, and the journey to India was often of six months' duration, men never came home more than once in seven years, and often remained in India from the day of their arrival until they finally retired, without once revisiting England. The outfits taken out were therefore necessarily much larger than at the present time, when a run home to England can be accomplished in three weeks, and there are plenty of shops in every town in India where all European articles of necessity or luxury can be purchased. After separating from the clerk clock, Charlie felt altogether unable to start out in search of amusement. He wandered about vaguely till supper time and then attempted to address his uncle on the subject. My dear uncle, he began, You've been so awfully kind to me that I really do not like to trespass upon you. I am positively frightened at the outfit your clerk has ordered. It is enormous. I'm sure I can't want so many things, possibly, and I would really rather take a much smaller outfit, and then, as I want them, I can have more things out from England and pay for them myself. You don't suppose, Mr. Tufton said sternly, that I'm going to have my nephew go out to india with outfit of a cabin boy i ordered that you were to have the proper outfit of a gentleman and i requested my clerk to order a considerable portion of the things to be made of a size which will allow for your growing for you look to me as if you were likely enough to run up into a lanky giant of six feet high i suppose he has done as i ordered him don't let me hear another word on the subject end of chapter one Chapter 2 of Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Young Writer. For the next four days, Charlie followed his uncle's instructions and amused himself. He visited Exeter, changed, took a boat, and rode down the river to Greenwich, and a coach, and visited the palace of Hampton Court. He went to see the coaches make their start in the morning for all places in England and marveled at the perfection of the turnouts. He went to the playhouses twice in the evening and saw Mr. Garrick in his performance as Richard the Third. On the fifth day, a great surprise awaited him. His uncle at breakfast had told him briefly that he did not wish him to go out before dinner, as someone might want to see him and Charlie, supposing that a messenger might be coming down from the India house, waited indoors, and an hour later he was astonished when the door of the room opened and his mother and sisters entered. With a shout of gladness and surprise, Charlie rushed into their arms. My dear mother, my dear girls, this is an unexpected pleasure. Indeed. Why? What has brought you here? Didn't you know we were coming, Charlie? Didn't Uncle tell you? They exclaimed. Not a word, Charlie said. I never dreamt of such a thing. What, has he called you up here to stay till I go? Oh, my dear, he has been so kind, his mother said, and so funny. He wrote me such a scolding letter, just as if I had been a very naughty little girl. He said he wasn't going to allow me to bring disgrace upon him by living in wretched lodgings at Yarmouth. 
nor by his grandnieces being sent out as governesses. So he ordered me at once, ordered me, Charlie, as if I had no will of my own, to give up the lodgings and to take our places in the coach yesterday morning. He said we were not to shame him by appearing here in rags, and he sent me a hundred pounds, every penny of which, he said, was to be laid out in clothes, and to the future, he said, it would be his duty to see that I brought no further disgrace upon the family. Yes, and he's been just as kind to me, mother, as I told you when I wrote. He had ordered an enormous outfit, which will, I am sure, cost hundreds of pounds. He makes me go to the playhouses and all sorts of amusements, and all the time he has been so kind he scolds and grumbles and predicts that I shall be hanged. I'm sure you won't, Kate, his younger sister said indignantly. How can he say such a thing? He doesn't mean it, Charlie laughed. It's only his way. He will go on just the same way with you, I have no doubt. But you mustn't mind, you know, and mustn't laugh. It must look quite grave and serious. Ah, here he is. Oh, uncle, this is kind of you. Hold your tongue, sir, said his uncle, and try and learn not to speak to you elders unless you are addressed. Niece Mary, he said, kissing her upon the forehead, I am glad to see you again. You are not so much changed as I expected. Well, these are my grandnieces, Elizabeth and Kate, though why Kate I don't know. It is a fanciful name and new to the family, and I am surprised you didn't call her Susanna after your grandmother kate made a little face at the thought of being called susanna however a warning glance from charlie closed her lips just as she was about to express her decided preference for her own name mr tufton kissed them both muttering to himself i suppose i ought to kiss them girls always expect to be kissed at every opportunity what are you laughing at grandniece I don't think girls expect to be kissed, except by people they like, Kate said. But we do like kissing you, Uncle, throwing her arms around his neck and kissing him heartily, because you have been so kind to Charlie and have brought us up to see him again. You have disarranged my white tie, niece, Mr. Tufton said, extricating himself from Kate's embrace. Niece Mary, I fear that you have not taught your daughters to restrain their emotion, and there is nothing so dreadful as emotional women. Perhaps I have not taken so much pains with their education, in that way as in some others, Mr. Marriott said, smiling. But of course, Uncle, if you object to be kissed, the girls will abstain from doing so. No, Mr. Tufton said thoughtfully. It is the duty of nieces to kiss their uncles, in moderation. In moderation, mind. And it is the duty of the uncles to receive those salutations, and I do not know that the duty is altogether an unpleasant one. I am myself unaccustomed to be kissed, but it is an operation to which I may accustom myself in time. I never heard it called an operation, Uncle, Lizzie said demurely, but I now understand the meaning of the phrase of a man's undergoing a painful operation. I used to think it meant cutting off a leg or something of that sort, but I see it is much worse. Her uncle looked at her steadily. I am afraid, Grandice, that you intend to be sarcastic. This is a hateful habit in a man, worse in a woman. Cure yourself of it as speedily as possible, or heaven help the unhappy man who may some day be your husband. And now, he said, ring the bell. The housekeeper will show you to your rooms. My nephew will tell you what are the hours for meals. Of course, you will want to be gadding about with him. You will understand there is no occasion to be in to meals. But if you are not present when they are upon the table, you will have to wait for the next. I cannot have my house turned upside down by meals being brought up at all sorts of hours. You must not expect me, niece, to be at your beck and call during the day, as I have my business to attend to. But of an evening, I shall, of course, feel... It my duty to accompany you to the playhouse. It will not do for you to be going about with only the protection of a hair-brained boy. The remainder of Charlie's stay in London passed most pleasantly. They visited all the sights of town, Mr. Tufton performing what he called his duty with an air of protest. 
but showing a general thoughtfulness and desire to please his visitors which was very apparent even when he grunted and grumbled the most on the evening before he started he called charlie down into his counting house tomorrow you are going to sail he said and to start in life on your own account and i trust that you will as far as possible be steady and do your duty to your employers you will understand that although the pay of a writer is not high there are opportunities for advancement the company have the monopoly of the trade of india and in addition to their great factories at bombay calcutta and madras they have many other trading stations those who by their good conduct attract the attention of their superiors rise to positions of trust and emolument there are many who think that the company will in time enlarge its operation and as they do so superior opportunities will offer themselves and since the subject of india has been prominently brought before my notice i have examined the question and am determined to invest somewhat largely in the stock of the company a step which will naturally give me some influence with the board that influence i shall always supposing that your current warrants it exercise on your behalf as we are now at war with france and it is possible that the vessel in which you are proceeding may be attacked by the way i have thought it proper that you should be armed you will therefore find in your cabin a brace of pistols a rifle and a double barrel shotgun which last i am informed is a useful weapon at close quarters should your avocations in india permit your doing so you will find them useful in the pursuit of game i hope that you will not be extravagant but as a matter of business i find that it is useful to be able to give entertainments to persons who may be in a position to benefit or advance you i have therefore arranged that you will draw from the factor at madras the sum of two hundred pounds annually in addition to your pay it is clearly my duty to see that my nephew has every fair opportunity for making his way now go upstairs at once to your mother i have letters to write and i am too busy for talking so saying with a peremptory wave of his hand he dismissed his nephew well mother charlie said after telling her of his uncle's generosity thank goodness you will be all right now anyhow no doubt uncle intends to do something for you and the girls though he has said nothing at present beyond the fact that you are not to be in wretched lodgings and they are not to go out as governesses but even if he should change his mind and i don't think he ever does that i shall be able to help you oh he is kind isn't he the parting was far less sad than that which had taken place at yarmouth charlie was now assured that his mother and sisters would be comfortable and well cared for in his absence while his mother happy in the lightning of her anxiety as to the future of her daughters and as to the prospects of her son was able to bear with better heart the thought of their long separation mrs marriott and the girls accompanied him on board ship mr tufton declined to join the party under the plea that in the first place he was busy and in the second that he feared there would be an emotional display he sent however his head clerk with them to escort the ladies on their return from the docks the lizzie anderson was a fine ship of the largest size and she was almost as clean and trim as a man of war she carried twelve cannons two of them thirty-two pounders which were in those days considered large pieces of ordnance all the ships of the company and indeed all ocean-going merchantmen of the day were armed as the sea swarmed with privateers and the black flag of the pirates was still occasionally to be seen the girls were delighted with all they saw as indeed was charlie for accustomed as they were only to the coasting vessels which frequented the port of yarmouth this floating castle appeared to them a vessel of stupendous size and power this was charlie's first visit also to the ship for his uncle had told him that all directions had been given that the trunks with the things necessary for the voyage would be found in his cabin at the time of starting and the rest of the luggage in the hold 
everything was in order and charlie found that his cabin companion was a doctor in the service returning to madras he was a pleasant man of some five or six and thirty and assured mrs marryat that he would soon make her son at home on board ship and would moreover put him up to the ways of things upon his arrival in india there were many visitors on board saying good-bye to their friends and all sat down to lunch serving in the saloon when this was over the bell rang for visitors to go ashore there was a short scene of parting in which charlie was not ashamed to use his handkerchief as freely as did his mother and sisters five minutes later the great vessel passed through the dock gates charlie stood at the helms waving his handkerchief as long as he could catch a glimpse of the figures of his family and then as with her sails spread and the tide gaining strength every minute beneath her the vessel made her way down the river he turned round to examine his fellow passengers these were some twenty in number and for the most part men almost all were in some capacity or other civil or military in the service of the company for at that time their monopoly was a rigid one and none outside its boundary were allowed to trade in india the company was indeed solely a great mercantile house of business they had their own ships their own establishments and brought and sold goods like other traders they owned a small extent of country round their three great trading towns and kept up a little army composed of two or three white regiments and as many composed of natives trained and disciplined like europeans and known as sepoys hence the clergyman the doctor a member of the council of madras four or five military officers twice as many civilians and three young writers beside charlie were all in the employment of the company well youngster a cheery voice said beside him take your last look at the smoke of london for it will be a good many years before you see it again my lad you've blue skies and clear ones where you're going except when it rains and when it does there is no mistake about it the speaker was the captain of the lizzie anderson a fine sailor-like man of some fifty years of which near forty had been spent in the service of the company i'm not a londoner charlie said smiling and have no regret for leaving its smoke do you think we shall make a quick voyage i hope so the captain said but it all depends upon the wind upon a ship never floated than the lizzie anderson but the company don't build their vessels for speed and it's no use trying to run when you meet a frenchman these fellows understand how to build ships and if they could fight them as well as they build them we should not long be mistress of the sea most of the people on board appeared to know each other and charlie felt rather lonely till the doctor came up and began to chat with him he told him who most of his fellow passengers were the gentleman there walking on the other side of the deck as if not only the ship but the river and banks on both sides belonged to him is one of the council that is his wife over there with a companion holding her shawl for her that pretty little woman next to her is the wife of captain tibbets the tall man leaning against the bulwarks those two sisters are going out to keep house for their uncle one of the leading men in madras and i suppose to get husbands which they will most likely do before they have been there many weeks they look very nice girls but you soon get acquainted with them all it is surprising how soon people get friendly on board ship though as a rule they quarrel like cats and dogs before they get to the end of it what do they quarrel about charlie asked surprised oh about anything and nothing the doctor said they all get heartily sick of each other and of the voyage and they quarrel because they have nothing else to do you will see we shall be as happy a party as possible till we get about as far as the cape after that the rows will begin and by the time we get to india half the people won't speak to each other have you been down the river before that's gravesend i see the captain is getting ready to anchor so i suppose the tide has nearly run out if this wind holds we shall be fairly out at sea when you get up to-morrow you snore i hope no sir i don't think so charlie said i hoped you did the doctor said because i'm told i do sometimes however as i usually smoke a cigar 
on deck the last thing i hope you will be fairly asleep before i am if at any time i get very bad and keep you awake you must shake me charlie said it took a great deal to keep him awake and that he should probably get accustomed to it ere long it is better to do that he said with a laugh than to keep on waking you for the next four or five months a week later the lizzie anderson was running down the spanish coast with all sails set she was out of sight of land and, and so far had seen nothing likely to cause uneasiness they had met many vessels homeward bound from the mediterranean and one or two big ships which the captain pronounced to be indiamen that morning however a vessel was seen coming out from the land she seemed to charlie's eyes quite a small vessel and he was surprised to see how often the captain and officers turned their glasses towards her i fancy our friend over there is a french privateer the doctor remarked to them and i should not be surprised if we found ourselves exchanging shots with her before many hours are over but she's a little bit of a thing charlie said surely she would never venture to attack a ship like ours it's the size of the guns not the size of the ship that counts my boy she has the advantage of being able to sail three feet to our two and probably small as she is she carries half as many men again as we do however we carry heavy metal and can give a good account of ourselves those thirty twos will astonish our friend if she comes within range the stranger was a large schooner and the tautness of the spars and rigging showed that she was in beautiful order she crossed the line upon which the merchantman was sailing some two miles in her rear and then bearing up followed in her wake charlie stood near the captain who instead of watching her was sweeping the horizon with his glass presently he paused and gazed intently at a distant object i thought so he said to the first officer i fancy that fellow wasn't alone he would hardly have ventured to try his strength with us if he had been send the man up to the tops and let him see what he can make out out to be i can only see her topmast but i can make out no yards presently the lookout came down and reported that the distant vessel appeared to be a large fore-and-aft schooner bearing down upon them she will not be up for two hours yet the captain said it will be getting dark then it is not likely they will engage at night but they will keep close and show their teeth at daybreak it soon became known that the belief of the captain was that the vessel in their wake and that which could be seen approaching on the beam were french privateers and soon all were preparing in their own way for what might happen the sailors cleared the decks and loosed the guns the gentlemen went below and shortly returned bringing up rifles and fowling pieces small arms and cutlasses were brought up and piled around the mast why don't you put on more sails sir mr ashmead the member of the council said to the captain my wife sir objects to the sound of firearms and i must really beg that you will increase your speed as it is we are losing rather than gaining upon that vessel behind the duty of the ships of the company is the captain added quietly not to fight if they can help it mr ashmead but unfortunately the choice upon the present occasion lies with the gentleman yonder and not with us it is not of the slightest use adding to the sail we carry for at our very best speed those schooners can sail round and round us as night comes on i intend to shorten the sail and put the ship into fighting trim in the morning i shall again increase it but i shall not make any attempt to escape a combat which it depends entirely on those privateers to bring on or not as they choose i am sorry that mrs ashme should be exposed to the unpleasantness of listening to the explosions of firearms and that my other lady passengers should be exposed to the danger which cannot but arise more or less from a naval conflict however i hope sir that there be no great anxiety as to the result the company has given us heavy armament and you may be sure that we shall all do our best seeing the gentlemen go below for their guns charlie asked one of the other young writers a lad of about his own age named peters 
with whom he had become very friendly, to go below with him. He had not yet examined the arms that his uncle had given him, for he had not thought of them since he saw the gun cases under his berth on his first arrival on board ship. He found the doctor already in his cabin, putting together a heavy double-barreled gun. Well, youngster, he said, so we're likely to have a brush. I see you have a couple of gun cases under your berth. You are a good deal better provided than most lads who go out as writers. Ah, that's a beautiful piece of yours, he said, as Charlie unlocked one of the cases and took out a rifle, small bore and heavy barrel, and beautifully finished, with a greased patch and a heavy charge that ought to carry a bullet far and true. Have you had any practice? Not with this gun, sir. I used sometimes to practice shooting at gulls with a musket on board the cutter my father commanded, and I got to be a fair shot with it. Then you ought to be able to do good work with such a piece as that. What is in the other case? Ah, oh, that's a beauty too, he said, as he examined the double-barreled gun. Made extra strong and heavy, I see, so as to carry bullets. You'll find your shoulder ache at first, but you'll get accustomed to it in time. I'm always in favor of heavy barrels. They shoot stronger and straighter than your light guns are not so liable to get bent or bruised. If a stupid servant drops one across a stone, and, after all, two or three pounds difference in weight does not make any material difference when you're accustomed to it. Although I grant a heavy gun does not come quite so quickly up to the shoulder for a snap shot. Now, Peters, Charlie said, you take the double barrel. I will use the rifle. Mine will come into play first, but as my uncle said when he gave it to me, yours will do the most execution at close quarters. At dusk, the schooners, having exchanged some signals by flags, took up their position, one on each quarter of the ship at a distance of some two miles. Do not you think, Charlie asked his friend the doctor, that they are likely to try and board us tonight? No, the doctor said. These privateers generally depend upon their long guns. They know that we shall be on the watch all night, and that in a hand-to-hand -hand fight they would lose a considerable number of men, while by keeping at a distance and maintaining a fire with those long guns, they rely upon crippling their opponents, ranging up under their stern, pouring in fire at close quarters until they surrender. Another thing is that they prefer daylight, as they can then see whether any other vessel is approaching. Were one of our cruisers to hear a cannonade in the night, he would come down and take them under way. No, I think you will see that at daylight, if the coast is clear, they will begin. Such was evidently the captain's opinion also, as he ordered sail to be still further shortened, and all save the watch on deck to turn in at once. The lights were all extinguished. Not that the captain had any idea of evading his pursuers, but that he wished to avoid offering them a mark for their fire, should they approach in darkness. End of chapter 2。Chapter 3 of With Clive in India。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Gary Ullman。A Brush with Privateers。The night passed quietly. Once or twice lights were seen as the schooners showed a lantern for a moment to notify their exact position to each other. As soon as dawn broke, every man on board the Lizzie Anderson was at his post. The schooners had drawn up a little, but were still under easy sail. The moment that the day grew clear enough for it to be perceived that no other sail could be seen above the horizon, fresh sail was spread upon the schooners, and they began rapidly to draw up. On the previous evening, the four heavy guns had been brought aft, and the India men could have made a long-running fight with her opponents, had the captain been disposed. To this, however, he objected strongly, as his vessel was sure to be hulled and knocked about severely, and perhaps some of his masts cut down. He was confident in his power to beat off the two privateers, and he therefore did not add a stitch of canvas to the easy sail under which he had been holding on all night. Presently, a puff of smoke shot out from the bow of the schooner from the weather quarter. 
followed almost instantaneously by one from her consort. Two round shocks struck up the water, the one under the India man's stem and the other under her forefoot. The rascals are well within range, the captain said quietly. See, they are taking off canvas again. They intend to keep at that distance and hammer away at us just what I thought would be their tactics. Two more shots were fired by the schooners. One flew over the deck between the mast and plunged harmlessly in the sea beyond. The other struck the hull with a dull crash. It is lucky the ladies were sent into the hole, the captain said. That shot has gone right through their cabin. Now, my lads, have you got the sights well upon them? Fire! The four thirty-two pounders spoke out almost at the same moment, and all gazed over the bulwarks anxiously to watch the effect, and a cheer rose as it was seen how accurate had been the aim of the gunners. One shot struck the schooner to windward in the bow, a foot or two above the water level. Another went through her foresail close to the mast. A foot more, and you would have cut her foremast asunder. The vessel to leeward had been struck by only one shot, the other passing under her stern. She was struck just above her deck line, the shot passing through the bulwark and, as they thought, on board the merchantmen, narrowly missing, if not actually striking, the mainmast. There is some damage done, Dr. Ray said, keeping his glass fixed on the vessel. There is a good deal of running about on deck there. It was evident that the display of the heavy metal carried by the India man was an unpleasant surprise to the privateers. Both lowered their sail and ceased firing, and there was then a rapid exchange of signals between them. They don't like it, the captain said, laughing. They see that they cannot play the game they expected and that they got to take as well as to give. Now it depends upon the sort of stuff their captains are made of whether they give it up at once or come straight up to close quarters. Ah, they mean fighting. As he spoke, a cloud of canvas was spread upon the schooners, and sailing more than two feet to the merchantman one, they ran quickly down towards her, firing rapidly as they came. Only the merchantman's heavy guns replied, but these worked steadily and coolly and did considerable damage. The bowsprit of one of their opponents was shot away. The sails of both vessels were pierced in several places, and several ragged holes were knocked in their hulls. If it were not that I do not wish to sacrifice any of the lives on board unnecessarily, the captain said, I would let them come alongside and try boarding. We have a strong crew, and with the sixty soldiers we should give them such a reception as they do not dream of. However, I will keep them off if I can. Now, Mr. James he said to the first officer. I propose to give that vessel to leeward a dose. They are keeping abreast, and by the course they are making will range alongside at about a cable's length. When I give the word, pour broadside with the guns to port upon that weather schooner. At that moment, gentlemen, he said, turning to the passengers, I shall rely upon you to pick off the steersman of the other vessel and to prevent another taking his place. She steers badly now, and the moment her helm is free, she'll run up into the wind. As she does so, I shall bear off to run across her bow and rake her deck with grape as we pass. Will you, Mr. Barlow, order your men to be in readiness to open fire with musketry upon her as we pass? The schooners were now running rapidly down upon the India man. They were only able to use the guns in their bows, and the fire of the Indiaman from the heavy guns on her quarter where it was inflicting more damage than she received. Let all hands lie down on deck, the captain orders. They will open up with their broadside guns as they come up. When I give the word, let all the guns on the port side be trained at the foot of her mainmast, and fire as you get the line. On the starboard side, lie down till I give the word. It was a pretty sight as the schooners throwing the water high up from their sharp cut waters came running along, heeling over under the breeze. As they ranged alongside, their topsails came down and a broadside from both was poured into the Indiamen. 
The great ship shook as the shot crashed into her, and several sharp cries told of the effect which had been produced. Then the captain gave the word, and a moment afterwards an irregular broadside, as the captain of each gun brought his piece to bear, was poured into the schooner from the guns on the port side. As the privateer heeled over, her deck could be plainly seen, and the shot of the Indiaman, all directed at one point, tore up a hole around the foot of the mainmast. In an instant the spar tottered and, with a crash, fell alongside. At the same moment, three of the passengers took a steady aim over the bulwark of, at the helmsman of the other privateer, and simultaneously with the reports of their pieces, the man was seen to fall. Another sprang forward to take his place, but again the rifle spoke out and he fell beside his comrade. Freed from the strain which had counteracted the pressure of her mainsail, the schooner flew up into the wind. The India man held on her course for another length, and then her helm was put up, and she swept down across the bows of the privateer. Then the men leaped to their feet. The soldiers lined the bulwarks as she passed along a few yards only distance from her foe. Each gun poured a storm of grape along her crowded deck, while the troops and passengers kept up a continuous fire of musketry. That will do, the captain said quietly. Now we may keep her on her course. They have had more than enough of it. There was no doubt of that, for the effect of the iron storm had been terrible, and the decks of the schooner were strewn with dead and dying. For a time after the merchantman had borne upon her course, the sails of the schooner flapped wildly in the wind, then the foremast went suddenly over the side. I should think you could take them both, Captain Thompson, one of the passengers said. They are as good as taken, the captain answers, and would be forced to haul down the flags if I were to wear around and continue the fight. But they would be worse than useless to me. I should not know what to do with their crews, and should have to cripple myself by putting very strong price crews upon them, and so run the risk of losing my own ship and cargo. Now my business is to trade and not to fight. If anyone meddled with me, I am ready to take my own part. But the company would not thank me if I were to risk the safety of this ship and a valuable cargo for the sake of sending home a couple of prizes, which might be recaptured as they crossed the bay and would not fetch any great sum if they got safely into port. An examination showed that the casualties on board the Lizzie Anderson amounted to three killed and eight wounded. The former were sewn in hammocks with a round shot at their feet and dropped overboard, the clergyman reading the burial service. The wounded were carried below and attended to by the ship's surgeon and Dr. Ray. The ship's decks were washed and all traces of the conflict removed. The guns were again lashed in their places. Carpenters were lowered over the side to repair the damages and when the ladies came on deck an hour after the conflict was over, two or three ragged holes in the bulwarks and a half a dozen in the sails were the sole signs that the ship had been in action. Save that some miles astern could be seen the two crippled privateers, with all sails lowered at work to repair damages. Two or three days afterwards, Charlie Marriott and his friend Peter were sitting beside Dr. Ray when the latter said, I hope that we shan't find the French in Madras when we get there. The French in Madras? Charlie exclaimed in surprise. Why, sir, there's no chance of that, is there? A very great chance, the doctor said. Don't you know that they captured the place three years ago? No, sir, I'm ashamed to say that I know nothing at all about India except that the company have trading stations at Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta. I will tell you about it, the doctor said. It is as well that you should understand the position of affairs at the place to which you are going. You must know that the company hold the town of Madras and a few square miles of land around it as tenants of the Nawab of the Carnatic, which is the name of that part of India. The French have a station at Pondicherry, 86 miles to the southwest of Madras, this is a larger and more important town than Madras, and of course the greatest rivalry 
prevails between the English and French. The French are much more powerful than the English and exercise a predominating influence throughout the Carnatic. The French governor, Monsieur Duplic, is a man of very great ability and far-seeing views. He has a considerable force of French soldiers at his command, and by the aid which he has given to the Nawab upon various occasions, he has obtained a predominating influence in his councils. When war was declared between England and France in the year 44, the English squadron under Commodore Barnett was upon the coast, and the company set out orders to Mr. Morris, the governor of Madras, to use every effort to destroy the French settlement, of whose rising power they felt the greatest jealousy. Duplic, seeing the force that could be brought against him, and having no French ships on the station, although he was aware that a fleet under Admiral Le Bourdennis was fitting out and would arrive shortly, dreaded the contest and proposed to Mr. Morse that the Indian colonies of the two nations should remain neutral and take no part in the struggle in which their respective countries were engaged. Mr. Morse, however, in view of the orders he had received from the company, was unable to agree to this. Duplex then applied to the Nawab, who, at his request, forbade his European tenants to make war on land with each other, an order which they were obliged to obey. In July, 1746, La Bourdonnais arrived with his fleet and chased the small English squadron from the Indian seas. Duplex now changed his tactics, and regardless of the injunction which he himself had obtained from the Nawab, he determined to crush the English at Madras. He supplied the fleet with men and money and ordered the admiral to sail for Madras. The fleet arrived before the town on the 14th of September, landed a portion of its troops, 600 in number, with two guns, short distance along the coast, and on the following day disembarked the rest, consisting of a 1,000 French troops, 400 sepoys, and 300 African troops, and summoned Madras to surrender. Madras was in no position to offer any effectual resistance. The fort was weak and indefensible. The English inhabitants consisted only of a hundred civilians and two hundred soldiers. Governor Morse endeavored to obtain from the Nawab the protection which he had before granted the two blacks, a demand which the Nawab at once refused. I was there at the time and quite agreed with the governor that it was useless to attempt resistance to the force brought against us. The governor therefore surrendered on the 21st. The garrison and all the civilians in a place not in the service of the company were to become prisoners of war, while those in the regular service of the company were free to depart, engaging only not to carry arms against the French until exchanged. These were the official conditions, but La Bourdonnais, influenced by jealousy of Duplex and by the promise of a bribe of 40,000 pounds, made a secret condition with Mr. Morse by which he bound himself to restore my dress in the future upon the payment of a large sum of money. This agreement, Duplex, whose heart was set upon the total expulsion of the English, refused to ratify. A good many of us considered that, by this breach of the agreement, we were released from our parole not to carry arms against the French, and a dozen or so of us, in various disguises, escaped from Madras and made our way to Fort St. David, a small English settlement twelve miles south of Pondicherry. I made the journey with a young fellow named Clive, who had come out as a writer about two years before. He was a fine young fellow, as unfitted as you are, I should think, Marriott, for the dull life of a writer, but full of energy and courage. At Fort St. David we found two hundred English soldiers and a hundred sepoys, and a number of us having nothing to do and our own work volunteered to aid the defense. After Duplex had conquered Madras, the Nawab awoke to the fact of the danger of allowing the French to become all-powerful by the destruction of the English and ordered Duplex to restore the place. Duplex refused, and the Nawab sent his son Maphus Khan to invest the town. 
Duplex at once dispatched a detachment of 230 French and 700 Sepoys, commanded by an English officer named Paradise, to raise the siege. On the 2nd of November, the garrison of Madras sallied out and drove away the cavalry of Mahfuz Khan, and on the 4th, Paradise attacked his army and totally defeated it. This, lads, was a memorable battle. It is the first time that European and Indian soldiers had come into contest, and it shows how immense is the superiority of Europeans. What Paradise did then opens all sorts of possibilities for the future, and it may be that either we or the French are destined to rise, from mere trading companies to be the rulers of Indian states. Such, I know, is the opinion of young Clive who is a very long-headed and ambitious young fellow. I remember his saying to me one night, when we were with difficulty holding our own in the trenches, that if we had but a man of energy and intelligence at the head of our affairs in southern India, we might, ere many years past, be masters of the Carnatic. I owe that it appears to be more likely that the French will be in that position and that we shall not have a single establishment left there, but time will show. Having defeated Marfas Khan, Duplex resolved to make a great effort to expel us from Fort St. David, our sole fitting left in southern India, and he dispatched an army of 900 Frenchmen, 600 sepoys, and 100 Africans, with six guns and mortars against us. They were four to one against us, and we had hot work, I can tell you. Four times they tried to storm the place, and each time we drove them back, till at last they gave it up in disgust at the end of June, having besieged us for six months. Soon after this, Admiral Boscawan, with a great fleet and an army, arrived from England, and on the 19th of August besieged Pondicherry. The besieging army was 6,000 strong, of whom 3,720 were English, but Pondicherry resisted bravely, and after two months the besiegers were forced to retire, having lost in attacks or by fever 1,065 men. At the end of the siege, in which I had served as a medical officer, I returned to England. A few months after I left, peace was made between England and France, and by its terms Duplex had to restore Madras to the English. I hear that fighting has been going on ever since, the English and French engaging as auxiliaries to rival naval princes, and especially that there was some hot fighting around Devakota. However, we shall hear about that when we get there. And what do you think will be the result of it all, Dr. Ray? I think that undoubtedly, sooner or later, either the French or ourselves will be driven out, which it will be remains to be seen. If we are expelled, the effect of our defeat is likely to operate disastrously at Calcutta, if not at Bombay. The French will be regarded as a powerful people whom it is necessary to conciliate, while we shall be treated as a nation of whom they need have no fear, and whom they can oppress accordingly. If we are successful and absolutely obtain possession of the Carnatic, our trade will vastly increase. French posts and commands of all sorts will be established, and there will be a fine career open to you, young fellow, in the service of the company. After rounding the Cape of Good Hope, the ship encountered a series of very heavy gales which drove her far out of a course up the eastern coast of Africa. In the last gale, her foremast was carried away and she put into a small island to refit. She had also sprung a leak and a number of stores were landed to enable her to be taken up into shallow water and heeled over in order that the leak might be got at. The captain hurried on the work with all speed. Had it not been for this, Charlie heard him say to Mr. Ashmead, I would have rigged a jury mast and proceeded, but I can't stop the leak from the inside without shifting a great portion of the cargo, and our hole is so full that this would be difficult in the extreme. But I own that I do not like delaying a day longer than necessary here. 
the natives have a very bad reputation beside which it is suspected that one if not more pirates have their rendezvous in these seas several of our merchantmen have mysteriously disappeared without any gale having taken place which would account for their loss the captain of a ship which reached england two or three days before we sailed brought news that when she was within a fortnight sail of the cape the sound of guns were heard one night and that afterwards a ship was seen on fire low down on the horizon he reached the spot soon after daybreak and found charred spars and other wreckage but though he cruised about all day he could find no signs of any boats complaints have been made to government and i hear that there is an intention of sending two or three sloops out here to hunt the pirates up but that will be of no use to us upon the day of their arrival at the island a native sailing boat was seen to pass across the mouth of the bay when half across she suddenly tacked round and sailed back in the direction from which she had come before proceeding to lighten the ship the captain had taken steps to put himself in a position of defence for some distance along the centre of the bay the ground rose abruptly at a distance of some thirty yards from the shore forming a sort of natural terrace behind this a steep hill rose the terrace which was forty feet above the water level extended for about a hundred yards when the ground on either side of the plateau dropped away as steeply as in front the guns were the first things taken out of the ship and regardless of the remonstrances of the passengers and what they considered to be a waste of time captain thompson had the whole of them taken up on the terrace a small battery was thrown up by the sailors at the two corners and in each of these two of the thirty-two pounders were placed the broadside guns were ranged in line along the centre of the terrace now the captain said when at the end of the second day the preparations was completed by the transport of a quantity of ammunition from the ship's magazines to the terrace i feel comfortable we can defend ourselves here against all the pirates in the south seas if they don't come we shall only have lost our two days work and shall have easy minds for the remainder of our stay here which we should not have had if we had been at the mercy of the first of those scoundrels who happened to hear of our being laid up the next morning the work of unloading the ship began the bales and packages being lowered from the ship as they were brought up from the hole into boats alongside then taken to the shore and piled there at the foot of the slope this occupied three days and at the end of that time the greater portion of the cargo had been removed the ship now several feet lighter in the water than before was broadside to shore until her keel touched the ground then the remaining cargo was shifted and by the additional aid of tackle and purchases on shore fastened to a mast she was heeled over until her keel nearly reached the level of the water it was late one evening when this work was finished and the following morning the crew were to begin to scrape a bottom and the carpenters were to repair the leak and the whole of the seams under water were to be corked and repitched hitherto all had remained on board but previous to the ship being heeled over tents constructed of the sails were erected on the terrace beds and other articles of necessity landed and the passenger and troops and crew took up their temporary abode there end of chapter three chapter four of with clive in india this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary ullman the pirates of the pacific a regular watch was set both on the plateau and on board ship towards morning one of the watch on board hailed the officer above i have fancied sir for some time that i heard noises it seems to me like the splash of a very large number of oars i've heard nothing the officer said but you might hear sounds down there coming along in the water before i do i will go down to the water's edge and listen he did so and was at once convinced that the man's ears had not deceived him although the night was perfectly still and not a breath of wind was stirring he heard a low rustling sound like that of the wind passing through the dried leaves of a forest in autumn 
You are right, Johnson. There is something going on out at sea, beyond the mouth of the bay. I will call the captain at once. Captain Thompson, on being aroused, also went down to the waterside to listen, and at once ordered the whole party to get under arms. He requested Mr. Barlow, the young lieutenant in charge of the troops, to place half his men across each end of the plateau. The back was defended by a cliff, which rose almost perpendicularly from it to a height of some hundred feet, the plateau being some thirty yards in depth from the sea face to its foot. The male passengers were requested to divide themselves into two parties and to join the soldiers in defending the position against flank attacks. The guns were all loaded, and the sailors were then set to work dragging up bales of goods from below and placing them so as to form a sort of breastwork before the guns along the sea face. The noise at sea had by this time greatly increased, and although it was still too dark to see what was passing, Captain Thompson said that he had no doubt whatever that the boats had one or more large ships in tow. Had it not been for that, he said, they would long ago have been here. I expect that they hoped to catch us napping, but the wind fell and delayed them. They little dream how well we are prepared. Did they know of our fort here? I question whether they would have ventured upon attacking us at all, but would have waited till we were well at sea, and then our chance would have been a slight one. Well, gentlemen, you will allow that the two days were not wasted. I think now the pirates are well inside the bay. In half an hour we shall have light enough to see them. There, listen. There's the splash of their anchors. There, again, I fancy there are two ships moored broadside on stem and stern. All this time the work on shore had been conducted in absolute silence, and the pirates could have had no intimation that their presence was discovered. Presently, against the faintly dawning light in the east, the masts of two vessels could be seen. One was a large ship, the other a brig. Almost at the same time, the rough sound of boats' keels grounding on the shore could be heard. Just as I thought, the word was passed along the guns that every one was to be doubly shotted, and that their fire was at first to be directed at the brig. They were to aim between wind and water, and strive to sink her as speedily as possible. As the light gradually grew brighter, the party on the plateau anxiously watched for the moment when the hull of the Indian men became plain to the enemy. These would open fire upon it, and so give the signal for the fight. At the first alarm, the tents had been leveled, and a thick barricade of bales erected round a slight depression of the plateau at the foot of the cliff in its rear. Here the ladies were placed for shelter. As the light increased, it could be seen that, in addition to the two ships, were a large number of native dows. Presently, from the black side of the ship, a jet of fire shot out, and at the signal a broadside was poured into the Indiamen by the two vessels. At the same moment, with a hideous yell, hundreds of black figures leaped to their feet on the beach and rushed towards them as yet unseen position of the English. The captain shouted fire, and the twenty guns on the plateau poured their fire simultaneously into the side of the brig. The captain then gave orders that two of the light guns should be run along the terrace to take position on the flanks and aid the soldiers against the attacks. This time Charlie had lent his rifle to Peters, and was himself armed with his double-barreled gun. Steady, boys, Mr. Hallam, the ensign who commanded the soldiers at the side where Charlie was stationed, cried, Don't fire a shot till I give the word, and then am below. With terrific yells, the throng of natives, waving curved swords, spears, and clubs, rushed forward. The steep ascent checked them, but they rushed up, within ten yards of a line of soldiers on its brow. Then Mr. Hallam gave the word to fire, and the soldiers and passengers poured a withering volley into them. At so short a distance, the effect was tremendous. Completely swept away, the leading rank fell down among their comrades, and these for a moment recoiled. Then gathering themselves, 
together they again rushed forward while those in the rear discharged volleys of arrows over their heads among the defenders every man now fought for himself loading and firing as rapidly as possible sometimes the natives nearly gained a footing on the crest but each time the defenders with clubbed muskets beat them back again the combat was however doubtful for their assailants were many hundred strong when the defendants were gladdened with a shout of make way my hearties let us come to the front and give them a dose in a moment two ship's guns loaded to the muzzle with bullets were run forward and poured their contents among the crowded masses below the effect was decisive the natives shaken by the resistance they had already experienced and appalled by the destruction wrought by the cannon turned and fled along the shore followed by the shots of the defenders and by two more rounds of grape which the sailors poured into them before they could reach their boats similar success had attended the defenders of the other flank of the position and all hands now aided in swinging round the guns which had done such good service to enable them to bear their share in the fight with the ships in the middle of the fight the party had heard a great cheer from those working the sea with guns and they now saw its cause the brig had disappeared below water and the sailors were now engaged in a contest with the ship the pirates fought their guns well but they were altogether overmatched by the twenty guns playing upon them from a commanding position already the dows were hoisting their sails and one of the cables of the ship suddenly disappeared in the water while a number of men sprang upon the ratlines fire at the mats captain thompson shouted cripple her if you can let all with musket and fires try to keep men out of the rigging the ship was anchored within three hundred yards of the shore and although the distance was too great for anything like accurate fire several of the men dropped as they ran up the shroud the sailors worked their guns with redoubled vigor and a great shout arose as the mainmast wounded in several places fell over the side sweep her decks with grape the captain shouted and she's ours mr james take all the men that can be spared from the guns man the boats and make a dash for the ship at once i see the men are leaving her they're crowding over the side into their boats most likely they'll set fire to her set all your strength putting it out we will attend to the other boats it was evident now that the pirates were deserting the ship they had fallen into a complete trap and instead of the easy prey on which they calculated found themselves crushed by the fire of a heavy battery in a commanding position captain thompson seeing that the guns of the ship were silent and that all resistance had ceased now ordered the sailors to turn their guns on the dows and sink as many as possible these crowded together in their efforts to escape offered an easy mark for the governors who shot tore through their sides smashing and sinking them in all directions in ten minutes the last of those that floated had gained the mouth of the bay and accompanied by the boats crowded with the crews of the two pirate vessels made off followed by the shot of the thirty-two pounders until they had turned the low promontory which formed the head of the bay long ere this mr james and the boat's crew had gained the vessel and were engaged in combating the fire which had broken out in three places the boats were sent back to shore and returned with captain thompson and the rest of the sailors and this reinforcement soon enabled them to get the mastery of the flames the ship was found to be the dover castle a new and very fast ship of the company's service of which all traces had been lost since she left bombay two years before she was now painted entirely black and a snake had been added for her figurette the original name however still remained upon the binnacle and the ship's bell her former armament had been increased and she now carried thirty guns of which ten were thirty-two pounders a subsequent search showed that her hold was stored with valuable goods which had by the marks upon the bales evidently belonged to several ships which she had no doubt taken and sunk after removing the pick of their cargoes the prize was a most valuable one and the captain felt that the board of directors would be highly delighted 
at the recovery of their ship and still more by the destruction of the two bands of pirates the deck of the ship was thickly strewn with dead among them was the body of a man who by his dress was evidently the captain from some of the pirates who still lived captain thompson learned that the brig was the original pirate and that she had captured the dover castle that from her and subsequent prizes they had obtained sufficient hands to man both ships all who refused to join being compelled to walk the plank these were the only two pirate ships in these seas so far as the men knew their rendezvous was at a large native town on the mainland at the mouth of a river three days sail distance the news of the india man being laid up refitted at the island was brought by the native crafts they had seen on the day after their arrival and upon its being known the natives had insisted in joining the attack the pirate captain whose interest it was to keep well with them could not refuse to allow them to join although he would gladly have dispensed with their aid believing his own force to be far more than sufficient to capture the vessel which he supposed to be lying an easy prize at his hand another ten days were spent in getting the cargo and guns on board the lizzie anderson and in fitting out both ships for sea then mr james and a portion of the crew being placed on board the prize they sailed together for india the dover castle proved to be much the faster sailor but captain thompson ordered her to reduce sail and to keep about a mile in his wake as she could at any time close up when necessary and the two together would be able to oppose a determined front even to a french frigate should they meet with one on their way the voyage passed without incident save that when rounding the southern point of a sea line, a sudden squall from the land struck them the vessel heeled over suddenly and a young soldier who was sitting on the bulwarks to leeward was jerked backwards and fell into the water charlie marriott was on the quarter-deck leaning against the rail watching a shoal of flying fish passing at a short distance in the noise and confusion caused by the sudden squall the creaking of cordage the flapping of sails and the shouts of the officer to let go the sheets the fall of the soldier was unnoticed and charlie was startled by perceiving in the water below him the figure of a struggling man he saw at once that he was unable to swim without an instant's hesitation charlie threw off his coat kicked off his shoes and with a loud shout of man overboard sprang from the taffrail and with a few vigorous strokes was alongside the drowning man he seized him by the collar and held him at a distance now he said don't struggle else i'll let you go keep quiet i can hold you up till we're picked up in spite of the injunction the man strove to grasp him but charlie at once let go his hole and swam a pace back as the man sunk when he came up he seized him again and again shouted keep quite quiet else i leave go this time the soldier obeyed him and turning him on his back and keeping his face above water charlie looked around at the vessel he had left the indian man was still in confusion the squall had been sudden and strong the sheets had been let go the canvas was flapping in the wind and the hands were aloft reducing sail he, she was already some distance away from him the sky was bright and clear and charlie who was surprised at seeing no attempt to lower a boat saw a signal run up on the masthead looking the other way he saw at once why no boat had been lowered the dover castle was but a quarter of a mile astern carrying less sail than our consort and she had been better prepared for the squall and was running down upon him at a great rate a moment later a boat was swung out on davits several men climbed into it the vessel kept on her course until scarcely more than her own length away then she suddenly rounded up into the wind and the boat was let fall and rowed rapidly towards him at this time charlie had made no effort beyond what was necessary keep his own head and his companion's face above water he now lifted the soldier's head up and shouted to him that aid was at hand in another minute they were dragged into the boat this was soon alongside the ship and three minutes later the dover castle 
was pursuing a course in the track of the lizzie anderson having signaled that the pair had been rescued charlie found that the soldier was an irish lad of some nineteen years old his name he said was tim kelly and as soon as he had recovered himself sufficiently to speak he was profuse in his professions of gratitude to his preserver tim like the majority of the recruits in the company's service had been enlisted while in a state of drunkenness had been hurried on board a guard ship where when he recovered he found a number of other unfortunates like himself he had not been permitted to communicate with his friends on shore but had been kept in close confinement until he had been put in uniform and conveyed on board the lizzie anderson half an hour before she sailed the company service was not a popular one there was no fighting in india and neither honor glory nor promotion to be won the climate was unsuited to europeans and few indeed of those who sailed from england as soldiers in the company's service ever returned the company then was driven to all sorts of straits to keep up even the small force which they then maintained in india and their recruiting agents were by no means particular as to the means they employed to make up the tale of recruits the vessels did not again communicate until they came to anchor in madras roads as the wind was fair and captain thompson anxious to arrive at his destination during these few days tim Kelly had followed charlie about like a shadow having no duties to perform on board he asked leave to act as charlie's servant and charlie was touched by the efforts which the grateful fellow made to be of service to him upon their arrival they saw to their satisfaction that the british flag was waving over the low line of earthworks which constituted the british fort not far from this near the water's edge stood the white houses and stores of the company's factors and behind these again were the low hovels of the black town the prospect was not an inviting one and charlie wondered how on earth the landing was to be effected through the tremendous surf which broke upon the shore he soon found out until the wind went down and the surf moderated somewhat no communication could be effected the next morning however the wind lulled and a crowd of curious native boats were seen pulling off from the shore charlie had after the vessel anchored rejoined the ship with tim kelly and he now bade good-bye to all on board for only the doctor two civilians and the troops were destined for madras all the rest going on in the ship to calcutta after she had discharged that portion of her cargo intended for madras charlie had during the last twelve hours been made a great deal of on account of the gallantry he had displayed in risking his life for that of the soldier peters and one of the other young riders were also to land and taking his seat with these in a native boat paddled by twelve canoemen he started for the shore as they approached the line of surf charlie fairly held his breath for it seemed impossible that the boat could live through it the boatmen however ceased rowing outside the line of broken water and lay on their paddles for three or four minutes at last a wave larger than any of its predecessors was seen approaching as it passed under them the steersman gave a shout in an instant the rowers struck their paddles into the water and the boat dashed along with the speed of a racehorse on the crest of the wave there was a crash for a moment the boat seemed to the lads engulfed in white foam and then she ran high up on the beach the rowers seized the boys and leaping out carried them beyond the reach of the water before the next wave broke upon them and then triumphantly demanding a present for their skilful management this the lads were glad to give for they considered that their escape had been something miraculous for a while they stood on the shore watching the other boats with the soldiers and baggage coming ashore and then being accosted by a gentleman in the employment of the company followed him to the residence of the chief factor here they were told that rooms would be given them in one of the houses erected by the company for the use of its employees that they would mess with the other clerks residing in the same house 
and that at nine o'clock in the morning they would report themselves as ready for work. Charlie and his friends amused themselves by sauntering about in the native town, greatly surprised by the sights and scenes which met their eyes, for in those days very little was known of India in England. They were, however, greatly disappointed. Visions of oriental splendor, of palaces and temples, of superbly dressed chiefs with bands of gorgeous retainers had floated before their mind's eye. Instead of this, they saw squalid huts, men dressed merely with a rag of cotton around them, everywhere signs of squalor and poverty. Madras, however, they were told that evening, was not to be taken as a sample of India. It was a mere collection of huts, which had sprung up round the English factories. But when they went to the real Indian city, they would see a very different state of things. End of chapter 4「Five of with Clive in India this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Gary Oman Madras after the young writers had seen the native town they returned to the beach and spent the afternoon watching the progress of landing the cargo of the Lizzie Anderson they were pleased to see their own luggage safely ashore as it would have been greatly damaged had the boat containing it been swamped, a misfortune which happened to several of the boats laden with cargo. It was very amusing each time that one of the boats arrived to see a crowd of natives rush down into the water, waist deep, seize it, and drag it up beyond the next wave. Many of them would be knocked down, and some swept out by the retreating wave, only to return on the next roller, all could swim like fish, and any of these events were greeted with shouts of laughter by the rest. When the packages were landed, a rope was put around them, and through this a long bamboo pole was inserted, which would be lifted on to the shoulders of two, four, or six porters, according to its weight, and these would go off at a hobbling sort of trot with their burden to the factory. Their own baggage was taken up to the quarters allotted to them, and at the hour named for dinner the newcomers met, for the first time, those with whom they were to be associated. All were dressed in white suits, and Charlie was struck with the pallor of their faces, and the listless air of most of them. The gentlemen to whom they had first been introduced made them acquainted with the others. How refreshingly healthy and well you look! a young man of some six and twenty years old named johnson said i was something like that when i first came out here though you'd hardly think it now eight years of stewing in this horrible hole takes the life and spirits out of anyone however there's one consolation after eight or ten years of quill driving in a stuffing room one becomes a little more one's own master and one's duties begin to be a little more varied and pleasant. One gets a chance of being set up occasionally with goods or on some message or other to one of the native princes, and then one gets treated like a prince and sees that India is not necessarily so detestable as we have contrived to make it here. The only bearable time of one's life is the few hours after dinner when one can sit in a chair in the veranda and smoke and look at the sea. Some of the fellows play billiards and cards, but if you will take my advice, you won't go in for that sort of thing. It takes a lot out of you, and fellows that do it are between you and me in the bad books of the bigwigs. Besides, they lose money, get into debt, and all sorts of mischief comes of it. The speaker was sitting between Charlie and Peters, and was talking in a low tone of voice which would not be overheard by the others. Thank you, Charlie said. I, for one, will certainly take your advice. I suppose one can buy ponies here. I should think a good ride every morning early before work would do one good. Yes, it is not a bad thing, Johnson said. A good many fellows do it when they first come out here. But after a time they lose their energy, you see, though some do keep it up. What appetites you fellows have. It does one good to see you eat. 
i have not the least idea what we are eating charlie said laughing but it's really very nice whatever it is but there seems an immense quantity of pepper or hot stuff of some kind or another which one would have thought in this tremendous heat would have made one hotter instead of cooler yes their new friend answered no doubt all this pepper and curry do heat the blood you see it is done to tempt the appetite meat here is fearfully coarse and tasteless our appetites are poor and were it not for these hot sauces we should eat next to nothing will you have some bananas they are nice and cool peter said as having peeled the long fruit as he saw his companion doing he took a bite of one but they have very little taste most of our fruit is tasteless johnson said except indeed the mango and mangosteen they are equal to any english fruit in flavor but i would give them all for a good english apple its sharpness would be delicious here and now as you have done if you will come and sit in the veranda of my room we will smoke a cigar and have something cool to drink and i will answer as well as i can the questions you've asked me about the state of things here when they had sealed themselves in the extremely comfortable cane chairs in a veranda facing the sea and had lit their cigars their friend began madras isn't much of a place now but you should have seen it before the french had it our chiefs think of nothing but trade and care nothing how squalid and miserable is the place in which they make money the french have larger ideas they transform this place cleared away that portion of the native town which surrounded the factory and fort made wide roads formed an esplanade improved and strengthened the fortifications forbade the natives to throw all their rubbish and offal on the beach and made in fact a decent place of it we hardly knew it when we came back and whatever the company may have thought we were thoroughly grateful for the french occupation one good result too is that our quarters have been greatly improved for not only did the french build several new houses but at present all the big men the council and so on are still living at fort st david which is still the seat of administration so you see we have got better quarters we are rid of the stenches and nuisances of the native town the plague of flies which made our life a burden is abated and we can sit here and enjoy the cool sea breeze without it being poisoned before it reaches us by the heaped up filth on the beach it must have wrung duplex's heart to give up the place over which they expended so much pains and after all it didn't go away with the fighting in april we sent a force from fort st david before we came back here four hundred and thirty white soldiers and a thousand sepoys under the command of captain cope to aid a fellow who had been turned out of the rajah ship of tanjore i believe he was a great blackguard and the man who had taken his place was an able ruler liked by the people then why should we interfere in behalf of the other charlie asked my dear marriott their host said compassionately you are very young yet and quite new to india you will see after a time that right has nothing at all to do with the dealings of the company in their relations to the native princes we are at present little people living here on sufferance among a lot of princes and powers who are enemies and rivals of each other we have moreover as neighbors another european colony considered stronger than we are the consequence is the question of right cannot enter into the considerations of the company it may be said that for every petty kingdom in southern india there are at least two pretenders very often half a dozen so far we have not meddled much in their quarrels but the french have been much more active that way they always side with one or the other of these pretenders and when they get the man they support into power of course he repays them for their assistance in this matter as i shall explain to you presently they have virtually made themselves masters of the carnatic outside the walls of fort st david and this place well our people thought 
to take a leaf out of the French book, and as ex Raja offered us, in payment for our aid, the possessions of Devakota, a town at the mouth of the river Colrun, a place likely to be of great use to us. We agreed to assist him. Cope, with the land forces, had marched to the border of Tanjore territory, and the guns and heavy baggage were to go by sea. But unfortunately, we had a tremendous gale just after they sailed. The admiral's flagship, the Namur, of seventy-four guns, the Pembroke of sixty, and the hospital ship Apollo were totally lost, and the rest of the fleet scattered in all directions. Cope entered the Tanjore territory, but found the whole population attached to the new Raja. It was useless for him, therefore, to march upon Tanjore, which is a really strong town, so he marched down to Devokota, where he hoped to find some of the fleet. Not a ship, however, was to be seen, and as without guns, Cope could do nothing. He returned here as we had just taken possession again. Then he went to Fort St. David, and there was a great discussion among the bigwigs. It was clear from what Cope said that our man had not a friend in his own country. Still, as he pointed out, Devakota was a most important place for us. Neither Madras nor Fort St. David had a harbor, and Devakota, therefore, where the largest ships can run up the river and anchor, would be of immense utility to us. As this was really the reason for which we had gone into the affair, it was decided to repeat the attempt. By this time, Major Lawrence, who commands the whole of the company's forces in India, and who had been taken a prisoner of one of the French sorties at the siege of Pondicherry, had been released. So he was put at the head of the expedition, and the whole of the company's English troops, 800 in all, including the artillery and 1,500 sepoys, started on board ship for Devakota. I must tell you that Lawrence is a first-rate fellow, the only really good officer we have out here, and the affair couldn't have been in the hands of a better man. The ships arrived safely at the mouth of the Colon, and the troops were landed on the bank of the river opposite the town where Lawrence intended to erect his batteries, as, in the first place, the shore behind the town was swampy, and in the second, the Raja of Tanjore, who had got news of our coming, had his army encamped there to support the place. Lawrence got his guns in position and fired away, crossed the river at the earthen wall of the town. In three days he had a breach. The enemy didn't return our fire, but occupied themselves in throwing up an entrenchment across the side of the fort. We made a raft and crossed the river, but the enemy matchlock men peppered us so severely that we lost 30 English and 50 sepoys in getting over. The enemy's entrenchment was not finished, but in front of it was a deep rivulet which had to be crossed. Lawrence gave the command of the storming party to Clive. He is one of our fellows, a queer, restless sort of chap who was really no good here, for he hated his work and always seemed to think himself a martyr. He was not a favorite among us, for he was often gloomy and discontented, though he had his good points. He was straightforward and manly, and he put down two or three fellows here, who had been given to bully the young ones in a way that astonished them. He would never have made a good servant of the company, for he so hated his work that, when he had been out here about a year, he tried to blow out his brains. He snapped the pistol twice at his head, but it didn't go off though it was loaded all right. Strange, wasn't it? So he came to the conclusion that he wasn't meant to kill himself and went on living till something should turn up. Yes, Charlie said. Dr. Ray spoke to us about him during the voyage. He knew him at the siege of Fort St. David and Pondicherry. Yes, Johnson said. He came out there quite in a new light. He got transferred into the military service and was always in the middle of the fighting. Major Lawrence had a high opinion of him, and so selected him to lead the storming party. 
It really seemed almost as if he had a charmed life. Lawrence gave him thirty-three English soldiers and seven hundred sepoys. The rest of the force were to follow as soon as Clive's party gained the entrenchments. Clive led the way with his Europeans, with the sepoy supporting behind, and got across the rivulet with a loss of only four men. He waited on the other bank till he saw the sepoys climbing up, and then again led the english on in advance towards the unfinished part of the entrenchment the sepoys however did not move but remained waiting for the main body to come up the enemy let clive and his twenty-nine men get on some distance in advance and then their cavalry which had been hidden by a projection of the fort charged suddenly down on him they were upon our men before they had time to form, and in a minute twenty-six of them were cut to pieces. Clive and the other three managed to get through the Tanjore horsemen and rejoin the sepoys. That was almost as narrow a shave for his life as with the pistol. Lawrence now crossed with his main body and advanced. Again the Tanjore horsemen charged, but this time we were prepared and lawrence let them come on till within a few yards and then gave them a volley which killed fourteen and sent the rest scampering away lawrence pushed forward the garrison panic-stricken at the defeat of their cavalry abandoned the breach and escaped to the opposite side of town and devakota was ours a few days later we captured the fortified temple of uchipurin a hundred men were left there, and these were afterwards attacked by the Raja of Tanjore with five thousand men, but they held their own and beat them off. A very gallant business, that. These affairs showed the Raja that the English could fight, a point which hitherto the natives had been somewhat sceptical about. They were afraid of the French, but they looked upon us as mere traders. He had, too, other things to trouble him as to the state of the Carnatic, and so hastened to make peace. He agreed to pay the expenses of the war and to cede us Devocata and some territory around it and to allow the wretched ex-Raja in whose cause we had pretended to fight a pension of 400 a year on condition that we kept him shut up in one of our forts. Not a very nice business on our side, was it? Still, we had gained our point, and with the exception of the ex Raja, who was a bad lot, after all, no one was discontented. When the peace was signed, our force returned to Fort St. David while they had been away. There had been a revolution in the Carnatic. Now, this was rather a complicated business. But as the whole situation at present turns upon it, and it will not improbably cause our expulsion from southern India, I will explain it to you as well as I can. Now you must know that all southern India, with the exception of a strip along the west coast, is governed by a viceroy appointed by the emperor at Delhi. He was called the Subbadar of the Deccan. Up Till the end of 48, nizam ul muluk was viceroy. About that time he died, and the emperor appointed his grandson, Musara Jung, who was the son of a daughter of his, to succeed him. But the subador had left five sons. Four of these lived at Delhi and were content to enjoy their life there. The second son, however, Nazir Jung, was an ambitious man who had rebelled even against his father. Naturally, he rebelled against his nephew. He was on the spot when his father died. When the new subadar was absent, Nazir therefore seized the reins of government and all the resources of the state. The emperor had troubles enough of his own in Delhi, and Muzaffa had no hope of aid from him. He therefore went to Satarat's court of Maratas to ask for their assistance. There he met Chunda Saib. This man was the nephew of the last Nawab of the Carnatic, Dost Ali. Dost Ali had been killed in a battle with them in 1739, 
and they afterwards captured Trichinopoli and took Chunda Sahib, who had commanded their prisoner and had since kept him at Satara. Had he been at liberty, he would no doubt have succeeded his uncle, whose only son had been murdered, but as he was at Satara, the subadar of the Deccan bestowed the government of the Carnatic upon and Warud Din. Chunda Sahib and Musafa Jung put their heads together and agreed to act in concert. Musafa, of course, desired the subadarship of the Deccan, to which he had been appointed by the court of Delhi. Chandra Sahib wanted the Nawab ship of the Carnatic and advised his ally to abandon his intention of asking for Maratha aid and to ally himself with the French. A correspondence ensued with Duplex, who, seeing the immense advantage it would be to him to gain what would virtually be the position of patron and protector of the Sabada of the Deccan and the Nawab of the Carnatic, at once agreed to join them. Muzaffar raised 30,000 men and Chunda Saab 6,000. It is always easy in India to raise an army with a certain amount of money and lavish promises, marched down and joined a French force of 400 strong commanded by Diotuel. The Nawab advanced against them but was utterly defeated at Ambur, the French doing pretty well the whole of the work. The Nawab was killed and one of his sons, Maphus Khan, taken prisoner. The other, Muhammad Ali, bolted at the beginning of the fight. Arcot, the capital of Carnatic, surrendered next day. Musafa Jung proclaimed himself Sabadar of the Deccan and appointed Chunder Sahib Nawab of the Carnatic. Musafa Jung conferred upon Duplex the sovereignty of 81 villages adjoining the French territory. Musafa, after paying a visit to Pondicherry, remained in the camp with his army twenty miles distance from that place. Chandra Sahib remained as the guest of Duplex at Pondicherry. On the receipt of the news of the Battle of Ambur, Mr. Floyer, who is governor at Fort St. David, sent at once to Chandra Sahib to acknowledge him as Nawab which, in the opinion of everyone here, was a very foolish step. Muhammad Ali had fled to Trichinopoli and sent word to Mr. Floyer that he could hold the place and even reconquer the Carnatic, if the English would assist him. I know that Admiral Boscawan, who was with the fleet at Fort St. David, urged Mr. Floyer to do so, as it was clear that Chandra Sahib would be a mere tool in the hands of the French. When Chandra Sahib delayed week after week at Pondicherry, Mr. Floyer began to hesitate, but he could not make up his mind, and Admiral Boscawan, who had received orders to return home, could no longer act in contravention to them and was obliged to sail. The instant the fleet had left, and we remained virtually defenseless, Chandra Sahib, supplied with troops and money by duplex, marched out from Pondicherry and joined Musafa Jung with the avowed intention of marching upon Trichinchapali. He had done this at once. He must have taken the place, and it was a question of weeks and days only of our being turned altogether out of southern India. Nothing, indeed, could have saved us. Musafa Jung and Chandra Sahib, however, disregarding the plan which Duplex had marked out for them, resolved, before marching on Trichinopoli, to conquer Tanjore, which is the richest city in southern India. The Raja had, only a few weeks before, made peace with him, and he now sent messages to Nazir Jung, Musafa's rival in the Deccan, and to the English, imploring their assistance. Both parties resolved at once to grant it, for alone both must have been overwhelmed by the alliance between the two Indian princes and the French, 
and their only hope of a successful resistance to this combination was in saving Trichinopoly. The march of these allies upon Tanjore opened the road to Trichinopoly, and Captain Cope, with a 120 men, were at once dispatched to reinforce Muhammad Ali's garrison. Of this little force, he sent off 20 men to the aid of the Raja of Tanjore, and these, under cover of night, passed through the lines of the besiegers and into the city, which was strongly fortified and able to stand a long siege. The English at once entered into a treaty with Nazir Jung, promising him 600 English troops to assist him in maintaining the sovereignty of the Deccan, and in aiding to place Muhammad Ali in the Nawab's ship of the Carnatic. Tanjore held out bravely for some weeks. The Raja had thrown dust in the eyes of Chandra Sahib by pretending to negotiate. Then, when the Allies attacked, he defended the city for 52 days, at the end of which one of the gates of the town had been captured, and the city was virtually at the mercy of the besiegers. He again delayed them by entering into negotiations for surrender. In vain, Duplex continued to urge Chandra Sahib to act energetically and to enter Tanjore. Chandra Sahib, however, although he had a good head for planning, is irresolute in action. His troops were discontented at the want of pay. The French contingent also was demoralized from the same cause. The troops feared to engage in a desperate struggle in the streets of a town abounding with palaces, each of which was virtually a fortress, especially as it was known that Nazir Jung was marching with all speed to fall upon their rear. So at last the siege was broken up, and the army fell back upon Pondicherry. Meanwhile, Cope's detachment of a hundred men with six thousand native horsemen escorted Muhammad Ali to join Nazir Jung at Valdor, fifteen miles from, from Pondicherry. Lawrence was busy at work at Fort St. David, organizing a force to go to his aid. Duplex saw that it was necessary to aid his allies energetically. The army on its return from the siege of Tanjore was reorganized. The French contingent increased to 2,000 men and a supply of money furnished from his private means. The army set out to attack Nazar Jung and his allies at Valdor. When the battle began, however, the French contingent mutinied and refused to fight, and the natives, panic-stricken by the desertion of their allies, fell back at Pondicherry. Chunder Sahib accompanied his men. Muzaffa Jung surrendered to his uncle the usurper. In three or four days, the discipline of the French army was restored, and on the 13th of April, it attacked and defeated a detachment of Nazar Jung's army, and a few days later captured the strong temple at Tiruvati, 16 miles from Fort St. David. Some months passed before the French were completely prepared, but on September the 1st, the Ortil, who commanded the French, and Chandra Sahib attacked the army of the native princesses, 20,000 strong, and defeated it utterly, the French not losing a single man. Muhammad Ali, with only two attendants, fled to Arcot, and the victory rendered Chandra Sahib virtual master of the Carnatic. Musafa Jung, after his surrender to his uncle, had been loaded with chains and remained a prisoner in camp where, however, he managed to win over several of the leaders of his uncle's army. Jinji was stormed by a small French force, and the French officer there entered into a correspondence with the conspirators, and it was arranged that, when the French army attacked Nazur Jung, these should declare against him. On the 15th December, the French commander, with 800 Europeans, 3,000 sepoys, and ten guns marched against Nazur Jung, whose army of 25,000 men opposed them. These, however, he defeated easily. While the battle was going on, the conspirators murdered Nazur Jung, released Mosafa Jung, 
and saluted him as Subada. His escape was a fortunate one, for his uncle had ordered him to be executed that very day. Musafa Jung proceeded to Pondicherry, where he was received with great honors. He nominated Duplex Nawab of the Carnatic and neighboring countries, which under Saib as his deputy, conferred the highest dignities upon him, and granted the French possession of all the lands and forts they had conquered. He arranged with Duplex a plan for common action, and agreed that a body of French troops should remain permanently at his capital. End of chapter 5「6 of with Clive in India this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by Gary Ullman. chapter 6 the arrival of Clive I have nearly brought down the story to the present time mr. Johnson said one event has taken place however which was of importance Muzaffar Jung set out for Hyderabad accompanied by a French contingent under Busi on the way the chiefs who had conspired against nazir jung mutinied against his successor muzaffar charged them with his cavalry two of the three chief conspirators were killed and while pursuing the third muzaffar was himself killed busi at once released from confinement a son of nazir jung proclaimed him subadar of the deccan escorted him to Hyder to hyderabad and received from him the succession of considerable fresh grants of territory to the French. The latter were now everywhere triumphant, and the tri Chinapli and Tanjore were, with the three towns held by the English, the sole places which resisted their authority. Muhammad Ali, deeming further resistance hopeless, had already opened negotiations with Duplex for the surrender of tri Chinapli. Duplex agreed to his conditions, but when Muhammad Ali found that Count Busi, with the flower of the French force, had been dispatched to Hyderabad, he gained time by raising fresh demands which would require the ratification of the Subadar. Luckily for us, Mr. Floyer had been recalled and his place taken by Mr. Sanders, who is, everyone says, a man of common sense and determination, Muhammad Ali urged upon him the necessity for the English to make common cause with him against the enemy, for if Trichinopoly fell, it would be absolutely impossible for the English to resist the French and their allies. Early this year, when Mr. Saunders assured him that he should be assisted with all our strength, and Muhammad Ali thereupon broke off the negotiations with the French. Most unfortunate for us major lawrence had gone home to england on sick leave captain gingen who now commands our troops is a wretched substitute for him captain cope is no better early this year mr saunders sent cope with two hundred and eighty english and three hundred sepoys to try kinnipley benefiting by the delay which was caused before duplex owing to the absence of his best troops in hyderabad could collect an army. Cope laid siege to Badura, but was defeated and had to abandon his guns. Three thousand of Muhammad Ali's native troops thereupon deserted to the enemy. The cause of the English now appeared lost. Duplex planted the white flags, emblems of the authority of France, in the fields within sight of Fort St. David, with immense efforts. Mr. Saunders put into the field five hundred English troops, a thousand sepoys, a hundred Africans, and eight guns, under the command of Captain Gingen, whose orders were to follow the movements of the army with which Diotil and Chundra Sahib were marching against Trichinopoly. Luckily, Chandra Sahib, instead of doing so at once, moved northward to confirm his authority in the towns of North and South Arcot, and to raise additional levy. Great delay was caused by this. On arriving before the important fortress of Valconda, Chandra Saab found before it the troops of Captain Gingen, 
who had been reinforced by sixteen hundred troops from trichinopoli the governor of the place not knowing which party was the stronger refused to yield to either and for a fortnight the armies lay at a short distance from each other near the fortress with whose governor both continued their negotiations gingen then lost patience and attacked the place but was repulsed and the governor at once admitted the french within the fortress the next day the main body of the french attacked us the guns of the fortress opening fire upon us at the same time our men a great portion of whom were recruits just joined from england fell into a panic and bolted abandoning their allies and leaving their guns ammunition and stores in the hands of the enemy luckily the ortel was laid up with gout if he had pressed on there remained only the two or three hundred men on a cope to offer the slightest resistance trichinopoli must have fallen at once and we without a hundred soldiers here should have had nothing to do but pack up and go as it was gingen's beaten men were allowed to retreat quietly towards trichinopoli the next day d'ortil was better and followed in pursuit and gingen had the greatest difficulty in reaching trichinopoli there at the present moment we lie shut up a portion of our force only remaining outside the walls the place itself is strong the town lies round the soft rock on which stands the fortress which commands the country for some distance round. Still, there is no question that the French could take it if they attacked it. Our men are utterly dispirited with defeat. Cope and Gingen had neither enterprise nor talent. At present, the enemy, who are now under the command of Colonel Law, who has succeeded the Ortil, are contenting themselves with beleaguering the place. But, as we have no troops whatever, to send to its rescue and muhammad ali has no friends elsewhere to whom to look for aid it is a matter of absolute certainty that the place must fall and then duplex will only have to request us to leave and we shall have nothing else to do but to go at once so i should advise you not to trouble yourself to unpack your luggage for in all probability another fortnight will see us on board ship there that's a tremendous long yarn i've been telling you and not a pleasant one it's a history of defeat loss of prestige and position we have been out fought and out diplomized and have made a mess of everything we put our hand to i should think you must be tired of it i am i haven't done so much talking for years charlie and peters thanked their new acquaintance warmly for the pains he had taken in explaining the various circumstances and events which had led to the present unfortunate position and charlie asked as they stood up to say good night to mr johnson what has become of clive all this time after the conquest of devacota mr johnson said the civilians in the service were called back to their posts but to show that they recognized his services the authorities allowed clive to attain the rank of captain which would have been bestowed upon him had he remained in the military service and they appointed him commissary to the army a post which would take him away from the office work he hated almost directly afterwards he got a bad attack of fever and was forced to take a cruise in the bay of bingo he came back in time to go with gingern's force but after the defeat at valconda he resigned his office i suppose in disgust and returned to fort st david in july some of the company's ships came in with some reinforcements there were no military officers left at fort st david so mr pigot a member of the council started with a large convoy of stores escorted by eighty english and three hundred sepoys clive volunteered to accompany them they had to march thirty or forty miles to verdachium a town close to the frontier of tanjore through which the convoy to trichinopoli would be able to pass unopposed but the intervening country was hostile to the english however the convoy passed unmolested and after seeing it safely to the point pigo and clive set out to return with an escort of twelve sepoys they were at once attacked and for miles a heavy fire was kept up on them seven of the escort 
were killed. The rest reached Fort St. David in safety. Pigott's report of Clive's conduct, strengthened by that previously made by Major Lawrence, induced the authorities to transfer him permanently to the army. He received a commission as captain and was sent off with a small detachment remaining at St. David's to Devakota. There he placed himself under Captain Clark, who commanded, and the whole body, numbering altogether a hundred English, fifty sepoys, with a small field piece, marched up to Trichinopoly, and I hear managed to make its way in safety. He got in about a month ago. And what force have we altogether, here and at St. David's, in case Trichinopoly falls? What with the detachment that came with you and the two others which arrived about ten days back, we have altogether about three hundred and fifty men. What on earth could these do against all the force of the Nawab and the Subador and three or four thousand French troops? The prospect certainly seemed gloomy to the extreme, and the young writers retired to their bed on this the first night of their arrival in India with the conviction that circumstances were in a desperate position. The next day they set to work, and at its end agreed that they should bear the loss of their situations and their expulsion from the country with more than resignation. It was now August. The heat was terrible, and as they sat in their shirt-sleeves at their desks, bathed in perspiration at their work of copying invoices, they felt that any possible change in circumstances would be for the better. The next day and the next still further confirmed these ideas. The nights were nearly as hot as the days. Tormented by mosquitoes, they tossed restlessly in their bed for hours, dozing off towards morning and awaking unrefreshed and worn out. When released from work at the end of the third day, Charlie and Peter strolled down together to the beach and bewailed their hard fate. There are two ships coming from the south, Charlie said presently. I wonder whether they're from England or Fort St. David. Which do you hope they will be, Peter said. I hope they're from St. David's, Charlie answered. Even if they made a quick voyage, they couldn't have left England many weeks after us. And although I should be glad to get news from home, I am still more anxious just at present for news from St. David's. Between ourselves, I long to hear of the fall of Trichinopoly. Everyone says it is certain to take place before long, and the sooner it does, the sooner we shall be out of this frightful place. After dinner, they again went down to the beach and were joined by Dr. Ray, who chatted with them as to the ships, which were now just anchoring. These had already signaled that they were from St. David's and that they had on board Mr. Sanders, the governor and a detachment of troops. Already the soldiers from the Lizzie Anderson, aided by a number of the natives, were at work pitching tents in the fort for the reception of the newcomers, and conjecture was busy on shore among the civilians as to the object of bringing troops from St. David's to Madras, that is, directly away from the scene of the action. It is one of two things, Dr. Ray said. Either Trichinopoly has surrendered, and they are evacuating Fort St. David, or they have news that the Nawab is marching to attack us here. I should think it to be the latter, for Fort St. David is a great deal stronger than this place, though the French did strengthen it during their stay here. If then the authorities have determined to abandon one of the two towns and to concentrate all their force for the defense of the other, I should have thought they would have held on to St. David's. There is a boat being lowered from one of the ships, so we shall soon have news. A signal from the ship announced that the governor was about to land, and the principal person at the factory assembled on the beach to receive him. Dr. Ray and two young riders stood a short distance from the party. As the boat was beached, Mr. Sanders sprang out, and, surrounded by those assembled to meet him, walked at once towards the factory. An officer got out from the boat and superintended the debarkation of the baggage, which a number of coolies at once placed on their heads and carried away. The officer was following him when his eye fell upon Dr. Ray. Ah, doctor, he said, how are you? 
when did you get out again from england only three or four days since captain clive i did not recognize you at first i am glad to see you again yes i have cast my slow captain clive said laughing and have thank god exchanged my pen for a sword for good you were able to fight though as a civilian dr ray said laughingly yes we have had some tough fighting behind the ramparts of st david's and in the trenches before pondicherry but we shall have sharper work still before us or i am mistaken what are they going to attack us here dr ray exclaimed oh no just the other way captain clive said we are going to carry the war into their quarters it is a secret yet must not go further and he included the two riders in his look these are two fresh comers captain clive they come out in the same ship with me this is mr marriott and this mr peters they are both brave young gentlemen and had an opportunity of proving it on the way out for we were twice engaged the first time with privateers, the second a very sharp affair with pirates. That ship lying off there is a pirate we captured. Aha, Captain Clyde said, looking keenly at the lads. Well, young gentlemen, and how do you like what you have seen of your life here? We hate it, sir, Charlie said. We would both of us a thousand times rather enlist under you as private soldiers. Oh, sir, as if there is any expedition going to take place do you think there is a chance of our being allowed to go as volunteers i will see about it captain clive said smiling trade must be dull enough here at present and we want every hand that can hold a sword or a musket in the field you are sure you can recommend them he said turning to dr ray with a smile most warmly the doctor said they both showed great coolness and courage in the affairs i spoke of have you any surgeons with you captain clive if not i hope that i shall go with any expedition that will take place the doctor here is just recovering from an attack of fever and will not be fit for weeks for the fatigues of active service may i ask who is to command the expedition i am clive said quietly you may well look surprised that an officer who has but just joined should have been selected but in fact there is no one else. Cope and Gingin are both a tri canopoly. And even if they were not, he paused, and a shrug of the shoulders expressed his meaning clearly. Mr. Saunders is good enough to feel some confidence in my capacity, and I trust that I shall not disappoint him. We are going, but this, mind, is a profound secret till the day we march to attack Arcot. It is the only possible way of relieving dry canopoly to attack arcot dr ray said astonished that does indeed appear a desperate enterprise with such a small body as you have at your command and these entirely new recruits but i recognize the importance of the enterprise if you should succeed it would draw off chunda sahib from chai canopoly it's a grand idea captain clive a grand idea though i own it seems to me a desperate one in desperate times we must take desperate measures doctor captain clive said now i must be going on after the governor i shall see you tomorrow i will not forget you young gentlemen so saying he proceeded to the factory it was after it was known that the proposal to effect a diversion by an expedition against arcot was the proposal of clive himself upon arriving in tri canopoly he had at once seen that all was lost there the soldiers were utterly dispirited and demoralized they had lost all confidence in themselves and their officers who had also lost confidence in themselves and try canopoly nothing was to be done and it must be either starved out or fall an easy prey should the enemy advance to the assault clive had then after a few days stay made his way out from the town and proceeded to fort st david where he had laid before the governor the proposal which he believed to be the only possible measure which could save the english in india the responsibility thus set before mr saunders was a grave one upon the one hand he was asked to detach half of the already inadequate garrisons of fort st david and madras upon an enterprise which 
if unsuccessful, must be followed by the loss of the British possessions, of which he was governor. He would have to take this great risk, not upon the advice of a tried veteran like Lawrence, but on that of a young man, only a month or two back a civilian, and it was to this young man, untried in command, that the leadership of this desperate enterprise must be entrusted. Upon the other hand, if he refused to take this responsibility, the fall of Tricanopoly, followed by the loss of the three English ports, was certain. But for this, no blame or responsibility could rest upon him. Many men would have chosen the second alternative. But Mr. Saunders had, since Clive returned, seen a good deal of him, and had been impressed with a strong sense of his capacity, energy, and good sense. Mr. Pigo, who had seen Clive under the most trying circumstances, was also his warm supporter, and Mr. Saunders at last determined to adapt Clive's plan and to stake the fortunes of the English in India on this desperate venture. Accordingly, leaving a hundred men only at Fort St. David, he decided to carry the remainder to Madras, and that Clive, leaving only fifty behind as a garrison there, should, with the whole available forts, march upon Arcot. The next morning, as Charlie and Peters were at breakfast, a native entered with a letter from the chief factor to the effect that their services in the office would be dispensed with, and that they were, in accordance with their request, to report themselves to Captain Clive as volunteers. No words can express the joy of the two lads at receiving the intelligence, and they created so much noise in the exuberance of their delight that Mr. Johnson came in from the next room to see what was the matter. Ah, he said, when he heard the cause of the uproar. When I first came out here, I should have done the same and should have regarded the certainty of being knocked on the head as cheerfully as you do. Eight years out here takes the enthusiasm out of a man. I shall wait quietly to see whether we are to be transferred to Calcutta or shipped back to England. A quarter of an hour later, Charlie and Peter joined Captain Clive at the camp. Ah, he said, my young friends, I am glad to see you. There is plenty for you to do at once. We shall march tomorrow, and all preparations have to be made. You will both have the rank of ensign while you serve with me. I have only six other officers, two of whom are civilians who, like yourselves, volunteered at St. David's. They are of four or five years standing, and as they speak the language, they will serve with the sepoys under one of my military officers. Another officer, who is also an ensign, will take the command of the three guns. The Europeans are divided into two companies. One of you will be attached to each. The remaining officer commands both. During the day, the lads had not a moment to themselves, and they were occupied until late at night in superintending the packing of stores and tents, and the following morning, the 26th of August, 1751, the force marched from Madras. It consisted of 200 of the company's English troops, 300 sepoys, and three small guns. They were led, as has been said, by eight European officers, of whom only Clive and another had ever heard a shot fired in action, four of the eight being young men in the civil service who had volunteered. Charlie was glad to find that among the company to which he was appointed was the detachment which had come out with him on board ship, and the moment these heard that he was to accompany them as their officer, Tim Kelly pressed forward and begged that he might be allowed to act as Charlie's servant, a request which the lad readily complied with. The march of the first day was 18 miles a distance which, in such a climate, was sufficient to try to the utmost the powers of the young recruits. The tents were soon erected, and each officer having two or three native servants, that number being indispensable in India, Charlie and Peters had one tent between them, which was shared by two other officers, as the column had moved in the lightest order possible in India. Sure, Mr. Marriott, Tim Kelly said to him confidentially, that black heaven of a cook is going to poison you. I have been watching him, and there he is putting all sorts of outlandish things into the mate. He has been pounding them upon on stones for all the world like an apothecary, 
even if he means no mischief the food isn't fit to set before a dog let alone a christian and a gentleman like yourself if you give the word sir i'll knock him over with the butt end of my musket and do the cooking for you myself i'm afraid the other officers wouldn't agree to that tim charlie said laughing the food isn't so bad as it looks and i don't think in an apprenticeship among the irish bogs is likely to have turned you out a first-rate cook tim except the course for potatoes sure now your honor i can fry a rasher of bacon with any man perhaps you might do that tim but as we've no bacon here that won't help us no we must put up with the cook and i don't think any of us will be the worse for the dinner on the morning of the twenty ninth clive reached congeveran a town of some size forty-two miles from madras here clive gained the first trustworthy intelligent as to arcot he found the garrison outnumbered his own force by two to one and that although the defences were not in a position to resist an attack by heavy guns they were capable of being defended against any force not so provided clive at once dispatched a messenger to madras begging that his two eighteen-pounders might be set after him and then without awaiting their coming he marched forward towards arcot end of chapter six chapter seven of with clive in india this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary oldman the siege of arcot from conjeverian to arcot is twenty-seven miles and the troops in spite of a delay caused by a tremendous storm of thunder and lightning reached the town in two days the garrison struck with panic at the sudden coming of a foe when they deemed themselves in absolute security at once abandoned the fort which they might easily have maintained until chunder sahib was able to send a force to relieve it the city was incapable of defence after the fort had been abandoned and clive took possession of both without firing a shot he at once set to work to store up provisions in the fort in which he found eight guns and an abundance of ammunition as he foresaw the likelihood of his having to stand a siege there and then leaving a garrison to defend it in his absence marched on the fourth of september with the rest of his forces against the enemy who had retired from the town to the mud fort of timari six miles south of arcot after a few discharges with their cannon they retired hastily and clive marched back to arcot two days later however he found that they had been reinforced and as their position threatened his line of communications he again advanced towards them he found the enemy about two thousand strong drawn up in a grove under cover of the guns of the fort the grove was enclosed by a bank in a ditch and some fifty yards away was a dry tank enclosed by a bank higher than that which surrounded the grove in this the enemy could retire when dislodged from their first position charlie's heart beat fast when he heard the order given to advance the enemy outnumbered them by five to one and were in a strong position as the english advanced the enemy's two field pieces opened upon them only three men were killed and led by their officers the men went at the grove at the double the enemy at once evacuated it and took refuge in the tank from behind whose high bank they opened fire upon the english clive at once divided his men into two columns and sent them round to attack the tank upon two sides the movement was completely successful at the same moment the men went with a rush at the banks and upon reaching the top opened a heavy fire upon the crowded mass within these at once fled in disorder clive then summoned the fort to surrender but the commander seeing that clive had no battering train refused to do so and clive fell back upon arcot again until his eighteen pounders should arrive for the next eight days the troops were engaged in throwing up defences and strengthening and victualling the fort 
the enemy gained confidence gathered to the number of three thousand and encamped three miles from the town proclaiming that they were about to besiege and at midnight on the fourteenth clive sallied out took them by surprise and dispersed them the two eighteen pounders for which clive had sent to madras were now well upon the road under the protection of a small body of sepoys and were approaching conjeverin the enemy sent considerable body of troops to cut off the guns and clive found that the small number which he had sent out to meet the approaching party would not be sufficient he therefore resolved to take the whole force leaving only sufficient to garrison the fort the post which the enemy occupied was a temple near conjerian and as this was twenty-seven miles distance the force would be obliged to be absent for at least two days as it would probably be attacked and might have to fight hard he decided on leaving only thirty europeans and fifty sepoys within the fort he appointed dr ray to the command of the post during his absence and placed charlie and peters under his orders i wonder whether they will have any fighting charlie said as the three officers looked from the walls of the fort after the departing force i wish we had gone with them peters put in but it will be a long march in the heat i should think dr ray said that they are sure to have fighting i only hope they may not be attacked at night the men are very young and inexperienced and there is nothing tries new soldiers so much as a night attack however from what i hear of their own wars i believe that night attacks are rare among them i don't know that they have any superstition on the subject as some african people have on the ground that evil spirits are about at night but the natives are certainly not brisk after nightfall they are extremely susceptible to any fall of temperature and as you have of course noticed sleep with their heads covered completely up however we must keep a sharp look at it here tonight you don't think that we are likely to be attacked sir do you it is possible we may be the doctor said they will know that captain clive has set out from here with the main body and has left only a small garrison of course they have spies and will know that there are only eighty men here a number insufficient to defend one side of this fort to say nothing of the whole circle of the walls they have already found out that the english can fight in the open and their experience at timori will make them shy of meeting us again therefore it is just possible that they may be marching in this direction today while clive is going in the other and that they may intend carrying it with a rush i should say to-day let the men repose as much as possible keep the sentries on the gates and walls but otherwise let them all have absolute quiet you can tell the whites and i will let the sepoys know that they will have to be in readiness all night and that they had better therefore sleep as much as possible to-day we will take it by turns to be on duty one going round the walls and seeing that the sentries are vigilant while the others sit in the shade and doze off if they can we must all three keep on the alert during the night dr ray said that he himself would see that all went well for the first four hours after which charlie should go on duty and the two subalterns accordingly made themselves as comfortable as they could in their quarters which were high up in the fort and possessed a window looking over the surrounding country well tim what is the matter with you they asked that soldier as he came in with an earthenware jar of water which he placed to cool in the window you look pale and it's pale i feel your honour with the life frightened fairly out of me a dozen times a day it was bad enough on the march but this place just swarms with horrible reptiles sure and it's a pity that the holy saint patrick didn't find time to pay a visit to india if he'd driven the vomit into the sea for them as he did in ireland the whole population would have become christians out of pure gratitude why your honour in the cracks and crevices of the stones of this old place there are bushels and bushels of them 
there are things they call centipedes with a million legs on each side of them and horns big enough to frighten you of all sizes up to as long as my hand and as thick as my finger and they say that a bite from one of them will put a man in a raging fever and maybe kill him then there are scorpions the savage looking little bests ye ever saw for all the world like a little lobster with his tail turned over his back and a sting at the end of it then there's spiders some of them nigh as big as a cat oh nonsense tim charlie said i don't think from what i've heard that there's a spider in india whose body is as big as a mouse it isn't their body your honor it's their legs they they're just cruel to look at it was one of them that gave me a turn a while ago i was just lying on my bed smoking my pipe when i saw one of the creatures as big as a saucer i'll take my oath walking towards me with his wicked eye fixed full on me i jumped off the bed and on to a bench that stood near by what are ye yelling about tim kelly said corporal jones to me he hears a riotous beast here corporal says i that mediating an attack on me put your foot on it man says he in mighty fine says i and i'm in my bare feet so the corporal tells pat murphy my right hand man to tackle the beast i could see pat didn't like the job either your honor he's not the boy to shrink from his duty so he comes and he takes post on the form by my side and just when the creature is making up his mind to charge us both pat jumps down upon him and squelch it sure your honor the sight of such base is enough to turn a christian man's blood the spider had no idea of attacking you kelly peter said laughing it might possibly bite you in the night though i do not think it would do so or if you took it up in your fingers the saints to find us your honor i'd as soon think of taking a tiger by the tail the corporal he's an englishman and lives in a country where they got snakes and reptiles but it's hard on an irish boy decently brought up within ten mile of cork's own town to be exposed to the like and do you know your honor when i went out into the town yesterday what should i see but a man sitting down against a wall with a little bit of a flute in his hand and a basket by his side well your honor i thought maybe he was going to play a tune when he lifts up the top of the basket and then began to play you may call it music your honor but there was neither tune nor music to it then all of a sudden two serpents in the basket lift up their heads with a great ear hanging down on each side and began to wave themselves about well tim what happened then charlie asked struggling with his laughter sure it's little i know what happened after for i just took to my heels and i never drew breath till i was inside the gates there was nothing to be frightened at tim charlie said it was a snake charmer i have never seen one yet but there are numbers of them all over india those were not ears you saw but the hood the snakes liked the music and waved their heads about in time to it i believe that although they are a very poisonous snake and their bite is certain death there is no need to be afraid of them as the charmers draw out their poison fangs when they catch them do they now tim said in admiration i wonder what the regimental barber would say to a job like that now how well nigh broke dan sullivan's joy yesterday in getting out a big tooth and then swore at the poor boy for having such a powerful strong jaw i should like to see his face if he was asked to pull out a tooth from one of them dancing serpents i brought ye in some fruits your honors i don't know what they are but you may trust me they're not poison i stopped for half an hour beside the stall till i saw some of the people of the country buying and eating them so then i judged they were safe for your honors now tim you'd better go and lie down and get asleep if the spiders will let you for you will have to be under arms all night as it is possible that we may be attacked the first part of the night passed quietly double sentries were placed at each of the angles of the walls the cannons were loaded and all ready for instant action dr ray and his two subalterns were upon the alight 
visiting the post every quarter of an hour to see that the men were vigilant. Towards two o'clock a dull sound was heard, and although nothing could be seen, the men were at once called to arms, and took up the post to which they had already been told off on the walls. The noise continued. It was slight and confused, but the natives are so quiet in their movements that the doctor did not doubt that a considerable body of men were surrounding the place, and that he was about to be attacked. Presently one of the sentries over the gateway perceived something approaching. He challenged and immediately afterwards fired. The sound of his gun seemed to serve as the signal for an assault, and a large body of men rushed forward at the gate, while at two other points a force ran up to the foot of the walls and endeavored to plant ladders. The garrison at once collected at the points of attack, few sentries only being left at intervals on the wall to give notice should any attempt be made elsewhere. From the walls a heavy fire of musketry was poured upon the masses below, while from the windows of all the houses around answering flashes of fire shot out, a rain of bullets being directed at the battlements. Dr. Ray himself commanded at the gate, one of the subalterns at each of the other points assailed. The enemy fought with great determination. Several times the ladders were planted and the men swarmed up them, but as often these were hurled back upon the crowd below. At the gate, the assailants endeavored to hew their way with axes through it, but so steady was the fire directed from the loopholes which commanded it upon those so engaged that they were each time forced to recoil with great slaughter. It was not until nearly daybreak that the attack ceased and the assailants, finding that they could not carry the place by a coup de main, fell back. The next day, the main body of the British force returned with the convoy. News arrived the following day that the enemy was approaching to lay siege to the place. The news of the capture of Arcot had produced the effect which Clyde had anticipated from it. It alarmed and irritated the besiegers of Trichinopoly, and inspired the besieged with hope and exultation. The Maharada chief of Gudi and the Raja of Mysore, with whom Muhammad Ali had for some time been negotiating, at once declared in his favor. The Raja of Tanjore and the chief of Podikata, adjoining that state, who had hitherto remained strictly neutral, now threw in their fortunes with the English, and thereby secured the communications between Trichinopoly and the coast. Chunda Sahib, Determined to lose not a moment in recovering Arcot, knowing that its recapture would at once cool the ardor of the new native allies of the English, and that with its capture, the last hope of besieged in Trichinopoly would be at an end. Continuing the siege, he dispatched three thousand of his best troops with a hundred and fifty Frenchmen to reinforce the two thousand men already near Arcot under the command of his son Riza Sahib. Thus the force about to attack Arcot amounted to 5,000 men, while the garrison under Clive's orders had, by the losses in the defense of the fort, by fever and disease, been reduced to 120 Europeans and 200 sepoys, while four out of the eight officers were hors de combat. The fort which this handful of men had to defend was in no way capable of offering a prolonged resistance. Its walls were more than a mile in circumference and were in a very bad state of repair. The rampart was narrow and the parapet low and the ditch in many places dry. The fort had two gates. These were in towers standing beyond the ditch and connected with the interior by a causeway across it. The houses in the town in many places came close up to the walls, and from their roofs the ramparts of the forts were commanded. On the 23rd September, Riza Sahib, with his army, took up his position before Arcot. The guns had not, however, arrived with the exception of four mortars, but they at once occupied all the houses near the fort, and from the walls and upper windows kept up a heavy fire on the besieged. Clive, 
determined to make an effort at once to drive them from this position and he accordingly on the same afternoon made a sortie so deadly a fire however was poured into the troops as they advanced that they were unable to make any way and were forced to retreat into the fort again after suffering heavy loss on the night of the twenty fourth charlie marriott with twenty men carrying powder were lowered from the walls and an attempt was made to blow up the houses nearest to them but little damage was done for the enemy were on the alert and they were unable to place the powder in effective positions and with a loss of ten of their number the survivors with difficulty regained the fort for the next three weeks the position remained unchanged so heavy was the fire which the enemy from their commanding position maintained that no one could show his head for a moment without running the risk of being shot only a few sentinels were kept upon the walls to prevent the risk of surprise and these had to remain stooping below the parapet every day added to the losses captain clive had a series of wonderful escapes and indeed the men began to regard him with a sort of superstitious reverence believing that he had a charmed life one of his three remaining officers seeing an enemy taking deliberate aim at him through a window endeavored to pull him aside the native changed his aim and the other officer fell dead on three other occasions sergeants who accompanied him on his rounds were shot dead by his side yet no ball touched him provisions had been stored in the fort before the commencement of the siege sufficient for sixty days and of this a third was already exhausted when on the fourteenth of october the french troops serving with riza sahib received two eighteen pounders and seven smaller pieces of artillery hitherto the besiegers had contented themselves with harassing the garrison night and day abstaining from any attack which would cost them lives upon arrival of their guns upon receiving these they at once placed them in a battery which they had prepared on the northwest of the fort and opened fire so well was this battery placed and so accurate the aim of its gunner that the very first shot dismounted one of the eighteen pounders in the fort the second again struck the gun and completely disabled it the besieged mounted their second heavy gun in its place and were prepared to open fire on the french battery when a shot struck it also and dismounted it it was useless to attempt to replace it and it was during the night removed to a portion of the walls not exposed to the fire of the enemy's battery the besiegers continued their fire and in six days had demolished the wall facing their battery making a breach of fifty feet wide clive who had now only the two young subalterns serving under him worked indefatigably his coolness and confidence of bearing kept up the courage of his little garrison and every night when darkness hid them from the view of the enemy sharpshooters the men labored to prepare for the impending attack works were thrown up inside the port to command the breach two deep trenches were dug one behind the other the one close to the wall the other some distance further back these trenches were filled with sharp iron three-point spikes and palisades erected extending from the ends of the ditches to the ramparts and a house pulled down in the rear to the height of a breastwork behind which the garrison could fire at the assailants as they endeavored across the ditches one of the three field pieces clive had brought with him he mounted on a tower flanking the breach outside two he held in reserve and placed two small guns which he had found in the fort when he took it on the flat roof of a house in the fort commanding the inside of the breach from the roofs of some of the houses around the fort the besiegers beheld the progress of these defences and riza sahib feared in spite of his enormously superior numbers to run the risk of a repulse he knew that the amount of provisions which clive had stored was not large and thinking that famine would inevitably compel his surrender shrank from incurring the risk 
of disheartening his army by the slaughter which an unsuccessful attempt to carry the place must entail he determined at any rate to increase the probability of success and utilize his superior forces by making an assault at two points simultaneously he therefore erected a battery on the southwest and began to effect a breach on that side also clive on his part had been busy endeavoring to obtain assistance his native emissaries penetrating the enemy lines carried the news of the situation of affairs in the fort to madras fort st david and trichinopoly at madras a few fresh troops had arrived from england and Mr. Saunders, feeling that Clive must be relieved at all costs, however defenseless the state of Madras might be, dispatched on the 20th of October a hundred Europeans and a hundred sepoys under Lieutenant Innes. These, after three days' marching, arrived at Trivatur, 22 miles from Arcot. Riza Sahib had heard of his approach, and sent a large body of troops with two guns to attack them. The contest was too unequal. Had the British force been provided with field pieces, they might have gained the day. But after fighting with great bravery, they were forced to fall back with a loss of 20 English and two officers killed and many more wounded, while the sepoys suffered equally severely. One of Clive's messengers reached Moriri Rio, the Maharada chief of Guti. This man was a ferocious, free-booting chief, daring and brave himself, and admiring those qualities in others. Hitherto his alliance with Muhammad Ali was little more than nominal, for he had dreaded bringing upon himself the vengeance of Chandra Sahib and the French, whose ultimate success in the strife appeared certain. Clive's march upon Arcot and the heroic defense which the handful of men there were opposing to overwhelming numbers excited his highest admiration as he afterward said he had never before believed that the english could fight and when clive's messenger reached him he had once set back a promise of insistence riza sahib learned almost as soon as clive himself that the mahrattas were on the move the prospect of his communications being harassed by these daring horsemen filled him with anxiety. Morari Rio was encamped with 6,000 men at a spot 30 miles to the west of Arcot, and he might at any moment swoop down upon the besiegers. Although, therefore, Riza Sahib had for six days been at work effecting a new breach, which was now nearly open to assault. He sent on the 30th of October a flag of truce with an offer to Clive of terms, if he would surrender Arcot. The garrison were to be allowed to march out with their arms and baggage, while to Clive himself he offered a large sum of money. In case of refusal, he threatened to storm the fort and put all its defenders to the sword. Clive returned a defiant refusal, and the guns again opened on the second breach. On the 9th of November, the Mahrattas began to show themselves in the neighborhood of the besieging army. The force under Lieutenant Innes had been reinforced and was now under the command of Captain Kilpatrick, who had 150 English troops with four field guns. This was now advancing. Four days later, the new breach had attained a width of 30 yards, but clive had prepared defences in the rear similar to those at the other breach and the difficulties of the besiegers would here be much greater as the ditch was not fordable the fifty days which the seed had lasted had been terrible ones for the garrison never daring to expose themselves unnecessarily during the day and yet ever on the alert to repel an attack laboring at night at the defenses with their numbers daily dwindling and the prospect of an assault becoming more and more imminent the work of the little garrison was terrible and it is to the defenses of lucknow and cawnpore 
a hundred years later, that we must look to find a parallel in English warfare for their endurance and bravery. Both Charlie Marriott and Peters had been wounded, but in neither case were the injuries severe enough to prevent their continuing on duty. Tim Kelly had his arm broken by a ball, while another bullet cut a deep seam along his cheek and carried away a portion of his ear. With his arm in splints and a sling, and the side of his face covered with strappings and plaster, he still went about his business. Ah, your honors, he said one day to his masters, I've often been out catching rabbits with ferrets to drive em out of their holes and sticks to knock em on the head. But as soon as they showed themselves, and it's a devarsham I was always mighty fond of, but I never quite interred into the feelings of the rabbits. Now I understand them completely, for ain't we rabbits ourselves? The officers, saving your presence, are the ferrets who turn us out of our holes on duty, and the niggers yonder, with their muskets and their matchlocks, are the men with sticks ready to knock us on the head, directly we show ourselves. If it plays, heaven, that I ever return to this old country again, I never lend a hand at rabbiting to my dying day. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of With Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Oldman. Chapter Eight: The Grand Assault. The fourteenth of November was a Mohammedan festival, and Riza Sahib determined to utilize the enthusiasm and fanatic zeal which such an occasion always excites among the followers of the Prophet to make his grand assault upon Arcot and to attack at three o'clock in the morning. Every preparation was made on the preceding day, and four strong columns told off for the assault. Two of these were to attack by the breaches, the other two at the gates. Rafts were prepared to enable the party attacking by the new breach to cross the moat, while the columns advancing against the gates were to be preceded by elephants who, with iron plates on their foreheads, were to charge and batter down the gates. Clive's spies brought him news of the intended assault, and at midnight he learned full particulars as to the disposition of the enemy. His force was now reduced to 80 Europeans and 120 sepoys. Every man was told off to his post, and then sentries being posted to arouse them at the approach of the enemy. The little garrison lay down in their places to get two or three hours sleep before the expected attack. At three o'clock the firing of three shells from the mortars into the fort gave the signal for assault. The men leaped up and stood to their arms full of confidence in their ability to resist the attack. Soon the shouts of the advancing columns testified to the equal confidence and ardor of the assailants. Not a sound was heard within the walls of the fort until the elephants advanced towards the gates. Then suddenly a stream of fire leaped out from loophole and battlement. So well directed and continuous was the fire that the elephants, dismayed at the outburst of fire and noise, and smarting from innumerable wounds, turned and dashed away, trampling in their flight multitudes of men in the dense columns packed behind them. These, deprived of the means upon which they had relied to break in the gates, turned and retreated rapidly. Scarcely less prolonged was the struggle at the breaches. At the first breach, a very strong force of the enemy marched resolutely forward. They were permitted, without a shot being fired at them, to cross the dry ditch, mount the shattered debris of the wall, and pour into the interior of the fort. Forward they advanced until, without a check, they reached the first trench bristling with spikes. Then, as they paused for a moment, from the breastwork in front of them, from the ramparts, and every spot which commanded a trench, a storm of musketry was poured on them, while the gunners swept the crowded mass with grape and bags of bullets. The effect was tremendous. Mowed down in heaps, the assailants recoiled 
and then without a moment's hesitation turned and fled three times strongly reinforced they advanced to the attack but were each time repulsed with severe slaughter still less successful were those at the other breach a great raft capable of carrying seventy conveyed the head of the storming party across the ditch and they had just reached the foot of the breach when clive who was himself at this point turned two field pieces upon them and with deadly effect the raft was upset and smashed and the column deprived of its intended means of crossing the ditch desisted from the attack among those who had fallen at the great breach was the commander of the storming party a man of great valour four hundred of his followers had also been killed and risa sahib utterly disheartened at his repulse at all points decided not to renew the attack he had still more than twenty men to each of the defenders but the obstinacy of their resistance and the moral effect produced by it upon his troops the knowledge that the Maharadi horse were hovering in his rear and that Kilpatrick's little column was close at hand determined him to raise the siege. After the repulse of the assault, the heavy musketry fire from the houses around the fort was continued. At two in the afternoon, he asked for two hours' truce to bury the dead. This was granted, and on its conclusion, the musketry fire was resumed and continued until two in the morning then suddenly it ceased under cover of the fire risa sahib had raised the siege and retired with his army to velori on the morning of the fifteenth clyde discovered that the enemy had disappeared the joy of the garrison was immense every man felt proud and happy in the thought that he had taken his share in a siege which would not only be memorable in english history till the end of time but which had literally saved india to us the little band made the fort re-echo with their cheers when the news came in caps were thrown high in the air and the men indulged in every demonstration of delight clive was not a man to lose time the men were at once formed up and marched into the abandoned camp of the enemy where they found four guns four mortars and a great quantity of ammunition a cloud of dust was seen approaching and soon a mounted officer riding forward announced the arrival of captain kilpatrick's detachment not a moment was lost for clive felt the importance of at once following up the blow inflicted by the repulse of the enemy three days were spent in continuous labor in putting the fort of arcot again in a position of defense and leaving kilpatrick in charge there he marched out with two hundred europeans seven hundred sepoys and three guns and attacked and took timari the little fort which before baffled him this done he returned towards arcot to await the arrival of a thousand mahratti horse which Morari Rio had promised him. When these arrived, however, they proved unwilling to accompany him. Upon their way, they had fallen in with a portion of Riza Sahib's retreating force and had been worsted in the attack. And as the chance of plunder seemed small, while the prospect of hard blows was certain, the freebooting horsemen refused absolutely to join in a pursuit of the retreating enemy just at this moment the news came in that reinforcements from pondicherry were marching to meet riza sahib at arni a place seventeen miles south of arcot twenty south of valori it was stated that with these reinforcements a large sum of money was being brought for the use of riza sahib's army when the mahrattas heard the news the chance of booty at once altered their intentions and they declared themselves ready to follow clive the greater portion of them however had dispersed plundering over the country and great delay was caused before they could be collected when six hundred of them had been brought together clive determined to wait no longer but started at once for arni the delay enabled riza sahib marching down from valori to meet his reinforcements 
and when Clive, after a forced march of twenty miles, approached Arni, he found the enemy composed of three hundred French troops, two thousand five hundred sepoys, and two thousand horsemen with four guns drawn up before it. Seeing their immense superiority in numbers, these advanced to the attack. Clive determined to await them where he stood. The position was an advantageous one. He occupied a space of open ground some three hundred yards in width. On his right flank was a village, on the left a grove of palm trees. In front of the ground he occupied were rice fields, which, it being the wet season, were very swampy and altogether impracticable for guns. These fields were crossed by a causeway which led to the village, but as it ran at an angle across them, those advancing upon it were exposed to the fire of the English front. Clive posted the sepoys in the village, the Mahratta horsemen in the grove, and the two hundred English with the guns on the ground between them. The enemy advanced at once. His native cavalry, with some infantry, marched against the grove, while the French troops, with about 1,500 infantry, moved along the causeway against the village. The fight began on the English left. There the Mahratta cavalry fought bravely. Issuing from the palm grove, they made repeated charges against the greatly superior force of the enemy. But numbers told, and the Mahrattas, fighting fiercely, were driven back into the palm grove, where they with difficulty maintained themselves. In the meantime, the fight was going on at the center. Clive opened fire with his guns on the long column, marching almost across his front to attack the village. The enemy, finding themselves exposed to a fire which they were powerless to answer, quitted the causeway and formed up in the rice fields, fronting the English position. The guns, protected only by a few Frenchmen and natives, remained on the causeway. Clive now dispatched two of his guns and fifty English to aid the hard-pressed Maratha in the grove and fifty others to the village with orders to join the sepoys there, to dash forward on the causeway and charge the enemy guns. As the column issued from the village along the causeway at a rapid pace, the French limbered up their guns and retired at a gala. The infantry dispatched spirited at their disappearance, fell back across the rice fields, an example which their horsemen on the right already dispirited by the loss which they were suffering from the newly arrived English musketry and the discharges of the field pieces followed without delay. Clive at once ordered a pursuit. The Mahrattas were dispatched after the enemy's cavalry, while he himself with his infantry advanced across the causeway and pressed upon the main body. Three times the enemy made a stand, but each time failed to resist the impetuosity of the pursuers, and the night alone put a stop to the pursuit, by which time the enemy were completely routed. The material loss had not been heavy, for but fifty French and a hundred and fifty natives were killed or wounded, but the army was broken up. The morale of the enemy completely destroyed, and it was proved to all southern India, which was anxiously watching the struggle, that the English were, in the field of battle, superior to their European rivals. This assurance alone had an immense effect. It confirmed, in their alliance with the English, many of the chiefs whose friendship had hitherto been lukewarm, and brought over many waverers to our side. In the fight, eight sepoys and fifty of the Mahratta cavalry were killed or disabled. The English did not lose a single man. Many of Reza Sahib's soldiers came in during the next few days and enlisted in the British force. The Mahrattas captured the treasure, the prospect of which had induced them to join the fight, and the governor of Arni agreed to hold the town for Muhammad Ali. Clive moved on at once to Conjurarium, where 30 French troops and 300 sepoys occupied the temple, a very strong building. Clive brought up two 18-pounders from Madras and pounded the walls and the enemy, 
seeing that the place must fall, evacuated it in the night and retired to Pondicherry. North Arcot being now completely in the power of the English, Clive returned to Madras and then sailed to Fort St. Davis to concert measures with Mr. Saunders for the relief of Trichinopoly. This place still held out, thanks rather to the feebleness and indecision of Colonel Law, who commanded the besiegers, than to any effort on the part of the defenders. Governor Duplex at Pondicherry had seen with surprise the result of Clive's dash upon Arcot. He had, however, perceived that the operation there was wholly secondary, and that Trichinopoly was still the all-important point. The fall of this place would more than neutralize Clive's success at Arcot, and he, therefore, did not suffer Clive's operations to distract his attention here. Strong reinforcements and a battering train were sent forward to the besiegers, and by repeated messages he endeavored to impress upon Law and Shunda Sahib the necessity of pressing forward the capture of Trichinopoly. But Duplex was unfortunate in his instruments. Law was always hesitating and doubting. Chunda Sahib, although clever to plan, was weak in action, indecisive at moments when it was most necessary that he should be firm. So then, in spite of the entreaties of Duplex, he had detached a considerable force to besiege Clive. Duplex, seeing this, and hoping that Clive might be de detained at Arcot long enough to allow of the siege of Trichinopoly being brought to a conclusion, had sent the 300 French soldiers to strengthen the force of Riza Said. He had still an overpowering force at Trichinopoly, law having 900 trained French soldiers, a park of 50 guns, 2,000 sepoys, and the army of Shandar Said, 20,000 strong. Inside Trichinopoly was a few English soldiers under Captain Cope and a small body of troops of Muhammad Ali, while outside the walls between them and the besiegers was the English force under Gingen. The men utterly dispirited, the officer without talent, resolution, or confidence. Before leaving the troops with which he had won the Battle of Arnie, Clive had expressed to the two young writers his high appreciation of their conduct during the siege of Arcot, and promised them that he would make it a personal request to the authorities at Fort St. David that they might be permanently transferred from the civil to the military branch of the service, and such a request made by him was certain to be complied with. He strongly advised them to spend every available moment of their time in the study of the native language, as without that they would be useless if appointed to command a body of sepoys. Delighted at the prospect now open to them of a permanent relief from the drudgery of a clerk's life in Madras, the young fellows were in the highest spirits, and Tim Kelly was scarcely less pleased when he heard that Charlie was now likely to be always employed with him. The boys lost not a moment in sending down to Madras to engage the services of a native Muchi or teacher. They wrote to their friend Johnson, asking him to arrange terms with the man who understood most English, and to engage him to remain with them some time. A few days later, Tim Kelly came in. Please, your honors, there's a little shriveled atomy of a man outside as wants to speak with ye. He looks for all the world like a monkey wrapped up in white clothes, but he speaks English after a fashion and has brought this letter for you. The creature scarce looks like a human being, and I misdoubt me whether you had better let him in. Nonsense, Tim, Charlie said, opening the letter. It's the Munchi we are expecting from Madras. He has come to teach us the native language. Moonshine is it. By jabbers, it's a mighty poor compliment to the moon to call him so. And is it the language you're going to learn now? Sure, Mr. Charles. I wouldn't demean myself by larning the lingo of these black heathens. Isn't for them to lime the English? And maybe, and 
mighty pleased they ought to be to get themselves to spake like christians but who's going to teach them tim oh they learn fast enough said tim you only got to point to a bottle of water or to the fire or whatever else you want and swear at them and they understand directly i tried it myself over and over again there tim it's no use standing talking any longer bring in the moonshee from that moment the little man had his permanent post in a corner of the boys room and when they were not on duty they were constantly engaged in studying the language writing down the names of every object they came across and getting it by heart and learning every sentence question and answer which occurred to them as likely to be useful as for tim he quite lost patience at this devotion to study on the part of his master who he declared to his comrades went on just as if he intended to become a nigger and a heathen himself it's just awful to hear him corporal mcbean jabbering away in that foreign talk with that little black monkey moonshine the little crater a quisting his shriveled finger about that looks as if the bones were coming through the skin i wonder what the good father at blarney where i come from you know corporal would say to sich goings on faith then and if he were here i'd buy a bottle of holy water and sprinkle it over the little haythen i suspect he'd fly straight up the chimney when it touched him my opinion of you tim kelly the corporal who was a grave scotchman said you're just a fuel your master is a brave young gentleman and is a deal more sensible than most of them who spend all their time in drinking wine and playing cards a knowledge of the language is most useful what would you do yourself if you were to marry a native woman and couldn't speak to her afterwards the saints the fondest the tim exclaimed and what put such an idea in your head corporal it's neither more nor less than an insult to suppose that I, a decent boy, and brought up under the teachings of Father O'Shea, should marry a heathen black woman, and if you weren't my superior officer, Corporal, I'd teach you better manners. Fortunately, at this moment, Charlie's voice was heard, shouting for his servant, and Tim was therefore saved from the breach of the peace, which his indignation showed that he mediated. December passed quietly, and then in January 1752, an insurrection planned by Duplex broke out. The governor of Pondicherry had been suffering keenly from disappointments, which, as time went on, and his entreaties and commands to law to attack Trichinopoly were answered only by excuses and reasons for delay grew to despair and he resolved upon making another effort to occupy the attention of the man in whom he already recognized a great rival and to prevent his taking steps for the relief of trichinopoly law had over and over again assured him that in the course of a very few weeks that place would be driven by famine to surrender and as soon as clive arrived at port st david Duplex set about taking steps which would again necessitate his return to the north and so give to law the time which he asked for. Supplies of money were sent to Riza Sahib, together with 400 French soldiers. These marched suddenly upon Puneri Mali and captured it, seized again the fortified temple of Conjurarium, and from this point threatened both Madras and Arcot had this force possessed an active and determined commander it could undoubtedly carry out duplex's instructions captured madras and inflicted a terrible blow upon the english fortunately it had no such head it marched indeed against madras plundered and burnt the factories levied contributions and obtained possession of everything but the fort where the civilians and a few men who constituted the garrison daily expected to be attacked, in which case the place must have fallen. This, however, the enemy never even attempted, contenting themselves with ravaging the place outside the walls of the fort. The little garrison of Arcot, 200 men in all, were astonished at the news that the province, which they had thought completely conquered, was again in flames, 
that the road to madras was cut by the occupation of conjuvarium by the french and that madras itself was save the fort in the hands of the enemy the fort itself they knew might easily be taken as they were aware that it was defended by only eighty men the change in the position was at once manifest in the altered attitude of the fickle population the main body of the inhabitants of southern india were hindus who had for centuries been ruled by foreign masters the mohammedans from the north had been their conquerors and the countless wars which had taken place to them signified merely whether one family or another were to reign over them the sole desire was for peace and protection and they therefore ever inclined towards the side which seemed strongest their sympathies were no stronger with their mohammedan rulers than with the french or english and they only hoped that whatever power was strongest might conquer and that after the hostilities were over their daily work might be conducted in peace and their property and possessions be enjoyed in security the capture and defence of arcot and the battle of arni had brought them to regard the english as their final victors and the signs of deep and ever servile respect which greeted the conquerors wherever they went and which absolutely disgusted charlie marryat and his friend were really sincere marks of the welcome to masters who seemed able and willing to maintain their rule over them with the news of the successes of riza sahib all this changed the natives no longer bent to the ground as the english passed them in the street the country people who had flocked in with their products to the markets absented themselves altogether and the whole population prepared to welcome the french as their new masters in the fort the utmost vigilance was observed the garrison labored to mend the breaches and complete the preparations for defense provisions were again stored up and they awaited anxious news from clive that enterprising officer was at fort st davis busy in making his preparations for a decisive campaign against the enemy round trichinopoly when the news of the rising reached him he was expecting a considerable number of fresh troops from england as it was in january that the majority of the reinforcements dispatched by the company arrived in india and mr saunders had written to calcutta begging that a hundred men might be sent thence these were now with the eighty men at madras and the two hundred at arcot all the force that could be at his disposal for at fort st david there was not a single available man with all the effort that clive aided by the authorities can make it was not until the middle of february that he had completed his arrangements on the ninth the hundred men arrived from bengal and without the loss of a day clive started from madras to form a junction with the garrison from arcot who leaving only a small force to hold the fort had moved down to meet him end of chapter eight chapter nine of with clive in india this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recording by gary Ullman. chapter nine the battle of kavarapak the troops from arcot had already moved some distance on their way to madras and clive therefore with the new levies joined them on the day after his leaving madras the french and riza sahib let slip the opportunity of attacking these bodies before they united they were well aware of their movements and had resolved upon tactics calculated in the first place to puzzle the english commander to wear out his troops and to enable them finally to surprise and take him entirely at a disadvantage the junction with the arcot garrison raised the force under clive's orders to three hundred and eighty english thirteen hundred sepoys and six field guns while the enemy at vendalar a place twenty-five miles south of madras where they had a fortified camp had four hundred french troops two thousand sepoys two thousand five hundred cavalry and twelve guns 
hoping to surprise them there clive marched all night when the force approached the town they heard that the enemy had disappeared and that they had started apparently in several directions the force was halted for a few hours and then the news was obtained that the enemy had united their forces at conjeverum and that they had marched away from that place in a westerly direction doubting not that they were about to attack arcot which weakened by departure of the greater portion of its garrison would be in no position to defend itself against a sudden coup de main by a strong force clive set his troops again in motion the french indeed had already bribed some of the native soldiers within the fort who were to reply to a signal made without if they were in a position to open the gates however by good fortune their treachery had been discovered and when the french arrived they received no reply to their signal and as arcot would be sure to fall if they defeated clive they marched away without attacking it to take up the position which they had agreed upon beforehand it was at nine in the evening that clive at vandalore obtained intelligence that the enemy had assembled at Congerian the troops had already marched twenty-five miles but they had had a rest of five hours and clive started with them at once and reached congerium twenty miles distant at four in the morning finding that the enemy had again disappeared he ordered the troops to halt for a few hours they had already marched forty-five miles in twenty-four hours a great feat when it is remembered that only the arcot garrison were in any way accustomed to fatigue the others being newly raised levies. The greater portion of the sepoys had been enlisted within the fortnight preceding. I don't know, Mr. Marriott, whether the French call this fighting. I call it playing hide-and-seek. Tim Kelly said, Sure, we've been marching, with only a halt of two or three hours since yesterday morning, and my poor feet are that sore that I daren't take my boots off me, for I'm sure I'll never get them on again if the french want to fight us why don't they do it square and honest not be racing and chasing about like a lot of wild sheep have you seen the moonshee tim he is with the baggers sure and i saw him tim said the cart comes in just now and there was he perched up on top of it like a dried monkey you don't want him tonight sure your honor oh no i don't want him tim you'd better go now and get to sleep at once if you can we may be off again at any minute arcot is twenty-seven miles from congerian clive felt certain that the enemy had gone on to that place but anxious as he was for its safety it was absolutely necessary that the troops should have a rest before starting on such a march they were therefore allowed to rest until twelve o'clock when refreshed by their eight hours halt and breakfast they started upon their long march towards arcot making sure that they should not find the enemy until they reached that place had clive possessed a body of cavalry however small he would have been able to scour the country and to make himself acquainted with the real position of the french cavalry are to a general what eyes are to a man and without these he is liable to tumble into a pitfall such was the case on the present occasion having no doubt that the enemy were engaged in attacking arcot the troops were plodding along carelessly and in loose order when to their astonishment after a sixteen-mile march as they approached the town of kavarapek just as the sun was setting a fire of artillery opened upon them from a grove upon the right of the road but two hundred and fifty yards distance nothing is more confusing than a surprise of this kind especially to young troops and when no enemy is thought to be near the french general's plans had been well laid he had reached kavarapek that morning and allowed his troops to rest all day and he expected to obtain an easy victory over the tired men who would unsuspicious of danger be pressing on to the relief of arcot so far his calculations had been correct and the english marched unsuspiciously into the trap laid for them the twelve french guns were placed in a grove round whose sides facing the point from which clive was approaching ran a deep ditch with a high bank forming a regular battery a body of french infantry were placed in support of the guns 
with some sepoys in reserve behind the grove. Parallel with the road on the left ran a deep watercourse, now empty, and in this the rest of the infantry was stationed at a point near the town of Kavarapak, and about a quarter of a mile further back than the grove. On either side of this watercourse, the enemy had placed his powerful cavalry force. For a moment, when the guns opened, there was confusion and panic among the British troops. Clive, however, ever cool and confident in danger, and well seconded by his officers, rallied them at once. The position was one of extreme danger. It was possible, indeed, to retreat, but in the face of an enemy superior in infantry and guns, and possessing so powerful a body of cavalry, the operation would have been a very dangerous one. Even if accomplished, it would entail an immense loss of morale and prestige to his troops. Hitherto, under his leading, they had been always successful, and a belief in his own superiority adds immensely to the fighting power of a soldier. Even should the remnant of the force fight its way back to Madras, the campaign would have been a lost one, and all hope of saving Trichinopoly would have been at an end. Steady, lads, steady, he shouted. Form up quietly and steadily. We have beaten the enemy before, you know, and we will do so again. While the troops, in spite of the artillery fire, fell into line, Clive rapidly surveyed the ground he saw the enemy's infantry advancing up the watercourse and so sheltered by it as to be out of the fire of his troops he saw their cavalry sweeping down on the other side of the watercourse menacing his left and threatening his baggage the guns were at once brought up from the rear but before these arrived the men were falling fast three of the guns he placed to answer the french battery Two of them he hurried to his left with a small body of English and 200 sepoys to check the advance of the enemy's cavalry. The main body of his infantry he ordered into the watercourse, which afforded them a shelter from the enemy's artillery. The baggage carts and baggage he sent half a mile to the rear under the protection of 40 sepoys and a gun. While this was being done, the enemy's fire was continuing but his infantry advanced but slowly and had not reached the point abreast of the grove when the british force in the watercourse met them it would not seem to be a very important matter at what point in the watercourse the infantry of the two opposing parties came into collision but matters apparently trifling in themselves often decide the fate of battles and in fact had the french artillery retained their fire until their infantry was abreast of the grove the battle of Kavarapak would have been won by them, and the British power in southern India would have been destroyed. Clive moved confidently and resolutely among his men, keeping up their courage by cheerful words, and he was well seconded by his officers. Now, lads, Charlie Marriott cried to the company of which he was in command, stick to it. You ought to be very thankful to the French for saving you the trouble of having to march another twelve miles before giving you an opportunity of thrashing them. The men laughed and redoubled their fire on the French infantry who were facing them in the watercourse at a distance of eighty yards. Neither party liked to charge. The French commander knew that he had only to hold his position to win the day. His guns were mowing down the English artillerymen. The English party on the left of the watercourse with difficulty, held their own against the charges of his horsemen and were rapidly dwindling away under the artillery fire, while other bodies of his cavalry had surrounded the baggage and were attacking the little force told off to guard it. He knew, too, that any attempt the English might make to attack the battery with its strong defenses must inevitably fail. The situation was becoming desperate. It was now ten o'clock. The fight had gone on for four hours. No advantage had been gained. The men were losing confidence, and the position grew more and more desperate. Clive saw that there was but one chance of victory. The grove could not be carried in the front, but it was just possible that it might be open in the rear. Choosing a sergeant who spoke the native language well, he bade him leave the party in the watercourse and make his way round to the rear of the grove and discover whether it was strongly guarded there or not. In twenty minutes, 
the sergeant returned with the news that there was no strong force there clive at once took two hundred of his english infantry the men who had fought at arcot and quietly left the water course and made his way round towards the rear of the grove before he had gone far the main body in the water course surprised at the southern withdrawal of the greater portion of the english force and missing the presence of clive himself began to lose heart they no longer replied energetically to the fire of the french infantry a movement of retreat began the fire ceased and in a minute or two they would have broken in flight at this moment clive returned as he moved forward he had marked the dying away of the english fire and guessing what had happened had given over the command of the column to lieutenant keene the senior officer and hurried back to the watercourse he arrived there just as the troops had commenced to run away throwing himself among them with shouts and exhortations he succeeded in arresting their fight and by assurances that the battle was as good as won elsewhere and that they had only to hold the ground for a few minutes longer to ensure victory he got them to advance to their former position and to reopen fire on the french who had fortunately remained inactive instead of advancing and taking advantage of the cessation of the english fire in the meantime lieutenant keene led his detachment making a long circuit to a point three hundred yards immediately behind the grove he then sent forward one of his officers, Ensign Simons, who spoke French perfectly, to reconnoiter the grove. Simmons had proceeded but a little way when he came upon a large number of French sepoles, who were covering the rear of the grove, but who, as their services were not required, were sheltering themselves there from the random bullets which were flying about. They at once challenged, but Simmons answered them in French, they being unable to see his uniform in the darkness they being unable to see his uniform in the darkness and supposing him to be a french officer allowed him to advance he passed boldly forward into the grove he proceeded nearly through it until he came within sight of the guns which were still keeping up their fire upon those of the english while a hundred french infantry who were in support were all occupied in watching what was going on in front of them simmons returned to the detachment by a path to the right of that by which he had entered and passed out without seeing a soul lieutenant keene gave the word to advance and following the guidance of mr simmons entered the grove he advanced unobserved until within thirty yards of the enemy here he halted and poured a volley into them the effect was instantaneous. Many of the French fell, and the rest, astounded at this sudden and unexpected attack, left their guns and fled. Sixty of them rushed for shelter into a building at the end of the grove, where the English surrounded them and forced them to surrender. By this sudden stroke, the Battle of Kavarapak was won. The sound of the musketry fire and the immediate cessation of that of the enemy's guns told clive that the grove was captured a few minutes later fugitives arriving from the grove informed the commander of the enemy's main body of infantry of the misfortune which had befallen them the french fire at once ceased and the troops withdrew in the darkness it was impossible for clive to attempt a pursuit he was in ignorance of the direction the enemy had taken his troops had already marched sixty miles in two days and he would moreover have been exposed to a sudden dashes of enemy's cavalry clive therefore united his troops joined his baggage which the little guard had gallantly defended against the attacks of the enemy's cavalry and waited for morning at daybreak not an enemy was to be seen fifty frenchmen lay dead on the field sixty were captives three hundred french sepoys had fallen and there were besides many wounded the enemy's artillery had been all captured the british loss was forty english and thirty sepoys killed and a great number of both wounded the morale effect of the victory was immense it was the first time that french and english soldiers had fought in the field against each other in india the french had proved to the natives that they were enormously their superior in fighting power 
Hitherto the English had not done so. The defense of Arcot had proved that they could fight behind walls, but the natives had themselves many examples of gallant defenses of this kind. The English troops, under Gingen and Cope, had suffered themselves to be cooped up in Trichinopoly and had not struck a blow in its defense. At Kevarapek, the natives discovered that the English could fight as well or better than the French. The latter were somewhat stronger numerically than their rivals. They had double the force of artillery, were half as strong again in sepoys, and had 2,500 cavalry, while the English had not a single horseman. They had all the advantages of surprise and position, and yet they had been entirely defeated. Thenceforth, the natives of India regarded the English as a people to be feared and respected and, for the first time, considered their ultimate triumph over the French to be a possibility. As the policy of the native princes had ever been to side with the strongest, the advantage thus gained to the English cause by the victory of Kavarapak was enormous. On the following day, the English took possession of the fort of Kavarapak and marched to Arcot. Scarcely had they arrived there when Clive received a dispatch from Fort St. David, ordering him to return there at once with all his troops to march to the relief of Trichinopoly, where the garrison was reported to be in the Suez Straits from want of provisions. The force reached Fort St. David on the 11th of March. Here preparations were hurried forward for the advance to Trichinopoly, and in three days Clive was ready to start. Just as he was about to set out, a ship arrived from England, having on board some more troops, together with Major Lawrence and several officers, some of whom were captain senior to Clyde. Major Lawrence, who had already proved his capacity and energy, of course took command of the expedition, and treated Clive who had served under him at the siege of Pondicherry, and whose successes in the field had attracted his high admiration as a second-in-command, somewhat to the discontent of the officers senior to him in rank. The force consisted of 400 Europeans, 1,100 sepoys, and eight guns, and escorted a large train of provisions and stores. During these months, which the diversion caused by the attack of Riza Sahib and the French upon Madras had given to the besiegers of Trichinopoly, they should have long since captured the town. In spite of all the orders of Duplex, Law could not bring himself to attack the town, and the French governor Pondicherry saw with dismay that the two months and a half which his efforts and energy had gained for the besiegers had been entirely wasted, and that it was probable the whole fruits of his labors would be thrown away. He now directed Law to leave only a small force in front of Trichinopoly, and to march with the whole of his army and that of Chunda Sahib, and crush the force advancing under Lawrence to relief Trichinopoly. Law, however, disobeyed orders, and indeed acted in direct contradiction to them. He maintained 600 French troops and many thousands of native before Trichinopoly, and sent but 250 French and about 350 natives, a force altogether inferior in numbers to that which it was sent to oppose, to arrest the progress of Lawrence's advancing column. The position which this French force was directed to occupy was the fort at Coiladi, an admirable position, as the two branches of the Kavari were here but a half a mile apart. Had Law concentrated all his force here, he could no doubt have successfully opposed the English. Lawrence, however, when the guns of the fort opened upon him, replied to them by the fire of his artillery, and as the French force was insufficient to enable its commander to fight him in the open, he was enabled to take his troops and convoy in safety past the fort. When Law heard this, he marched out and took his position round a lofty and almost inaccessible rock called El Miserum, and prepared to give battle. Lawrence, however, after passing Coilotti, had been joined by a hundred English and fifty dragoons, from Trichinopoly. 
These acted as guides and led him to a route by which he avoided the French position and effected a junction with 200 Europeans and 400 sepoys from Trichinopoly and with a body of Maratha cavalry under Moria Rio. Law, having failed to attack the English force upon its march, now, when its strength was nearly doubled, suddenly decided to give battle and advance against a force which, wearied with its long march, had just begun to prepare their breakfast. The French artillery at once put the Maharada cavalry to flight. Lawrence called the men again under arms and sent Clive forward to reconnoitre. He found the French infantry drawn up with 22 guns with large bodies of cavalry on either flank. Opposite to the center of their position was, was a large caravansary or native inn. With stone buildings attached, it was nearer to their position than to that occupied by the English, and Clive saw at once that, if seized and held by the enemy's artillery, it would sweep the whole ground over which the English would have to advance. He galloped back at full speed to Major Lawrence and asked leave at once to occupy the building. Obtaining permission, he advanced with all speed to the caravansary with some guns and infantry. The negligence of the French in allowing this movement to be carried out was fatal to them. The English artillery opened upon them from the cover of the inn and buildings, and to this fire the French in the open can reply only at great disadvantage. After a cannonade lasting half an hour, the French, having lost 40 Europeans and 300 native soldiers, fell back, the English having lost only 21. Disheartened at this result, utterly disappointed at the failure which had attended his long operation against Trichinopoly, without energy or decision, Law at once raised the siege of the town, abandoning a great portion of his baggage and destroying great stores of ammunition and supplies, crossed an arm of the cavalry and took post in the great fortified temple of Seringam. The delight of the troops so long besieged in Trichinopoly, inactive, dispirited, and hopeless, was extreme, and the exultation of Muhammad Ali and his native allies was no less. Captain Cope, towards the end of the siege, had been killed in one of the little skirmishes which occasionally took place with the French. Charlie Marriott and Peters had, owing to some of the officers senior to them being killed or invalided, and to large number of fresh recruits being raised, received a step in rank. They were now lieutenants, and each commanded a body of sepoys, 200 strong. At Charlie's request, Tim Kelly was detached from his company and allowed to remain with him as soldier's servant. After the retreat of the French and the setting down of the English force in the lines they had occupied, Charlie and his friend entered Trichinopoly and were surprised at the temples and palaces there. Although very inferior to Tanjore, and in no way even comparable to the cities of the northwest of India, Trichinopoly was a far more important city than any they had hitherto seen. They ascended the lofty rock and visited the fort on its summit, which looked as if, in the hands of a resolute garrison, it should be impregnable to attack. The manner in which this rock, as well as that of El Misaran and others lying in sight, rose sheer up from the plain, filled them with surprise, for, although these natural rock fortresses are common enough in India, they are almost without an example in Europe. After visiting the fort, they rambled through the town and were amused at the scene of bustle in its streets and at the gay shops, full of articles new and curious to them in the bazaars. They are wonderfully clever and ingenious, Charlie said. Look what rough tools that man is working with, and what delicate and intricate work he is turning out. If these fellows could but fight as well as they work, and were but united among themselves, not only should we be unable to set foot in India, but the emperor, with the enormous armies which he would be able to raise, would be able to threaten Europe. I suppose they never have really been good fighting men. Alexander, a couple of thousand years ago, defeated them, 
and since then the Afghans and other northern people have always been overrunning and conquering them. I can't make it out. These sepoys, after only a few weeks' training, fight almost as well as our own men. I wonder how it is that, when commanded by their own countrymen, they are able to make so poor a fight of it. We had better be going back to camp again, Peters. At any moment, there may be orders for us to do something with Major Lawrence and Clive together. We are not likely to stop here long inactive. End of chapter 9「Seringam」Although called an island, Seringam is in fact a long narrow tongue of land running between the two branches of the river Kavari. In some places these arms are but a few hundred yards apart, and the island can therefore be defended against an attack along the land. But the retreat of the French by this line was equally difficult, as we held the narrowest part of the neck, two miles from Kuladi. Upon the south our forces of Trichinopoly faced the French across the river. Upon the other side of the Colrun, as the northern arm of the Kavari is called, the French could cross the river and make their retreat, if necessary, in any direction. The two principal roads, however, led from Panchananda, a strong fortified position on the bank of the river, facing the temple of Seringam. Clive saw that a force crossing the river and taking up its position on the north would entirely cut off Law's army in the island would intercept any reinforcements sent by duplex to its rescue and might compel the surrender of the whole french army the attempt would of course be a dangerous one the french force was considerably stronger than the english and were the latter divided into two portions entirely cut off from each other the central part between them being occupied by the french the latter would have an opportunity of throwing his whole force upon one after the other the danger would have been so great that had the french been commanded by an able and active officer the attempt would never have been made law however had shown amply that he has neither energy nor intelligence and major lawrence therefore accepted clive's proposal but to be successful it was necessary that both portions of the english force should be well commanded Major Lawrence felt confident in his own capacity to withstand law upon the southern bank, and in case of necessity he could fall back under the guns of Trichinopoly. He felt sure that he could, with equal certainty, confide the command of the other party to Captain Clive. There was, however, the difficulty that he was the junior captain present, and that already great jealousy had been excited among his seniors, by the rank which he occupied in the councils of Lawrence. Fortunately, the difficulty was settled by the native allies. Major Lawrence laid his plans before Muhammad Ali and his allies, whose cooperation and assistance was absolutely necessary. These, after hearing their proposals, agreed to give their assistance, but only upon the condition that Clive should be placed in command of the expeditionary party. They had already seen the paralyzing effects of the incapacity of some English officers. Clive's defense of Arcot and the victories of Arnie and Kavarapak had excited their intense admiration and caused them to place unbounded confidence in him. Therefore, they said, if Captain Clive commands, we will go. Unless he commands, we do not. Major Lawrence was glad that the pressure thus placed upon him enabled him, without incurring a charge of favoritism, to place the command in the hands of the officer upon whom he most relied. On the night of the 6th of April, Clive set out with a force composed of 400 English, 700 sepoys, 3,000 Mahratta cavalry, 1,000 Tanjore cavalry, six light guns, and two heavy ones. 
Descending the river, he crossed the island at a point three miles to the east of Law's camping ground and marched to Samiarian, a town nine miles north of the island and commanding the roads from the north and east. The movement was just made in time. Duplex, utterly disgusted with Law, had resolved to displace him. The hotel, the only officer he had of sufficient high rank to take his place, had not, when previously employed, betrayed any great energy or capacity. It appeared, nevertheless, that he was at any rate superior to law. On the 10th of April, therefore, he dispatched the hotel with a 120 French and 500 sepoys, with four guns and a large convoy to Seringam, where he was to take the command. When he arrived within 15 miles of Semiarian, he learned that Clive had possession of that village, and he determined upon a circuitous route by which he might avoid him. He therefore sent a messenger to Law to acquaint him with his plans, in order that he might aid him by making a diversion. Clive, in the meantime, had been at work. On the day after his arrival at Samivarium, he attacked and captured the temple of Mansurpeet, halfway between the village and the island. The temple was lofty and stood on rising ground and commanded a range of the country for many miles round. On its type, Clive established a signal station. Upon the following day, he carried the mud fort of Lalgudi, which was situated on the north bank of the river, two miles to the east of Pechanda which now remained Law's only place of exit from the island. The hotel, after sending word to Law of his attentions, marched from Utatawa, where he was lying, by a road to the west, which had enabled him to move round Samiarium to Pachanda. Clive captured one of the messengers and set off with his force to intercept him. The hotel, however, received information by his spies of Clive's movements, and not wishing to fight a battle in the open with a superior force, fell back to Utatua, while Clive returned to Samovarian. Law, too, had received news of Clive's movement. Here was a chance of retrieving the misfortunes of the campaign. Pachanda being still in his hands, he could sally out with his whole force and that of Chunda Sahib, seize Samovarian in Clive's absence, and extend his hand to Diotel or fall upon Clive's rear. Instead of this, he repeated the mistake he had made before Triconopoly, and instead of marching out with his whole force, he sent only 80 Europeans, of whom 40 were deserters from the English army, and 700 sepoys. The English returned from their march against the Ortel. The greater portion of the troops were housed in two temples, a quarter of a mile apart, known as the Large and Small Pagoda. Clive, with several of his officers, was in a caravansary close to the small pagoda. Charlie's company were on guard, and after paying a visit to the sentries and seeing that all were on the alert, he returned to the caravansary. The day had been a long one, and the march under the heat of the sun very fatigued. There was therefore but little conversation, and Charlie, finding on his return from visiting the sentries, that his leader and the other officers had already wrapped themselves in their cloaks, lain down to rest, imitated their example. Half an hour later, the French column arrived at Samiarium. The officer in command was a daring and determined man. Before reaching the place, he had heard that the English had returned, and finding that he had been forestalled, he might well have returned to law. He determined, however, to attempt to surprise the camp. He placed his deserters in front, and when the column arriving near the sepoy sentinel was challenged, the officer in command of the deserters, an Irishman, stepped forward and said that he had been sent by Major Lawrence to the support of Captain Clive. As the other English-speaking soldiers now came up, the sentry and native officer with him were completely deceived, and the latter sent the soldier to guide the column to the English quarter of the camp. Without interruption, the column marched on through lines of sleeping sepoys and Mahrattas until they reached the heart of the village. Here they were again challenged. 
they replied with a volley of musketry into the caravansary and another into the pagoda then they rushed into the pagoda bayoneting all they found there charlie who had just dropped off to sleep sprang to his feet as did the other officers while confused by the noise and suddenness of the attack others scarcely understood what was happening clive clear head and ready judgment grasped the situation at once gentlemen he said calmly there is no firing going on in the direction of the great patoda follow me there at once snatching up their arms the officer followed him at a run the whole village was a scene of wild confusion the firing round the pagoda and caravansary was continuous the mahratta horsemen were climbing into their saddles and riding away out into the plain the sepoys were running hither and thither at the pagoda he found the soldiers turning out under arms and clive ordering his officers to do their best to rally the native troops in good order against the enemy at once moved forward towards the caravansary with two hundred english troops on arriving there he found a large body of sepoys firing away at random believing them to be his own men for the french and english sepoys were alike dressed in white he halted the english a few yards from them and rushed among them upbraiding them for their panic striking them and ordering them instantly to cease firing and form an order one of the sepoy officers recognized clive to be an englishman struck at him and wounded him with his sword clive still believing him to be one of his own men was furious at what he considered an act of insolent insubordination and seizing him dragged him across to the small pagoda to hand him over as he supposed to the guard there to his astonishment he found six frenchmen at the gate and these at once summoned him to surrender great as was his surprise he did not for a moment lose coolness and at once told them that he had come to beg them to lay down their arms that they were surrounded by the whole army and that unless they surrendered his troops would give no quarter so impressed were the frenchmen with the firmness of the speaker that three of them at once surrendered while the other three ran into the temple to inform their commander clive took the three men who had surrendered and returned to the english troops he had left near the caravansary the french sepoys had discovered that the english were enemies and had moved quietly off confusion still reigned clive did not imagine for a moment that so daring an assault could have been made on his camp by a small body of enemies and expected every moment an attack by law's whole force the commander of the french in the pagoda was disturbed by the news brought in by the three men from the gate and dispatched eight of his most intelligent men to ascertain exactly what was going on these however fell into the hands of the english and the officer of the party not knowing that the small pagoda was in the hands of the french handed them over to a sergeant and told him to take a party and escort his eight prisoners and the three captain clive had captured to that pagoda for confinement there upon arrival at the gate the frenchmen at once joined their comrades and these latter were also so bewildered at the affair that they allowed the english sergeant and his guard to march off again unmolested by this time owing to the absence of all resistance elsewhere clive had learned that the whole of the party who had entered the camp were in the lesser pagoda and as he was still expecting momentarily to be attacked by law's main army he determined to rid himself of this enemy in his midst the pagoda was very strong and only two men could enter abreast clive led his men to the attack but so well did the french defend themselves that after losing an officer fifteen men clive determined to wait till morning the french officer knowing that he was surrounded and beyond the reach of all assistance resolved upon cutting a way through and at daylight his men sallied out from the temple so fierce however was the fire with which the english received him that twelve of his men were instantly killed and the rest ran back into the temple 
Clive, hoping that their commander would now surrender without further effusion of blood, advanced to the gateway and entered the porch to offer terms. He was himself so faint from the loss of blood from his wounds that he could not stand alone, but leaned against the wall, supported by two sergeants. The officer commanding the deserters came out to parley, but after heaping abuse upon Clive, leveled his musket and discharged it at him he missed clive but killed the two sergeants who were supporting him the french officer in command indignant at this conduct rushed forward at once to disavow it and stated that he had determined to defend the post to the last solely for the sake of the deserters but that the conduct of their officer had released him from that obligation, and he now therefore surrendered at once. The instant day broke, and Clive saw that law was not as he expected at hand, he dispatched the Maratha horse in pursuit of the French sepoys. These were overtaken and cut to pieces, and that one man of the force which law had dispatched against Clive returned to the island. The English loss was heavy. The greater portion of the occupants of the small pagoda were bayoneted by the french when they entered and as fifteen others were killed in the attack it is probable that at least one-fourth of the english force under clive were killed clive's own mistake was extraordinary in addition to those of being killed by the french sepoy among whom he ran by mistake and of death at the hands of the treacherous deserter he had one almost as close when the french fired their valley into the caravansary a box at his feet was shattered and a servant who slept close to him was killed some days passed after this attack without any french movement on either side major lawrence then determined to drive back the artil he did not dispatch clive against him as this would involve the risk that law might again march out to surprise samiverian he therefore directed Clive to remain at that place and watch the island while he sent a force of a hundred and fifty English, four hundred sepoys, five hundred Maharatas with four guns to attack the Ortel. From his own force, under Captain Dalton, this officer in the advance marched his troops near Samavarian and, making as much show with them as he could, impressed the Ortel with the idea that the force was that of Clyde. Accordingly, he broke up his camp at Utatua in the night, abandoned his stores, and retreated hastily upon Valconda. Dalton then marched to Samavarian and placed his force at Clive's disposal, and to prevent any disputes arising as to president and rank, offered himself to serve under him as a volunteer. Not only Diotel, but law was deceived by Dalton's march. From the lofty towers of Seringham, he saw that the force marching towards Utatatua believed that Clive with his whole force had left Samavarian and did now what he should have done before, cross the river with all his troops. Clive's lookout on the temple of Mansurpit perceived what was going on and signaled the news to Clive who had once set out with his whole force, and before Law was prepared to issue out from Panchalanda, Clive was within a mile of the place. Law might still have fought with a fair chance of success, as he was far stronger than his enemy, but he was again the victim of indecision and want of energy, and, covered by Panchanda, he fell back across the river again. On the 15th of May, Clive captured Panchanda and then determined to give a final blow to D'Artel's forces, which had, he learned, again set out to endeavor to relieve Law. He marched you to Tatua to intercept him. Do you tell, hearing of his coming, instantly fell back again to Valconda. The native chief of this town, however, seeing that the affairs of the French were desperate and willing, like all his countrymen, to make his peace with the strongest, had already accepted bribes from the English, and upon D'Hortel's return, closed the gate and refused to admit him. Clive soon arrived, and D'Hortel, caught between two fires, 
surrendered with his whole force had law been a man of energy he had yet a chance of escape he had still seven or eight hundred french troops with him two thousand sepoys and four thousand of shunda sahib's troops he might then have easily crossed the cavalry at night and fallen upon lawrence whose force there now was greatly inferior to his own shunda sahib in vain begged him to do so his hesitation continued until three days after the surrender of Diotel, a battering train reached Lawrence, whereupon Lawrence once surrendered, his chief stipulation being that the life of Shunda Sahib should be spared. The promise was not kept. The unfortunate prince had preferred to surrender to the Raja of Tanjore, who had several times intrigued secretly with him, rather than to Muhammad Ali or the English, whom he regarded as his implacable enemies. Had he placed himself in our hands, his life would have been safe. He was murdered by the treacherous Raja within twenty-four hours of his surrender. With the fall of Seringam terminated the contest for the supremacy of the Carnatic. Between the English and French, fighting respectively on behalf of their puppets, Muhammad Ali and Chunda Sahib. The stage of the struggle was not a final one, but both by its circumstances and by the prestige which we acquired in the eyes of the natives, it gave us a moral ascendancy which, even when our fortunes were afterwards at their worst, was never lost again. Muhammad Ali had himself gained but little in the struggle. He was indeed nominally ruler of the Carnatic, but he had to rely for his position slowly on the support of the English bayonets. Indeed, the promises of which he had been obliged to be lavished to his native allies to keep them faithful to his cause, when that cause seemed all but lost, now came upon him to trouble him. And so precarious was his position that he was obliged to ask the English to leave 200 English troops and 1,500 of their sepoys to protect the place against Morari Rio and the Rajas of Mysore and Tanjore. The fatigues of the expedition had been great, and when the force reached the sea coast, Major Lawrence was forced to retire to Fort St. David to recover his health, while Clive, whose health had now greatly broken down, betook himself to Madras, which had, when the danger of invasion by the French was at an end, became the headquarters of the government of the presidency. There were, however, two French strongholds, dangerously near to Madras, Tavlong and Changalapat. Two hundred recruits had just arrived from England, and five hundred natives had been enlisted as sepoys. Mr. Sanders begged Clive to take the command of these and reduce the two fortresses. He took with him two twenty-four pounders and four officers, of whom two were Charlie Marriott and Peters, to both of whom Clive was much attached, owing to their courage, readiness, and good humor. Covlong was first attacked. It mounted thirty guns and was garrisoned by fifty French and three hundred sepoys. I don't like the look of these things, Mr. Charles, Tim Kelly said. There's nothing but boys, all together, white and black. Does it stand to reason a lot of gassoons who haven't learnt the goose step and haven't as much as a shred of faith either in themselves or their officers are fit to fight the French? Oh, I don't know, Tim, Charlie said. Boys are just as plucky as men in their way and are ready to do all sorts of foolhardy things which men would hesitate to attempt. And that is so, Mr. Charles, when there are only other boys to deal with. But as they're growing up, they take some time before they're quite sure they're a match for men. That's what it is, Your Honor. I tell ye, and you will see it soon. Tim's predictions were speedily verified. The very morning after they arrived before the fort, the garrison made a sally, fell upon the troops, and killed one of their officers. The whole of the new levies took to their heels and fled away from the fight. Clive, with his three officers, threw himself among them and for some time in vain attempted to turn the tide. 
it was not indeed until several had been cut down that the rout was arrested and they were brought back to their duties a day or two later a shot striking a rock killed or wounded fourteen men and excited such panic that it was some time before the rest convention near the front the enemy with a considerable force marched from chengal platte to relieve the place clive left half his force to continue the siege and with the rest marched out and offered battle to the relieving force daring and confidence as usual prevailed had the enemy attacked there is little doubt they would have put clive's raw levies to flight they were however cowed by his attitude of defiance and retreated hastily the governor of kovlong at once lost heart and surrendered the place which he might have maintained for months against the force before it and on the fourth day of the siege capitulated a few hours afterwards the enemy from chengalplat ignorant of the fall of the fort again advanced and clive met them with his whole force taken by surprise they suffered heavily clive pursued them to the gates of their fort to which he at once laid siege fortunately for the english the commander of this place like him of Kovlong, was cowardly and incapable. Had it not been so, the fort, which was very strong, well positioned, and well garrisoned, might have held out for an indefinite time. As it was, it surrendered on the fourth day, and Clive took possession on the 31st of August. He returned to Madras, and there, a short time afterwards, married Miss Maskelyne, finding his health however continuing to deteriorate he sailed for europe in february seventeen fifty three it was but five years since he had first taken up arms to defend fort st david an unknown clerk without prospects and without fortune utterly discontented and disheartened madras was in the hands of the french everywhere their policy was triumphant and the soil surrounded by the walls of st david's alone remained to the english in southern india in five years which had elapsed all had changed the english were masters of the carnatic the french were broken and discredited the english were regarded by the natives throughout the country as the coming power and of this great change no slight portion was due to the energy and genius of clive himself end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of With Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. An Important Mission. A few days after the return of the expedition against Kovlong and Chengalpat, Charlie received a note from Governor Sanders requesting him to call upon him at 11 o'clock. Charlie, of course, attended at Government House at the time named and found Captain Clive with mr sanders i have sent for you mr marriott to ask you if you are ready to undertake a delicate and somewhat dangerous mission captain clive tells me that he is convinced that you will be able to discharge the duty satisfactorily he has been giving me the highest report of your conduct and courage and he tells me that you speak the language with some facility i have been working hard sir charlie said and have had a moon chi for the last year and as except when on duty i have spoken nothing but the native language with him i can now speak it almost as fluently as i can english so captain clive has been telling me mr sanders said and it is indeed on that ground that i select you for the service your friend mr peter has equally distinguished himself in the field captain clive tells me but he is greatly your inferior in the knowledge of the vernacular this was indeed the case peters had but little natural aptitude for foreign languages and after working hard for a time with the moonshi he found that he was making so little progress in comparison with charlie that he lost heart and although he had continued his lessons with the moonshi he had done so only to the extent of an hour or so a day whereas charlie had devoted his whole leisure time to work the facts of the case are these mr marriott owing to the failure of muhammad ali to fulfil the ridiculously onerous terms extorted from him 
by some of his native allies during the siege of Trichinopoly, several of them are in a state of discontent which is likely soon to break out into open hostilities the rajas of mysore and tanjore are i have learned already in communication with pondicherry and will i believe shortly acknowledge the son of chunda sahib whom duplex has declared ruler of the carnatic moria rio has already openly joined the french their influence in the deccan is now so great that bussy may be said to rule there now there is a chief named Burhau rio whose territory lies among the hills and extends from the plain nearly up to the plateau land of the deccan his position like that of many of the other small rajahs is precarious in days like the present when might makes right and even petty states try to make a profit out of the constant wars at the expense of its neighbor the position of a chief surrounded by a half a dozen others more powerful than himself is by no means pleasant Bullhow rio feels that he is in danger of being swallowed by the nisam or by the marathas and he earnestly desires to ally himself with us believing as he says that we are destined to be masters here i have assured him that although gratified at his expressions of friendship we can enter into no alliance with him the position of his territory would enable him to be of great assistance to us in any war in which the whole force of the deccan controlled as it is at present at Busi, might be utilized against us in the carnatic he would be able to harass convoys cut communications and otherwise trouble the enemy's movements but although we see that his aid would be very useful to us in case of such a war we do not see how on our part we could give him any protection we have now with the greatest difficulty brought affairs to a successful conclusion in the carnatic but duplex is active and energetic and well supported at home many of the chiefs lately our allies have as i have just said declared against us or are about to do so and it is out of the question for us to think of supporting a chief so far removed from us as borough i have therefore told him that we greatly desire his friendship but are at present powerless to protect him should he be attacked by the northern neighbors he is particularly anxious to train his men after the european fashion as he sees that our sepoys are a match for five times their number of the indian princes this brings me to the subject before us i have written to him to say that i will send to him an english officer capable of training and leading his troops and whose advice may be useful to him upon all occasions but that as were it known that he had received the british officer and was employing him to train his troops it would excite the instant animosity of Busi and of the Peshwa. I should send one familiar with the language, and who may pass as a native. Captain Clive has strongly recommended you for this difficult mission. I fear, sir, that I could hardly pass as a native. The Munshi is constantly correcting mistakes which I make in speaking. That may be so, Mr. Sanders said but there are scores of dialects in southern india and you could be passed upon nineteen of the twenty peoples who speak them as belonging to one of the other if you think sir that i shall do charlie said i shall be glad to undertake the mission very well mr marryat that is understood then you will receive full instructions in writing and will understand that your duty is not only to drill the troops of this chief but to give him such advice as may suit his and our interests to strengthen his good feeling towards us and to form as far as possible a compact little force which might at a critical moment be of immense utility you will of course master the geography of the country of which we are all but absolutely ignorant find out about the passes the mountain paths the defensible positions all these may some day be of the highest importance you will have a few days to make your arrangements and settle as to the character you will adopt this you had better do in consultation with someone who thoroughly understands the country it is intended that you shall go down to trichinopoly 
with the next convoy, and from there make your way to the stronghold of Burhau. Shall I take any followers with me? Yes, Mr. Sanders said. As you will go in the character of a military adventurer, who has served among our sepoys long enough to learn European drill, you had better take two, three, or four men as you like with you as retainers. You may pick out two or three trusty men from the sepoys at your command. Charlie left Government House in high spirits. It was certainly an honor to have been selected for such a post. It was quite possible that it would be a dangerous one. It was sure to be altogether different from the ordinary life of a subaltern in the company's army. Peters was very sorry when he heard from Charlie that they were at last to be separated. It was now nearly two years since they had first met on board the Lizzie Anderson, and since that time they had been constantly together and were greatly attached to each other. Charlie, perhaps, had taken the lead. The fact of his having a stock of firearms and being able to lend them to Peters had given him, perhaps, the first slight and almost imperceptible advantage. His feat of jumping overboard to rescue Tim Kelly had been another step in advance, and although Charlie would have denied it himself, there was no doubt that he generally took the lead and that his friend was accustomed to lean upon him and to look to him always for the initiative. It was, therefore, a severe blow to Peters to find that Charlie was about to be sent on detached service. As for Tim Kelly, he was uproarious in his grief when he heard that he was to be separated from his master. Sure, Mr. Charlie, ye'll never have the heart to lab a poor boy that sarved ye might be night and day for eighteen months. Tim Kelly would gladly give his life for ye, and ye wouldn't go and lave him behind ye, and go all alone among those black thaves of the world. But it is impossible that I can take you, Tim, Charlie said. You know yourself that you cannot speak ten words in a language. How then could you possibly pass undetected, whatever disguise you put on? But I'll never open my mouth at all, Your Honor, barring for mate and drink. It is all very well for you to say so, Tim, Charlie answered. But I do not think that anything short of a miracle would silence your tongue. But leave us now, Tim, and I will talk the matter over with Mr. Peters. I should be glad enough to have you with me if we could arrange it. The Moonshee was taken into their councils and was asked his opinion as to the disguise which Charlie could adopt, with least risk of detection. The Moonshee replied that he might pass as a beal. These hill tribes speak a dialect quite distinct from that of the people around them, and the moonshine said that if properly attired, Charlie would be able to pass anywhere for one of these people, provided always that he did not meet with another of the same race. You might assert, he said, that your father had taken service with some Raja on the plain, and that you had there learned to speak the language. In this way, you would avoid having to answer any difficult questions regarding your native place, but as to that, you can get up something of the geography before you leave. There are several beetles among our sepoys, Charlie said. I can pick out three or four of them who would be just the men for me to take. I believe they are generally very faithful and attached to their officers. When Tim again entered the room, he inquired anxiously if his master hit upon any disguise which would suit him. What do you say, Mr. Moonshine, Tim said. The Moonshi shook his head. Between these two, a perpetual feud had existed ever since the native had arrived at Arcot to take his place as a member of Charlie's establishment. In obedience to Charlie's stringent orders, Tim never was openly rude to him, but he never lost an opportunity of making remarks of a disparaging nature as to the value of Charlie's studies. The Munchi, on his part, generally ignored Tim's existence altogether, addressing him when he was obliged to do so with a ceremonious civility which annoyed Tim more than open abuse would have done. I think he said gravely, in reply to Tim's demand, that the very worshipful one would have most chance of escaping detection if he went in rags, 
throwing dust on his hair and passing for one afflicted and what does he mean by afflicted mr charles the irishman said wrathfully as the two young officers last he means one who is a born fool tim tim looked furiously at the moonshee it would the latter said sententiously be the character which the worshipful one would support with the greatest ease the black thief is making fun of me tim muttered but i'll be avin with him one of these days or my name isn't tim kelly i was thinking your honor that i might represent one deaf and dumb but you're always talking tim and when you're not talking to others you talk to yourself it is quite impossible you could go as a dumb man but you might go as moonshee suggests as a half-witted sort of chap with just sense enough to groom a horse and look after him but with not enough to understand what's said to you or to answer any questions i could do that easy enough mr charles and you have to keep from quarrelling tim i hear you quarrelling on an average ten times a day and as in such a character as we're talking about you would of course be exposed to all sorts of slights and unpleasantnesses you would be in continual hot water now your honor tim said reproachfully you're too hard on me entirely i like a bit of a row as well as any many but it's all for diversion and i could go on for a year without quarrelling with a soul just try me mr charles just try me for a month and if at the end of that time you find me in your way or that i don't keep my character then send me back again to the regiment it was arranged that the moonshee should remain with peters who seeing that charlie owed his appointment to a post which promised excitement and adventure to his skill in the native languages was determined that he would again set to in earnest and try and master its intricacies the moonshee went down to the bazaar and purchased the clothes which would be necessary for the disguises and charlie found in his company four sepoys who willingly agreed to accompany him in the character of his retainers upon his expedition as to their custom there was no difficulty when off duty the sepoys in the company's service were accustomed to dress in their native attire consequently it needed only the attention of a towar or short curved sword a shield thrown over one shoulder a long matchlock and two or three pistols and daggers stuck into a girdle to complete their equipment charlie himself was dressed gaily in the garb of a military officer in the service of an indian rajah he was to ride and a horse saddle and gay housings were procured he had at last given in to tim's entreaties and that worthy was dressed as a syce or horsekeeper both charlie and tim had had these portions of their skins exposed to the air darkened and both would pass muster at a casual inspection charlie in thus concealing his nationality desired only to hide the fact that he was an officer in the company's service he believed that it would be impossible for him to continue to pass as a beal this however would be of no consequence after a time many of the native princes had europeans in their service runaway sailors deserters from the english french and dutch armed forces in their possessions on the sea coast adventurers influenced either by a love of a life of excitement or whom a desire to escape the consequences of folly or crime committed at home had driven to a roving life such men might be found in many of the native courts once settled then in the service of the rajah charlie intended to make but little further pretense or secrecy as to his nationality outwardly he would still conform to the language and appearance of the character he had chosen but he would allow it to be supposed that he was an englishman a deserter from the company's service and that his comrades were sepoys in a similar position his employment then at the court of the rajah would have in effect the exact reverse of that which it would have done had he appeared in his proper character deserters were of all men the most opposed to their countrymen to whom they had proved traitors 
in battle they could be relied upon to fight desperately for they fought with ropes round their necks therefore while the appearance of an english officer as a structure of the forces of the rajah would have drawn upon himself the instant hostility of all opposed to the british the circulation of a report that his troops were being disciplined by some english and native deserters from the company's forces would excite no suspicion whatever to avoid attracting attention charlie marriott and his party set out before daylight for madras their appearance indeed would have attracted no attention when they once had passed beyond the boundaries of the portion of the town occupied by the whites in the native quarter the appearance of a small zemindar or landowner attended by four or five armed followers on foot was of such a common occurrence as to attract no attention whatever and indeed numbers of these come in to take service in the sepoy regiments the profession of arms being always considered honorable in india for a fortnight they traveled by easy stages without question or suspicion being excited that they were not what they seemed they were now among the hills and soon arrived at ambur the seat of the rajah the town was a small one and above it rose the fortress which stood on a rock rising sheer from the bottom of the valley and standing boldly out from the hillside the communication was effected by a shoulder which starting from a point halfway up the rock joined the hill behind it along its shoulder there were walls and gateways an enemy attacking these would be exposed to the fire from the summit of the rock from the point where the shoulder joined the rock a zigzag road had been cut with enormous labor in the face of the rock to the summit it is a strong place charlie said to tim kelly who was walking by his horse's head and should be able to hold out against anything but starvation that is to say if properly defended it is a powerful place surely tim said and would puzzle the old boy himself to take even captain clyde who is afeard of nothing would be bothered by it as they rode up the alley two horsemen were seen spurring towards them from the town they drew rein before charlie and one bowing said my master the rajah sends his greetings to you and begs to know if you are the illustrious soldier nadar ali for whom his heart has been longing will you tell your lord that nadar ali is here charlie said and that he longs to see the face of the rajah one of the horsemen at once rode off and the other took his place by the side of charlie and having introduced himself as captain of the rajah's bodyguard rode with him through the town had charlie appeared in his character as english officer the rajah and all his troops would have been turned out to do honor to his arrival as it was a portion of the garrison only appeared at the gate and lined the walls through these the little party passed and up the sharp zigzags which were so steep that had it not been that his dignity prevented him from dismounting charlie would gladly have gotten off and proceeded on foot for it was as much as the animal could do to struggle up the steep incline at each time there was a gateway with little flanking towers on which jingles or small war pieces commanded the road faith then it's no fool that built this place i shouldn't like to have to attack it with all the soldiers of the king's army let alone those of the company it is tremendously strong tim but it is astonishing what brave men can do in the after wars which england waged in india the truth of what charlie said was over and over again proved numerous fortresses supposed by the natives to be absolutely impregnable and far exceeding in strength that just described had been carried by assault by the dash and daring of english troops they gained at last the top of the rock it was uneven in surface some portions being considerably more elevated than others roughly as the extent was about a hundred yards either way the lower level was covered with buildings occupied by the garrison 
and storehouses on the upper level some forty feet higher stood the palace of the rajah it communicated with the courtyard below by a broad flight of steps these led to an arched gateway with a wall and battlements forming an interior line of defence should an assailant gain a foothold in the lower portion of the stronghold alighting from his horse at the foot of the steps charlie followed by his five retainers mounted to the gateway here another guard of honor was drawn up passing through these they entered a shady courtyard on one side of which was a stone pavilion the flat ceiling was supported by massive columns closely covered with intricate sculpture the roof was arabesque with deeply cut patterns picked out in bright colors a fountain played in the middle on the farther side the floor which was of marble was raised and two steps led to a wide recess with windows of lattice stonework giving a view over the town and valley below in this recess were piles of cushions and carpets and here reclined the rajah a spare and active-looking man of some forty years old he rose as charlie approached the soldiers and sepoys remaining beyond the limits of the pavilion welcome brave nadir ali he said courteously my heart is glad indeed at the presence of one whose wisdom is said to be far beyond his years and who has learned the arts of war of the infidels from beyond the seas then inviting charlie to take a seat on the divan with him he questioned him as to his journey and the events which were taking place in the plains until the attendants having handed round refreshments retired at his signal i am glad to see you sahib he said when they were alone though in truth i looked for one older than yourself the great english governor of madras tells me however in a letter which i received four days since that you are skilled in war that you fought by the side of that great captain clive at arcot arney kavarapek and at trichinopoly and that the great warrior himself chose you to come to me therefore i doubt neither your valour nor your prudence and put myself in your hands wholly the governor has already told you doubtless of the position in which i am placed here governor sanders explained the whole position to me charlie said you are at present menaced on all sides by powerful neighbors you believe that the fortunes of the english are on the increase and as you think the time may come ere long when they will turn the french out of the deccan and become masters there as they have already become masters in the carnatic you wish to fight by their side and share their fortunes in the meantime you desire to be able to defend yourself against your neighbors for at present the english are too far away to assist you to enable you to do this i have been sent to drill and discipline your troops like our sepoys and to give you such advice as may be best for the general defence of the country i have brought with me five soldiers four beals and one of my countrymen the latter will be of little use in drilling your troops for he is ignorant of the language and has come as my personal attendant the other four will assist me in my work your followers here will no doubt discover in a very short time that i am an englishman let it be understood that i am a deserter that i have been attracted to your court by the promise of high pay and that i have assumed the character of a veal lest my being here might put you on bad terms with the english charlie then asked the rajah as to the strength of his military force in time of peace the rajah said i keep three hundred men under arms in case of taking the field three thousand to defend ambur against an attack of an enemy i could muster ten thousand men you could not call out three thousand men without attracting the attention of your neighbors charlie asked no the rajah said that would bring my neighbors upon me at once i suppose however you might assemble another five hundred men without attracting attention oh yes the rajah said eight hundred men are not a force which could attract any great attention 
then i should propose that we begin with eight hundred charlie said for a month however i will confine myself to the troops you at present have we must in the first place train some officers if you will pick out those to whom you intend to give commands and sub-commands i will choose from the men after drilling them for a few days forty of the most intelligent as what we call non-commissioned officers for the first month we will work hard in teaching these officers and sub-officers their duties then when the whole eight hundred assemble we can divide them into four parties there will be one of my drill instructors to each party ten under officers and four or five of the officers whom you will appoint six weeks hard work should make these eight hundred men fairly acquainted with drill the english sepoys have often gone out to fight with less at the end of the six weeks let the five hundred men you have called out in addition to your bodyguard of three hundred return to their homes and replace them by an equal number of fresh levies and so proceed until you have your three thousand fighting men thoroughly trained in nine months all will have had their six weeks of exercise and could take their places in the ranks again at a day's notice two hundred of your men i will train in artillery although i do not belong to that branch of the service i learned the duties at arcot the rajah agreed heartily to charlie's proposals well pleased at the thought that he should before the end of a year be possessed of a trained force which would enable him to hold his own against his powerful neighbors until an opportunity might occur when in alliance with the english he should be able to turn the tables upon them and to aggrandize himself at their expense end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of with clive in india this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary ullman a murderous attempt handsome rooms with a suite of attendants were assigned to charlie in the rajah's palace and he was formally appointed commander of his forces the four sepoys were appointed to junior ranks as was also tim kelly who however insisted on remaining in the position of chief attendant upon his master being in fact a sort of major domo and valet in one looking after his comforts when in the palace and accompanying him as personal guard whatever he wrote out you never know your honor what these natives may be up to they'll smile with you one day and stab you in the next they're treacherous varmint your honor if you do but give em the chance at first charlie perceived that his position excited some jealousy in the minds of those surrounding the rajah he therefore did all in his power to show to them that he in no way aspired to interfere in the internal politics or affairs of the little state that he was a soldier and nothing more he urged upon the rajah who wished to have him always by him that it was far better that he should appear to hold aloof and to avoid all appearance of favoritism or to obtain dominance in the councils of the rajah he wished that the appointments to the posts of officers in the new force should be made by the rajah who should lend an ear to the advice of his usual consulars but that once appointed they should be under his absolute command and control and that he should have power to dismiss those who prove themselves indolent and incapable to promote active and energetic men wholly regardless of influence or position the next morning charlie and his four assistants set to work to drill the three hundred men of the garrison taking them in parties of twenty they were thus able in the course of a few days to pick out the most active and intelligent for the sub-officers and these with their existing officers of the body and the new ones appointed by the rajah were at once taken in hand to be taught their duty for a month the work went on steadily and without interruption and from morn till night the courtyard echoed with the words of command at the end of that time the twenty officers and forty sub-officers had fairly learned their duty 
The natives of India are very quick in learning drill, and a regiment of newly raised sepoys will perform maneuvers and answer to words of a command in the course of a fortnight as promptly and regularly as would one of the English recruits in three months. A good many changes had taken place during the month's work. Many of the officers became disgusted with hard and continued work, to which they were unaccustomed while some of the sub-officers showed a deficiency of the quickness and intelligence needed for the work their places however were easily filled and as the days went on all took an increasing degree of interest as they acquainted facility of movement and saw how quickly according to the european method the maneuvers were gone through at the end of a month then the sixty men were able in turn to instruct others and a body of five hundred men being called out the work of drilling on a large scale began the drill ground now was a level place in the valley below the town and the whole population assembled day after day to look on with astonishment at the exercises the four great companies or battalions as charlie called them were kept entirely separate each under the command of one of the sepoys under whom were a proportion of the officers and sub-officers every evening charlie came down for an hour and put each body through its drill distributing blame or praise as it was deserved thus keeping up a spirit of emulation between the battalions at the end of a fortnight when the simpler maneuvers had been learned charlie for two hours each day worked the whole together as one regiment and was surprised himself to find how rapid was the progress which each day effected the rajah himself often came down to the drill ground and took the highest interest in the work he himself would fain have had regular uniforms similar to those worn by the sepoys in the service of the european powers provided for the men but charlie strongly urged him not to do so he admitted that the troops would look immensely better if clad in regular uniform than as a motley band each dressed according to his own fancy he pointed out however that while the news that the rajah was having some of his men drilled by european deserters would attract but little attention among his neighbors the report that he was raising sepoy battalions would certainly be received by them in a hostile spirit by all means charlie said get the uniforms made for the whole force and keep them by you in a store they can be at once served out in case of war and the sight of a number of sepoy battalions when they expected only to meet an irregular force will have an immense effect upon any force opposed to you the rajah saw the force of this argument and at once ordered five thousand suits of white uniforms similar to those worn by the sepoys in the english and french service to be made and stored up in the magazines while his lieutenants were drilling the main body charlie himself took in hand a party of forty picked men and instructed them in the use of field guns the superiority of europeans in artillery was one of the reasons which gave to them such easy victory in their early battles with the native forces in india the latter possessed a very powerful artillery in point of numbers but there was no regular drill nor matter of loading they were in the habit too of allowing each gun to cool after it was fired before being loaded again it was thought therefore good practice if a gun would discharge once in a quarter of an hour they were then utterly astonished and dismayed at the effect of the european guns each of which could be loaded and fired twice or even three times a minute so month passed after month until rajah Burhau was in a position to put if necessary five battalions of sepoy each seven hundred strong into the field with thirty guns served by trained artillerymen so quietly had the work gone on that it attracted no attention among his neighbors the mere rumor that the rajah had some european deserters in his service and that these were drilling four or five hundred men were considered of so little moment that it passed altogether unheeded the accounts of the state of affairs in the carnatic which reached charlie were not satisfactory duplex 
with his usual energy, was aiding the son of Chandra Sahib with men and money in his combat with the British protege, and most of the native allies of the latter had fallen away from him. Trichinopoly was again besieged, and the fortunes of England, lately so flourishing, were waning again. In the Deccan, French influence was supreme. Bussy, with a strong and well-disciplined French force, maintained Salabat Jung, whom the French had placed on the throne against all opponents. At one time it was the Peshwa, and another the Maharatis, against whom Bussy turned his arms, and always with success, and the French had acquired the four districts on the coast known as the Northern Circus. It was in vain that Charlie endeavoured to gain an accurate knowledge of the political position. So quickly and continually did this change. At one time the Pierce were, and the Nizam, as the Subada of the Deccan was now called, would be fighting in alliance against one or the other of the Mahratta's chiefs. At another time they would be in conflict with each other, while the Raja of Mysore, Morari Rio and other chiefs were sometimes fighting on, one side sometimes on the other. Proud of his rapidly increasing force, Borhau Rio would, more than once in the course of the year, have joined in the warfare going on around. Charlie, however, succeeded in restraining him from doing so, pointing out that the victor of one day was the vanquished of the next, and that it was worse than useless to join in a struggle of which the conditions were so uncertain and the changes of fortune so rapid, that none could count upon others for aid, however great the assistance they might have rendered only for a short time before. Were you to gain territory, Rajah, which you might perhaps largely do from the efficient aid which you might render to one party or the other, you would be the object of a hostile combination against you which you could not hope to struggle. The Raja yielded at once to Charlie's arguments, but the influence of the latter added to the hostility which the favour shown him by the Raja had provoked among many of the leading men of the states, where the Sides were often so closely balanced, as was the case in these intestine struggles. The aid of every Raja, however small his following, was sought by one or other of the combatants, and the counsellors of those able to place a respectable force in the field were heavily bribed by one side or the other. Those around Raja Burhau found their efforts completely baffled by the influence of the English commander of his forces, and a fraction of increasing strength and power was formed to overthrow him. The Raja himself had kept the secret well, and one or two only of his advisers knew that the Englishman was a trusted agent of the company. The soldiers were much attached to their English leader. They found him always just and firm. Complaints were always listened to, tyranny or ill-treatment by the officers suppressed and punished, merit rewarded. Among the officers, the strictness of the discipline alienated many who contrasted the easy life which they had led before the introduction of the European system with that which they now endured. So long as they were engaged in mastering the rudiments of drill, they felt their disadvantage, but when this was acquired, each thought himself capable of taking the place of the English adventurer, and of leading the troops he had organized to victory. Already Charlie had received several anonymous warnings that danger threatened him. The Raja was, he knew, his warm friend, and he, in his delight at seeing the formidable force which had been formed from his irregular levies, were presented him as a token of his gratitude with large sums of money. In those days, this was the method by which Indian princesses rewarded European officers who rendered them service, and it was considered by no means derogatory to the latter to accept the money. This was indeed the universal custom, and Charlie, knowing that Captain Clive 
had received large presents of this kind had no hesitation in following his example the treasures stored up by many of these indian princes were immense and a lack of rupees equivalent to ten thousand pounds was considered by no means a large present charlie foreseeing that sooner or later the little state would become involved in hostilities took the precaution of forwarding the money he had received down to madras sending it piecemeal in charge of native merchants and traders it was by these paid into the madras treasury where a large rate of interest for all monies lent by its employees was given by the company for those at home he felt no uneasiness it was very seldom that their letters reached him but he learned that they were still in high favor with his uncle that his mother continued installed at the head of the house and that the girls were both at excellent schools charlie mentioned to the rajah the rumors which had reached him of a plot against him the rajah assured him of his own support under all circumstances and offered that a strong guard should be placed night and day over the apartments he occupied this charlie declined a guard can always be corrupted he said my irish servant sleeps in my ante-room my four lieutenants are close at hand and knowing that the soldiers are for the most part attached to me i do not think that open force will be used i will however cause a large bell to be suspended above my quarters its ringing will be a signal that i am attacked in which case i reply upon your highness putting yourself at the head of the guard and coming to my assistance tim kelly was at once furious and alarmed at the news that danger threatened his master and took every precaution that he could imagine to ensure his safety he took to going down to the town himself to purchase provisions and so far as possible prepare these himself he procured two or three monkeys animals which he held in horror and offered them a portion of everything that came on the table before he placed it before his master charlie at first protested against this as his dinner became cold by waiting but tim had an oven prepared and ordered dinner half an hour before the time fixed by his master each dish was brought in was after a portion had been given to a monkey placed in the oven thus half an hour was given to allow the portion to work this was done without charlie's knowledge the oven being placed in the ante room and the dishes thence brought in in regular order by the body servant whom even tim allowed to be devoted to his master one day charlie was just sitting down to his soup when tim ran in for the lava haven mr charles don't put that stuff in your mouth it's poisoned or at any rate if it isn't one of the other dishes is poisoned tim nonsense man you're always thinking of poisonings and plots and it's lucky for your honor that i am to said just come into the next room and look at the monkeys charlie went in one of the little creatures was lying upon the ground evidently in a state of great agony the other was sitting up rocking itself backwards and forwards like a human being in pain they look bad poor little beast charlie said but what has that got to do with my soup sure your honor isn't that just what i kept the creatures for just to give them a taste of everything your honor has and i claps it into the oven there to cap it warm till i've had time to see by the monkeys whether it's good it looks very serious charlie said gravy do you go quietly out tim called two men from the guardhouse and seize the cook and place one or two men as sentries over the other servants i will go across to the rajah the latter on hearing what had happened ordered the cook to be brought before him together with the various dishes prepared for the dinner the man upon being interrogated vehemently denied all knowledge of the affair we shall see the rajah said eat up that plate of soup the man turned pale your highness will observe he stammered that you already told me that one of these dishes is poisoned i cannot say which and whichever i eat may be the fatal one the rajah made a signal to him to obey his orders but charlie interposed there is something in what he says your honor 
whether the man is innocent or guilty he would shrink equally from eating any of them it is really possible that he may know nothing of it the poison may have been introduced into the material beforehand if the man is taken to a dungeon i think i could suggest a plan by which we could test him i believe him to be guilty he said when the prisoner had been removed then why not let him be beheaded at once the rajah asked i would rather let ten guilty men escape charlie replied than run the risk of putting one innocent one to death i propose sir that you order the eight dishes of food which have been prepared for my dinner to be carefully weighed let these be all placed in the cell of the prisoner and there let him be left in the course of two or three days he will if guilty endeavor to assuage his hunger by eating little bits of food from every dish except that which he knows to be poison but will take such small portions that each that he will think it will not be detected if he is innocent and is really ignorant which dish is poisoned he will not touch any of them until driven to desperation by hunger then he will seize on one or more and devour them to the end running the chance of death by poison rather than endure the pangs of hunger longer your plan is a wise one roger said it shall be tried let the dishes be taken to him every morning and remove every evening each evening they shall be weighed these orders were carried out and on the following morning the dishes were placed in the cell of the prisoner when removed at night they were found to be untouched the next evening several of the dishes were found to have lost some ounces in weight the third evening all but one had been tasted let the prisoner be brought in again the rajah ordered when informed of this dog he said you have betrayed yourself had you been innocent you could not have known in which of the dishes the poison had been placed you have eaten of all but one and if that one contains the poison you are guilty then turning to an attendant he ordered him to take a portion of the untouched food and to throw it to a dog pending the experiment the prisoner was removed half an hour later the attendant returned with the news that the dog was dead the guilt of the man is confirmed the rajah said let him be executed would you give him to me your highness charlie asked his death would not benefit me now and to save his life he may tell me who is my enemy it is of no use punishing the instrument and letting the instigator go free you are right the rajah agreed if you can find out who bribed him justice shall be done though it were the highest in the state Charlie returned to his own quarters, assembled his lieutenants and several other of his officers, and had the man brought before him. Hosan, he said, you have taken money to take my life. I looked upon you as my faithful servant. I had done you no wrong. It has been proved that you attempted to poison me. You, when driven by hunger, ate small quantities, which you thought would pass unobserved, of all the dishes but one the dish has been given to a dog and he has died you knew then which was the poisoned dish the rajah has ordered your execution i offer you life if you will tell me who it was that tempted you the prisoner preserved a stolid silence we had better proceed to torture him at once one of the rajah's officers said the man turned a little paler he knew well the horrible tortures which would in such an instant be inflicted to extort the name of those who had bribed him i will say nothing he said firmly though you tear me limb from limb i have no intention of torturing you charlie said a confession extorted by pang is as likely to be false as true and even did you tell me one name there might still be a dozen engaged in it who would remain unknown no hosein you have failed in your duty you have tried to slay a master who was kind to you and trusted you no sahib the man exclaimed passionately you did not trust me the food i sent you was tested and tried i knew it but i thought that the poison would not have acted on the monkeys until you had eaten the dish the fool who sold it to me deceived me had you trusted me i would never have done it it was only when i saw that i was suspected and doubted without cause 
that my heart turned against you, and I took the gold which was offered to me to kill you. I swear it by the prophet. Charlie looked at him steadily. I believe you, he said. You were mistaken. I had no suspicions. My servant feared for me and took these precautions without telling me. However, Hossein, I pardon you, and if you will swear to me to be faithful in future, I will trust you. You shall again be my cook, and I will eat the food as you prepare it for me. I am my lord's slave, the man said in a low tone. My life is his. Charlie nodded, and the guard, standing on either side of the prisoner, stepped back, and without another word, he left the room a free man. Charlie's officers remonstrated with him, having not only pardoned the man, but restored him to his position of cook. I think I have done wisely, Charlie said. I must have a cook, for Tim Kelly here is not famous that way, and although he might manage for me when alone, he certainly could not turn out a dinner which would be suitable when I have some of the Rogers kinsmen and officers dining with me. Did I get another cook? He might be just as open to the office of my enemy as Hossein has been, and do you not think that, after what has passed, Hossein will be less likely to take bribes than any other man? Henceforth the oven was removed from the antechamber, and Charlie took his meals as Hossein prepared them for him. The man said little, but Charlie felt sure from the glances that he cast at him that he could rely upon Hossein now to the death. Tim Kelly, who felt the strongest doubts as to the prudence of the proceeding, observed that Hussein no longer brought articles from men who brought them up to sell to the soldiers, but that every morning he went out early and purchased all the supplies he desired from the shopkeepers in town. Tim mentioned the fact to his master, who said, You see, Tim, Hussein has determined that I shall not be poisoned without his knowing it. The little peddlers who come up here with herbs and spices and the ingredients for curry might be bribed to sell Hussein poison goods. By going into town and buying in the open market, it is barely possible that the goods could be poisoned. You need have no more anxiety whatever, Tim, as to poison. If the attempt is made again, it will probably be by sword or dagger. Well, Your Honor, he said, Tim, anything's better than poison. I got to sleep almost with one eye open, and you got sentries outside your window. What a pity it is that we ain't in a climate where one can fasten the windows and bolt the shutters. But now the wet season is over again. You might have your bed put, as you did last year, on the roof of your room with a canopy over it to keep off the dew. You would be safe then except from anyone coming through the room where I sleep. Charlie's bedroom was at the angle of the wall, and on two sides he could look down from his windows 200 feet, sheer into the valley below. The view from the flat terraced roof was a charming one, and as Tim said, Charlie had, in fine weather, converted the terrace into a sleeping room, a broad canopy, supported by poles at the corners stretched over it and even in the hottest weather the nights were not unpleasant here end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of with clive in india this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary Ullman. an attempt at murder the house, of which the bedroom occupied by Charlie formed part, was elsewhere two stories higher, this room jutting out alone into the angle of the wall. The rest of the suite of rooms were in the house itself, but access could be obtained to this room through the window, which looked on to the terrace of the wall. Charlie's lieutenants always took pains to place men upon whom they could thoroughly rely as sentries on this terrace. One night, a fortnight after the events which had been described, Charlie was asleep on his bed on the flats above his room. On one side, the house rose straight beside it. On two others was the fall to the valley. On the fourth side was the wall, along which two sentries were pacing to and fro. From time to time, from a door some distance along the side of the house, 
opening on to the wall a white figure came out stretched himself as if unable to sleep looked for a while over the parapet down into the valley appeared to listen intently and then sauntered into the house again it was the cook who seen it was his custom successive centuries had for many nights past seen him do the same but in a country where the nights are hot a sleepless servant attracts but little attention upon the occasion of one of these visits to the parapet he stood in an attitude of deep attention longer than usual then he carelessly sauntered back it was but a moment later that his face appeared at the window next to that of charlie's bedroom he stretched his head out and again listened intently then he went to tim who was sleeping heavily on a couch placed there and touched him he put his hand on his lips as tim sprang up take arm he said in hindustani bad man coming tim understood the words and seizing the sword and pistol which lay close to the bedside followed hossein who had glided up the stairs with a drawn tulwar in his hand at the moment he did so there was a noise of heavy bodies dropping followed by a sudden shot from charlie there was a sound of clashing of arms and the report of a pistol as tim's eyes came on a level with the terrace he saw hossein bound with uplifted blade into the midst of a group of men in a corner three times the blade rose and fell and each time a loud shriek followed then he disappeared in the midst tim was but a few seconds behind him discharging his pistol into the body of one of the men and running his sword into another he too stood by the side of his master charlie streaming with blood was half sitting half lying in the angle of the parapet hussein his turban off his long hair streaming down his back was standing over him fighting furiously against some ten men who still pressed forward while several others lay upon the ground in spite of the arrival of charlie's two allies they still pressed forward but the shots of the pistols had been echoed by the muskets of the sentry loud shots were heard showing that the alarm was sounding through the palace one more desperate effort the assailants made to beat the two men who opposed them over the parapet but hossein and the irishman stood firm the weight numbers of their opponents however told upon them when the first of the sentries appeared upon the platform followed closely by his comrade and both with leveled bayonets charged into the fray the assailants now thought only of escape but their position was a desperate one some rushed to the end of the terrace and tried to climb the ropes by which they had slid down from the upper roof of the house others endeavored to rush down the staircase but tim with one of the sentries guarded this point until a rush of feet below told that the guard was coming to their assistance it was well that help was at hand for the conspirators desperate at finding themselves in a trap gathered themselves together rushed with the fury of wild beasts upon tim and the sentry one was impaled upon a bayonet another cut down by tin and then borne back by the weight of their opponents they were hurled backwards down the stairs as the assailants followed them with a rush the guard sprang through the open window from the terrace below into the room there was a short and desperate conflict then two of the conspirators bounded up the staircase on to the roof ran to the parapet and leaped over into the valley two hundred feet below they were the last of the eighteen men who had lowered themselves from the roof above to attack charlie as soon as tim picked himself up he hastened to ascend the stairs again and to run to the side of his master charlie was insensible leaning against the parapet too weak to stand but still holding his sword and ready to throw himself once more before him stood hussein who now seeing tim approach and that all danger was over dropped the sword and sank upon the ground a minute or two later the rajah himself sword in hand hurried up he was greatly concerned and excited at the sight of which met his eyes charlie was at once lifted and carried down to one of the rajah's own rooms where he was instantly attended to a hasty examination showed that only two of the attacking party still breathed 
None of those who had fallen above survived. So fiercely and deadly had been the blows struck by Hossein and Tim. Charlie himself had cut down one and shot another before he fell, slashed in many places, just as Hossein bounded through his assailants. The bodies of the dead were, by the Rajah's orders, laid together for identification in the morning. The two who still lived were carried to the guard room and their wounds dressed, in order that the names of their employers may be obtained from them. In the meantime, Charlie's lieutenants had hastily formed a body of their soldiers together, and these at once fell upon a number of men who were crowding up the steps to the palace. With shouts of death to the Englishmen, a few volleys poured among these and effectually scattered them, and they broke and hurried down the steep road, through the gates to the town, the sentries on the way offering no opposition, but many falling under the fire from the parapet of the fort. In ten minutes all was over. The gates were again closed and a strong guard placed over them, and the attempted insurrection was, as it was at an end. The native surgeon who attended Charlie pronounced that none of the five wounds he had received, although for the most part severe, was necessarily fatal and that there was every chance of his recovery. Hussein's wounds, three in number, were pronounced to be more dangerous, one being a deep stab in the body given by a man who had rushed at him as he was guarding the blow of another. Tim's wounds were comparatively slight, and he suffered more from bruises he had received when hurled backwards down the stone staircase. However, with one arm in a sling and his head bandaged, he was able to take his place by his master's bedside. Having heard from him that it was entirely due to Hossein that Charlie's life had been saved, the Rajah directed that every attention should be paid to him, and several times during the night, Tim stole away to his bedside to press his hand and call down blessings upon him. The staunching of his wounds and the application of strong restoratives presently caused Charlie to open his eyes. The Lord be praised, Mr. Charles, Chim said, and that you're coming to yourself again. We're done for the murdering rascals, and please God, you'll soon be about again. Just drink this draught, your honor, and go off to sleep, if you can. In the morning, I'll tell you all about it. You're in the Rajah's own room, he continued, seeing Charlie's eyes wander wonderingly around him, and all you got to do is just to lie still and get well as soon as you can. It was a fortnight before Charlie, still very weak and feeble, was able to totter from his room to that in which Hussein was lying. He himself knew nothing of what had passed after he fell. The conflict had to him been little more than a dream awakening from sleep by the sound of his assailants as they dropped from the ropes. He had leaped up as a rush of figures came towards him, catching up his sword and pistol as he did so. He had shot the first and had cut down the next who rushed at him, but at the same moment he had felt a sharp pain and remembered no more. Tim heard from Hosan when the latter, two days after the fight, was able to speak, that he had suspected that some renewed attempt might be made upon his master's life, and that for many nights he had not slept, contenting himself with such repose as he could snatch in the daytime, between the intervals of preparing meals. A few minutes before the attack, he fancied he heard a movement on the roof of the house, and running to Charlie's room, he had, from the window, seen some dark figures sliding down the wall. Then he roused Tim and rushed up to the rescue. Tim eloquently described to his master the manner in which Hossein sprung upon his foes and cut his way through, in time to drive back those who were hacking at him as he lay prostrate, and how he found him standing over him, keeping at bay the whole of his assailants. Charlie, with difficulty, made his way to the bedside of the brave Mohammedan, the latter, however, did not know him. He was in a delirium of fever. He was talking rapidly to himself. He trusted me, he said. He gave me my life. Should I not give mine for him, anyone else would have had me hung as a dog. 
I will watch. I will watch. He shall see that Hossein is not ungrateful. Charlie's eyes filled with tears as he looked at the wasted form of his follower. Is there any hope for him, he asked the doctor. It is possible, just possible, that he may live, the latter said. Allah only knows. Do all you can to save him, Charlie said. I should be ever grateful to you if you do. Tim, now that his master could dispense with his services, transferred his attention to the bedside of Hossein, and was unremitting in the care and attention with which he kept the bandages on his head cool with fresh water and wetted his hot lips with refreshing drinks. It was another week before his illness took a turn. Then the fever left him, and he lay weak and helpless as an infant. Strong soups now took the place of the cooling drinks, and in a few days the native doctor was able to say confidently that the danger was past and that Hussein would recover. In the meantime, the investigations of the Raja had brought to light the details of the conspiracy. The wounded men had confessed that they were employed by three of the principal persons at the Raja's court, one of them being the Raja's brother. The information, however, was scarcely needed. As it was found in the morning that the apartments were empty, they having fled with the men who had attacked the gates of the palace. These consisted partly of soldiers whom they had bribed and of desperadoes from the town who had singly entered the fort during the day and had been concealed in the apartments of the conspirators until the signal for the attack was given. The intention of the conspirators was not only to kill the Englishmen, but to dethrone the Raja and install his brother in his place. The attack had commenced with the attempt upon Charlie's life, because it was believed that his death would paralyze the troops who were faithful to the Raja. At the end of six weeks, Charlie was able to resume his duties, and his appearances at the parade ground were were hailed with enthusiastic shouts by the soldiers. The Raja was more attached to him than ever, and had again made him large presents, in token of the regret that he felt at the suffering he had endured in his cause. Drilling was now carried on with redoubled energy, and large numbers of new levies had been summoned to the standard. A storm was gathering over Ambor. The Raja's brother was raising a force to attack him, and had, by means of large promises in case of success, persuaded Morari Rio to take up his cause, and he had, it was said, also sent messages to the Nizam, pointing out that in case of war with the English, the Raja of Ambor would be a thorn in his side. He told of the numbers of troops who had been drilled, and how formidable such a force would be, if opposed to him at a critical moment, while if he, the claimant, gained power, the army of Ambar would be at the disposal of the Nizam. The Raja, on his side, had also sent messages to Hyderabad, with assurances to the Nizam of his fidelity and friendship. He urged that the preparations he had made were intended solely for the defense of his state against marauding bands of, of Mahrattas, and especially against those of Murari Grio, who was a scourge to all his neighbors. In the meantime, every effort had been made to strengthen the defenses of Ambor. The walls surrounding the town were repaired, and although these in themselves could have offered but a slight defense to a determined assault, the approaches to the town were all covered by the guns of the fort above. The weak point of the defense was the hill behind the town. This sloped up, gradually to a point higher than the level of the projecting rock upon which the castle stood. It then rose in ragged, in rugged cliffs some two hundred feet higher and then fell away again steeply to its summit this was too far back for the fire of guns placed upon it to injure the castle or town guns placed however at the foot of the rocky wall would dominate the castle and render it at least untenable charlie had often looked with anxious eye at this point and one morning accompanied by the rajah he rode up to examine the position the highest point of the slope 
at the foot of the crag was nearly opposite the castle and it was here that an active enemy making his way along the slope was place his guns here charlie determined to establish a battery news had arrived that the rajah's brother had raised a force of three thousand men and that with seven thousand mahrattas he was about to march this force charlie felt certain that he could meet and defeat in the open but more disquieting news was that Busi, hearing that the rajah's troops had been trained by an englishman had advised the nizam to declare for his rival and to send a considerable force to his assistance if necessary fresh messengers were sent off with new assurances of the rajah's loyalty to the nizam it may not do much good charlie said but if we can induce him to remain quiet until we have defeated murari rio it will be so much gained charlie himself dispatched a messenger to mr sanders begging that assistance might be sent to the rajah having decided upon the position for a battery energetic steps were taken to form it a space large enough for the construction of the battery and for the tents and stores of the artillerymen and two hundred infantry was marked out and the rajah ordered the whole population of ambor men and women and children to assist at the work the troops too were all employed and under charlie's superintendence a wondrous change was soon effected the spot chosen was levelled a strong earthware was erected round it and then the surrounding ground was removed this was a work of immense labour the ground consisted first of a layer of soil then of debris which had fallen from the face of the rock above stones and boulders to the depth of some fifteen feet under which was the solid earth the slope resembled an anthill the soldiers and able-bodied men broke up the boulders and rock with sledge-hammers all were necessary with powder and blasted the rock when needed the women and children carried away the fragments in baskets the work lasted for a fortnight at the end of which a position of almost impregnable nature was formed at the foot of the earthworks protecting the guns both at the face and sides the ground composed of great boulders and stones slopes deeply out forming a bank fifteen feet deep at its foot again the solid rock was blasted away so as to form a deep chasm thirty feet wide and ten feet high round the foot of the fort for a hundred yards on each side the earth and stones had been entirely removed down to the solid rock ten guns were placed in the battery and the fire of these swept the slopes behind the town and castle rendering it impossible until the fort was carried for an enemy to attack the town on that side or to operate in any way against the only point at which an attack could be made upon the castle the rajah was delighted at this most formidable ascension to the defensive power of his fortress which was now in a position to defy any attack which could be made against it a store of provisions and ammunition was collected there and the command given to one of charlie's sepoy lieutenants with a hundred trained artillerymen and two hundred infantry numbers of cattle had been driven into town and castle and stores of provisions collected it was but two days after the battery was complete that the news arrived that the rajah's brother with morii rio had entered the rajah's dominions and was marching up the valley to the assault the rajah had in the first place wished to defend a strong gorge through which the enemy would have to pass this having hitherto been considered the defensible point of his capital against an invasion charlie pointed out however that although no doubt a successful defense might be made here it would only be a repulse which would leave the enemy but little weakened for further operations he argued that it was better to allow them to advance to the point where the valley opened out into a plain some two miles wide he had no doubt whatever that the rajah's troops would be able to inflict 
a crushing defeat upon the invaders who would be so disheartened thereby that they would be little likely to renew the attack two bodies of troops each three hundred strong were sent down to the gorge with orders to remain in hiding among the heights to allow the invading army to pass unmolested and then to inflict the greatest possible loss upon them as they returned these were under the command of another of charlie's lieutenants who received orders from him to erect breastworks of rock on the slopes above the entrance to the gorge after the enemy had passed on and to line these with a portion of his men who should pour a heavy fire into the enemy as they came down the valley while the rest were to line the heights above the gorge and to roll down the rocks upon those who passed through the fire of their comrades the uniforms were served out to the soldiers and charlie surveyed with pride the five battalions of trained troops which with twelve guns marched down into the valley and took up their posts behind it at a point which he had carefully chosen where the guns of the castle would be able to play upon an advancing body of troops a body of trained artillerymen were told off for this service and the last raised levies were posted in the castle and on the walls of the town the position was so chosen that the flanks of the line rested on the slopes on either side these were broken by enclosures and gardens into which on either side half a battalion was thrown forward so as to deliver a flanking fire upon an enemy advancing against the center across the valley two hundred yards in front of the position the stream which watered it made a sharp turn running for some distance directly across it and several small canals for the irrigation of the fields rendered the ground wet and swampy across the line occupied by his troops a breastwork had been thrown up and in front of this rows of sharp pointed stakes had been stuck in the ground altogether the position was a formidable one an hour or two after the position so carefully prepared had been taken up large bodies of mahratta horse were seen dashing up the valley and smoke rising from several points showed that they had begun their usual work of plundering and destroying the villages on their way a few discharges from the field pieces those in the castle had been ordered to be silent until the raising of a white flag gave them the signal to open fire checked the advance of the horsemen and these waited until their infantry should arrive the force of morari rio was at that time the most formidable of any purely native army of southern india recruited from desperados from all the maharati tribes well disciplined by its leader it had more than once fought without defeat against bodies of europeans while it had in all cases obtained such victories over other native armies presently the horsemen opened and a compact body of three thousand mahratta infantry accompanied by an equal number of the irregulars of the rajah's brother advanced to the attack while the cavalry at their side swept down upon the flanks of the rajah's position and thirty pieces of artillery opened fire not a shot was fired in return charlie ordering his men to lie down behind the breastworks until they received the word of command to show themselves the mahratta horsemen compelled by the bends of the stream to keep near the foot of the slopes came forward in gallant style until suddenly from every wall and every clump of bushes on the slopes above them a tremendous fire of musketry broke out while the twelve field guns six of which were posted on either side of charlie's centre poured a destructive fire into them so deadly was the rain of iron and lead that mahratta horsemen instantly drew bridle and leaving the ground strewn with their dead galloped back by this time the infantry covered by the fire of their artillery had reached the stream this was waist deep and the banks were some two feet above its level as they scrambled up after crossing it 
from the line of embankment in front of them a tremendous fire was opened although mowed down in scores the seasoned warriors of the mahratta chief cheered on by his voice as recklessly exposing himself he rode among them pressed forward ever increasing numbers gained a footing across the stream those in front keeping it up a heavy fire at the breastwork whose face was ploughed by their cannon shot as they advanced the guns of the castle opened fire not upon those in front for these were too near the line of entrenchment but upon the struggling mass still crossing the stream into which a ceaseless fire of musketry was poured from the slopes on their flanks still the mahratta infantry struggled bravely on until within a few yards of the entrenchment then suddenly with a mighty shout the rajah's troops leaped to their feet poured a volley from the crest of the breastwork into the enemy and then with fixed bayonets flung themselves upon them the effect was decisive the mahrattas had at the commencement of the fight scarcely outnumbered the troops of the rajah in front of them and had derived but little assistance from the levies of their ally who indeed had contented themselves with keeping up a fire upon the defenders of the slopes they had already suffered very severely and the charge made upon them along the whole line was irresistible before the bayonets crossed they broke and fled hotly pursued by the troops of the rajah these in accordance with charlie's orders did not scatter but kept in a close line four deep which advanced pouring tremendous volley into their foe in vain did murari rio endeavor to rally his men his infantry all order lost fled at the top of their speed their flight covered by their cavalry who sacrificed themselves in two or three brilliant charges right up to the line of pursuers, although suffering terribly from the withering volleys poured into their ranks. In vain did Morai Rio endeavor to rally his men. His infantry, all order lost, fled at the top of their speed, their flight covered by the cavalry who sacrificed themselves in two or three brilliant charges right up to the line of pursuers although suffering terribly from the withering volleys poured into their ranks the troops were now formed into heavy columns and these rapidly marched down the valley after their flying enemy an hour later the sound of heavy firing was heard in front and at redoubled speed the troops pressed onward when they arrived however at the gorge they found that the last of the fugitives had passed through the ground in front was strewn with dead and dying for as the mass of fugitives had arrived at the gorge the infantry from above had opened fire upon them several times the frightened throng had recoiled but at last impelled by the greatest fear of their pursuers behind they had dashed forward through the fire only to fall in hundreds in the gorge crushed beneath the rain of rocks showered down upon them from above End of chapter 13。Chapter 14 of With Clive in India。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Gary Ullman。The Siege of Ambur。The victory was a complete and decisive one。A thousand of the best troops。of morari rio had fallen beside some hundreds of their irregular allies whose loss was incurred almost wholly at the gorge in the retreat the rajah was in the highest state of delight at the splendid result obtained by the european training of his troops and these proud of their victory over such formidable opponents were full of enthusiasm for their young english leader the rejoicings in ambur that night were great and all felt confident that the danger was at an end what think you the rajah said to charlie as the long feast at an end they sat together in the divan smoking their nargahillies will be the result when the news of the defeat of morai rio reaches hyderabad it is difficult to say charlie replied it is possible of course that it may be considered that it is better to leave you in peace 
but upon the other hand it may be that they will consider that you are so formidable a power that it is absolutely necessary to crush you at once rather than to give you the chance of joining against them in the war which must sooner or later take place between them and the english in that case it will be a very different affair from that which we had to-day still i should send off a messenger to-morrow to acquaint the nizam with the defeat you inflicted upon the mahrattas who have invaded you to assure him again of your loyalty and to beg him to lay his authority upon morari rio not to renew the attack ten days later a messenger arrived from the nizam ordering the rajah to repair at once to hide the rabad to explain his conduct the latter sent back a message of humble excuses saying that his health was so injured by the excitement of recent events that he was unable to travel but that when he recovered he would journey to hyderabad to lay his respects at the feet of the nisan two or three days later a messenger arrived from mr sanders with a letter to charlie in this he expressed his great satisfaction at the defeat of morii rio had received a defeat which would for some time keep him quiet and so relieve the strain upon the english affairs had he said since the departure of clive for england been going badly duplex had received large reinforcements and the english had suffered several reverses mr saunders begged him to assure the rajah of the respect and friendship of england and to give him the promise that if he should be driven from his capital he would be received with all honors at madras and should be reinstated in his dominions with much added territory when the english were again in a position to take the field in force and to settle their long feud with the french ten days later they heard that the army of the nizam of fifteen thousand troops with eight hundred french under Bussy, were marching against them and that the horsemen of morii rio were devastating the villages near the frontier a council of war was held charlie would fain have fought in the open again believing that his trained troops flushed with their recent victory would be a match even for the army of the nizam but the rajah and the rest of the council alarmed at the presence of the french troops who had hitherto proved invincible against vastly superior forces of natives frank from such a course and it was decided that they should content themselves with the defence of the town and castle orders were accordingly issued that the old men the women the children should at once leave the town and under guard of one battalion of troops take refuge in an almost impregnable hill fort some miles away one battalion was placed in garrison in the castle the other three with the irregulars took post in the town whence if they could if necessary retreat into the castle the day following the renewal of the non-combatants the enemy appeared coming down the valley having marched over the hills while the mahratta cavalry again poured up from below Charlie had taken a command of the town as it was against this that the efforts of the enemy would be first directed it was an imposing sight as the army of the nizam wound down the valley the great masses of men with their gay flags the elephants with the gold embroidery of their trappings glistened in the sun the bands of horsemen careening here and there the lines of artillery drawn by bullocks and less picturesque but far more menacing the dark body of french infantry who formed the nucleus and head of the whole the camp was pitched just out of range of the guns of the fort and soon line after line of tents gay with the flags that floated above them rose across the valley charlie had mounted to the castle the better to observe the movements of the enemy and he presently saw a small small body of horsemen ride out of the camp and mount the hillside across the valley a glass showed that some of these were native officers while others were in the dark uniform of the french i have no doubt charlie said to the rajah that is the nizam himself with Bussy gone up to reconnoitre the position 
I wonder how he likes the look of it. I wish we could have turfed the battery above and the newly stripped land. We might, in that case, have given them a present surprise. As it is, they are hardly likely to begin by an attack along the slopes in the rear of the town, and you will see that they will commence the attack at the farther face of the town. The battery above cannot aid us in our defense there, and although the castle may help, it will only be by a direct fire. If they try to carry the place by a coup de main, I think we shall beat them off. But they must succeed by regular approaches. We must inflict as much loss as we can and then fall back. However, it will be some time before that comes. The next morning, Charlie found that the enemy had, during the night, erected three batteries on the slopes facing the north wall of the town, that farthest removed from the castle. They at once opened fire, and the guns on the walls facing them replied, while those on the castle hurled their shot over the town into the enemy's battery. For three days the artillery fire was kept up without intermission. The guns on the wall were too weak to silence the batteries of the besiegers. Although these were much annoyed by the fire from the fort, which dismounted four of their guns and blew up one of their magazines. Several times the town was set on fire by the shell from the French mortars, but Charlie had organized the irregulars into bands with buckets, and these succeeded in extinguishing the flames before they spread. Seeing that the mud wall of the town was crumbling rapidly before the besiegers' fire, Charlie set his troops to work and leveled every house within fifty yards of it, and with the stones and beams formed barricades across the end of the streets beyond. Many of the guns from other portions of the walls were removed and placed on these barricades. The ends of the houses were loopholed, and all were prepared for a desperate defense. Charlie's experience at Arcot stood him in good stead, and he imitated the measures taken by Clive at that place. When these defenses were completed, he raised a second line of barricades some distance further back, and here, when the assault was expected, he placed one of his battalions with orders that, if the inner line of entrenchments were carried, they should allow all the defenders of the post to pass through and then resist until the town was completely evacuated when they were to fall back upon the fort. He had, however, little fear that his position would be taken at the first assault. Upon the evening of the third day, the besiegers' fire had done its work, and a gap in the wall some eighty yards wide was formed. The garrison was ordered to hold themselves in readiness, and a strict watch was set. Towards morning, a distant hum in the Nizam's camp proclaimed that the troops were mustering for the assault. The besiegers' guns had continued their fire all night. To prevent working parties from placing obstacles in the breach, as the first shades of daylight appeared, the fire ceased and a great column of men poured forward to the assault. The few remaining guns upon the end wall opened upon them, as did the infantry who lined the parapet, while the guns in the castle at once joined in. The mighty column, however, composed of the troops of the Nizam, pressed forward, poured over the fragments of the wall, and entered the clear space behind it. Then, from housetop and loophole, and from the walls on either side, a concentrated fire of musketry was poured upon them, while twelve guns, four on each barricade, swept them with grape. The head of the column withered away under the fire. Long lines were swept through the crowded mass, and after a minute or two's while firing at their concealed foes, the troops of the Nizam, appalled and shattered by the tremendous fire, broke and fled. The instant they had cleared the breach, the guns of the besiegers again opened furiously upon it to check any sortie which the besieged might attempt. An hour later, the besiegers hoisted a white flag and requested to be allowed to bury their dead and remove their wounded. This Charlie agreed to, with the provision that these should be carried by his own men beyond the breach. 
as he did not wish that the enemy should have an opportunity of examining the internal defences. The task occupied some time, as more than 500 dead and dying lay scattered in the open space. During the rest of the day, the enemy showed no sign of resuming the assault. During the night, they could be heard hard at work, and although a brisk fire was kept up to hinder them, Charlie found that they had pushed trenches from the batteries a considerable distance round each corner of the town. For four days, the besiegers worked vigorously, harassed as they were by the guns of the fort and by those of the battery high up on the hillside which were now able to take in flank the works across the upper angle of the town. At the end of that time, they had erected and armed two batteries, which at daylight opened upon the walls which formed the flanks of the clear space behind the breach. Although suffering heavily from the fire of the besieged and losing many men, these batteries kept up their fire unceasingly, night and day, until great gaps had been made in the wall, and Charlie was obliged to withdraw his troops from them, behind the line of barricades. During the time the fire of the batteries in front had been unceasing and had destroyed most of the houses which formed the connecting line between the barricades. Each night, however, the besieged worked to repair damages and to fill up the gaps thus formed with piles of stones and beams so that by the end of the fourth day after the repulse of the first assault a line of barricades stretched across the line of defence the enemy this time prepared to attack by daylight and early in the morning the whole army of the nizam marched to the assault heedless of the fire of the castle they formed up in a long line of heavy masses along the slope one huge column moved forward against the main breach two advanced obliquely towards the great gaps in the walls on either side the latter columns were each headed by bodies of french troops in vain the guns of the fort aided by those of the battery on the hill swept them the columns advanced without a check until they entered the breaches then a line of fire swept along the crest of the barricades from end to end and the cannon of the besieged roared out pressed by the mass from behind the columns advanced torn and rent by the fire and at last gained the foot of the barricade here those in front strove desperately to climb up the great mound of rubbish while those behind covered them with a storm of bullets aimed at its summit more than once the troops of the rajah rushing down the embankment drove back the struggling masses but so heavily did they suffer from the fire when they thus exposed themselves the charlie forbade them to repeat the attempt he knew that there was safety behind and was unwilling that his brave fellows should throw away their lives in the centre of the position the native troops although they several times climbed some distance up the barricade were yet unable to make way but the french troops at the flanks were steadily forcing their way up many had climbed up by the ruins of the wall and from its top were firing down on the defenders of the barricade inch by inch they won their way up the barricade although already thickly covered with dead and then charlie seeing that his men were beginning to waver gave the signal the long blast of a trumpet was heard even above the tremendous din in an instant the barricades were deserted and the defenders rushed into the houses the partition walls between these on the lower floors had already been knocked down and without suffering from the heavy fire which the assailants opened as soon as they gained the crest of the barricade the defenders retreated along these covered ways until in rear of the second line of defence this was held by the battalion placed there until the whole of the defenders of the town had left it by the gate leading up to the fort then charlie withdrew this battalion also and the town remained in the hands of the enemy who had lost charlie reckoned fully fifteen hundred men in the assault 
During the fight, Tim and the faithful Jose, now fully recovered and promoted to the rank of an officer, had remained close beside him and were with him the last to leave the town. The instant the evacuation was complete, the guns of the hill battery opened upon the town, and a tremendous fire of musketry was poured upon it from every point of the castle which commanded it, while the guns which from their lofty elevation could not be depressed sufficiently to bear upon the town directed their fire upon the bodies of the troops still beyond the walls the enemy had captured the town indeed but his possession aided them but little in their assault upon the fort the only advantage it gave them would have been that it would have enabled them to attack the lower gate of the force protected by the outer wall from the fire of the hill battery charlie had however perceived that this would be the case and had planted a number of mines under the wall at this point these were exploded when the defenders of the town entered the fort and a hundred yards of the wall were thus destroyed leaving the space across which the enemy must advance to the attack of the gate exposed to the fire of the hill battery as well as of the numerous guns of the fort bearing upon it two days passed without any further operation on the part of the enemy and then Busey, seeing that nothing whatever could be done towards assaulting the fortress so long as the battery remained in the hands of the besieged determined to make a desperate effort to carry it ignorant of its immense strength at night therefore he ordered two bodies of men each fifteen hundred strong to mount the hillside far to the right and left of the town to move along at the foot of the wall of rock and to carry the battery by storm at daybreak charlie believing that such an attempt would be made had upon the day following the fall of the town taken his post there and had ordered a most vigilant watch to be kept up each night placing sentries some hundred yards away on either side to give warning of the approach of an enemy towards daybreak on the third morning a shot upon the left followed a few seconds later by one on the right told that the enemy was approaching a minute or two afterwards the sentries ran in climbed from the ditch by ladders which had been placed there for the purpose and hauling these up after them was soon in the battery with the news that large bodies of the enemy were approaching on either flank scarcely were the garrison at their post when the french were seen approaching at once they broke into a run and gallantly led dashed across the space of cleared rock in spite of the heavy fire of musketry and grape when they came however to the edge of the deep gulf in the solid rock they paused they had had no idea of meeting with such an obstacle as this it was easy enough to leap down but impossible to climb up the steep face ten feet high in front of them and which in the dim light could be plainly seen it was however impossible for those in front to pause pressed upon by those behind who did not know what was stopping them large numbers were compelled to jump into the trench where they found themselves unable either to advance or retreat by this time every gun on the upper side of the castle had opened on the assailing columns taking them in flank when the fire of the battery was continued without a moment's intermission Busi himself, who was commanding one of the columns, pushed his way through his struggling soldiers to the edge of the trench, when seeing the impossibility of scaling the sides, unprovided as he was with scaling ladders, he gave the orders to retreat, and the columns, harassed by the flanking fire of the guns of the castle and pursued by that of the battery, retreated, having lost some hundreds of their number beside a hundred and fifty of their best men prisoners in the deep trench around the battery these were summoned to surrender and resistance being impossible they at once laid down their arm ladders were lowered to them and they were marched the prisoners to the fort the next morning when the defenders of the fortress looked over the valley the great camp was gone the nizam and Busi, despairing of the possibility of carrying the position 
at once so enormously strong by nature and so gallantly defended had raised the siege which had cost them over two thousand of their best soldiers including two hundred french killed and prisoners and retreated to the plateau of the deccan the exultation of the rajah and his troops was unbounded they felt that now and henceforth they were safe from another invasion and the rajah saw that in the future he should be able to gain greatly increased territory as the ally of the english his gratitude to charlie was unbounded and he literally loaded him with costly presents three weeks later a letter was received by the latter from mr sanders congratulating him upon the inestimable service which he had rendered and appointing him to the rack of captain in the company's service now that the rajah would be able to protect himself should any future assault be made upon him an event most unlikely to happen as Bussy and the nizam would be unwilling to risk a repetition of a defeat which had already so greatly injured their prestige he had better return to madras where as mr saunders said the services of so capable an officer were greatly needed he warned him however to be careful in the extreme how he made his way back as the country was in a most disturbing state the mahratta bands being everywhere out plundering and burning subsequent information that the mahrattas were swarming in the plains below determined charlie to accept an offer which the rajah made him that he should under a strong escort cross the mountains and make his way to a port on the west coast in the state of a friendly rajah where he would be able to take ship and coast round to madras the rajah promised to send charlie's horses and other presents down to madras when an opportunity should offer and charlie accompanied by the four sepoys all of which had been promoted to the rank of officers by tim kelly and jose who would not separate himself a moment from his side started from ambor with an escort of thirty horsemen the rajah was quite affected at the parting and the army which he had formed and organized paraded before him for the last time and then shouted their farewell charlie himself although glad to return among his countrymen from whom he had been nearly two years separated was yet sorry to leave the many friends he had made his position was now a very different one from that which he held when he left madras then he was a newly made lieutenant who had distinguished himself indeed under clive but who was as yet unknown save to his commander and who was as poor as when he had landed eighteen months before in india now he had gained a name for himself and a successful defence of ambor had been of a month's service to the company he was too a wealthy man for the presence in money alone of the rajah had amounted to over twenty five thousand pounds a sum which in these days may appear extraordinary but which was small to that frequently bestowed by wealthy native princes upon british officers who had done them a good service clive himself after a short campaign had returned to england with a far larger sum for several days the party rode through the hills without incident and on a fifth day they saw stretched at their feet a rich flat country dotted with villages beyond which extended the long blue line of the sea the distance was greater than charlie imagined and twas only after two days long ride that he reached calicut where he was received with great honor by the rajah to whom the leader of the escort brought letters of introductions from the rajah of ambor for four days charlie remained as his guest then took passage in a large native vessel bound for ceylon whence he would have no difficulty in obtaining passage to madras these native ships are very high out of the water rising considerably towards the stem and stern and in form they somewhat resemble the chinese junk but are without the superabundance of grotesque paintings carving and gliding which distinguish the latter the rajah accompanied charlie to the shore and a salute was fired 
by his followers in honor of the departure of the guest. The weather was lovely, and the clumsy craft, with all sails set, was soon running down the coast when they had sailed some hours from Calicut. From behind a headland, four vessels suddenly made their appearance. They were lower in the water and much less clumsy in appearance than the ordinary native craft, and were propelled not only by their sails, but a number of oars on each side. No sooner did the captain and crew of the ship behold these vessels than they raised a cry of terror and despair. The captain, who was part owner of the craft, ran up and down the deck like one possessed, and the sailors seemed scarcely less terrified. "'What on earth is the matter?' Charlie exclaimed. "'What vessels are those, and why are you afraid of them?' "'Tulagi and Garia! Tulagi and Garia!' the captain cried, and the crew took up the refrain. The name that they uttered fully accounted for their terror. End of chapter 14「of with clive in india this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gary Ullman. chapter 15 the pirate's hold sivaji the founder of the maharatta empire had in 1662 seized and fortified yajadrug or as the english call it garia a town on the mouth of the river canoe one hundred and seventy miles south of Bombay, and also the island of Suwandrug, about halfway between Garia and Bombay. Here he established a piratical fleet. Fifty years later, Kanhagi Angria, the commander of the Maharati fleet, broke off this connection with the successors of Sivaji and set up as a pirate on his own account. Kanhagi not only plundered the native vessels, but boldly preyed upon the commerce of the European settlements. The ships of the East India Company, the French Company, and the Dutch were frequently captured by these pirates. Tulagi Angria, who succeeded his father, was even bolder and more successful, and when the man-of-war brig, the Restoration, with twenty guns and two hundred men, was fitted out to attack him, he defeated and captured her. After this, he attacked and captured the French man-of-war Jupiter with forty guns and had even the insolence to assail an english convoy guarded by two men of war the vigilant of sixty-four guns and the ruby of fifty the dutch in seventeen thirty five sent a fleet of seven ships of war two bomb vessels and a strong body of troops against Jurea. the attack was however repulsed with considerable loss from that date the pirates grew bolder and bolder and were a perfect scourge to the commerce of western india charlie marriott had of course frequently heard of the doings of these noted pirates and the cry of tulagi angria at once explained to him the terror of the master and crew what is it mr charles what on earth is the botheration about is it the little ships they are feared of those ships belong to a pirate called Tulagi Angria, Charlie said, and I am very much afraid, Tim, that we are likely to see the inside of his fortress. But sure, your honor, we're not afeard of those four little boats. We are, Tim, and very much afraid. Each of those boats, as you call them, carries four or five times as many men as this ship, and they are well armed, while we have only those two little guns which are useless except for show if the crew were englishmen we might attempt a defence although even then the odds would be terribly against us but with these natives it is hopeless to think of it and the attempt would only ensure our throats being cut it was clear that the idea of resistance did never even enter the minds of the crew of the trader some ran to and fro with gesticulations and cries of despair some threw themselves upon the deck of the vessel tore their hair and rolled as if in convulsions some sat down quietly with the air of a pathetic resignation with which the natives of india used to meet what they considered the inevitable 
Hossein, who at the first alarm had bounded to his feet with his hand on his knife, subsided into an attitude of indifference when he saw that Charlie did not intend making any defense. It's mighty lucky, Tim said, that your honor left all your presents to be forwarded to Madras. I thought you were wrong, Mr. Charles, when you advised me to send them thousand rupees the Rajah gave me along with your money. A hundred pounds wasn't the sum that Tim Kelly was likely to handle again in a hurry, and it went again the grain with me to part with them out of my hand. Sure and as well I took your honor's advice. The four sepoy officers also exchanged a few words with Charlie. They too would have resisted had he given the word. Hopeless though the effort would have been, but they acquiesced at once in his decision. They had little to lose but the thought of a prolonged captivity and of being obliged, perhaps, to enter the service of the Maratha freebooters, just when about to return to their wives and families at Madras, was a terrible blow to them. Keep up your spirits, Charlie said. It is a bad business, but we must hope for the best. If we bide our time, we may see some chance of escape. You had better lay down your arms in a pile here. Then we will sit down quietly and await their coming on board. They will be here in a minute now. Scarcely had the seven passengers taken their seats in a group on the poop when the free booters ranged alongside and swarmed over the sides of the deck. Beyond bestowing a few kicks upon the crew, they paid no attention whatever to them but tore off the hatches and at once proceeded to investigate the contents of the hole. The greater portion of this considered of native grain, but there were several bales of merchandise concerned by traders at Calicut for Ceylon. The cargo was, in fact, rather more valuable than that generally found in a native coaster, and the pirates were satisfied. The leader of the party, leaving to his followers the task of examining the hole, walked towards the group on the poop, they rose as he approached. Who are you? The Mahratta asked. I am an officer in the English company's service, Charlie said, as are these five natives. The other Englishman is a soldier under my orders. Good, the Mahratta said emphatically. Tulagi and Giria will be glad to have you. When your people capture any of our men, which is not office, they hang them. Tulaji is glad to have people he can hang to. After being stripped of any small valuables on their persons, the captives were taken on board one of the pirate boats. A score of the Mahrattas remained in charge of the trader. Her head was turned north, and accompanied by the four Mahratta boats, she proceeded up the coast again. Another trader was captured on the way, but two others evaded the pirates by running into the port of Calicut. The trader was a slow sailor, and they were eight days before they approached Giria. Early in the morning, a heavy cannonade was heard in the distance, causing the greatest excitement of guns among the Mahrattas. Every sail was hoisted, the sweeps got out, and leaving the trader to jog along in their rear, the four light craft made their way rapidly along the coast. The firing became heavier and heavier. And as it became light, three large ships could be seen about two miles ahead, surrounded by a host of smaller craft. That's a big fight, Mr. Charles, Tim explains. It reminds me of three big bulls in a meadow attacked by a host of little curs. It does, Tim, but the curs can bite. What a fire they are keeping up. But those warships ought to thrash any number of them. Count the ports. I can see them now. The biggest one, Tim said has got twenty-five, yes, and the other eighteen and nine. These are two frigates, one of fifty and the other of thirty-six guns and a sloop of eighteen. I can't make out the colors, but I don't think they're English. They're not English, Your Honor, Tim said confidently, or they would soon make an end of them varmint that tormented them. The scene as the boats approached was very exciting. The three ships were pouring their broadships without intermissions, into the pirate fleet. This consisted of vessels of all sizes, from the Jupiter and Restoration down to the large rowing galleys. Although many were sunk and more greatly damaged by the fire of the Dutch, they swarmed round the great ships with wonderful tenacity, and while the larger vessels 
fought their guns against those of the men of war the smaller ones kept close to them avoiding as much as possible their formidable broadsides but keeping up a perpetual musketry fire at their bulwarks and tops throwing stink pox and shooting burning arrows through the ports and getting alongside under the muzzles of the gun and trying to climb up into the ports the four newly arrived craft joined in the fray this is mighty unpleasant your honor tim said as, as a shot from one of the dutch men of war struck the craft they were in crashing a hole through her bulwarks and laying five or six of her crew upon the deck killed or wounded by the splinters here we are in the middle of a fight in which we we've no concern whatever and which is carried on without asking our will or pleasure and we are as likely to be killed by a christian shot as these heathen niggers hear them yell your honor a faction fight nothing to it look your honor look there's smoke curling up from a hatchway of the big ship if they haven't set her afire it was as tim said a cloud of black smoke was rising from the dutch fifty-gun frigate a wild yell of triumph broke from the marauders the fire of their guns upon her redoubled while that from the man-of-war died away as the crew were called off to assist in extinguishing the fire now the smaller boats pressed still more closely round her and a rain of missiles was poured through the open ports several times the marauders climbed on board but each time were driven out again the smoke rose thicker and thicker and tongues of flame could be seen shooting up she is doomed charlie exclaimed even if unmolested the crew could not extinguish the fire now it has got too much hold ah the other frigate is on fire now fresh yells of triumph rose from the marathas on board the sloop every sail was hoisted in spite of the continued fire of muskets and arrows which killed many of the sailors employed the jupiter however ran alongside her and grappled with her and a furious combat could be seen proceeding on the decks meanwhile its flames mounted higher and higher on board the two frigates the crew now could be seen leaping overboard from the ports choosing any death rather than fire it was but a choice many were drowned the rest cut down and shot by the marauders down came the dutch flag fluttering from the masthead of the sloop and the wild marauder yet proclaimed that the victory was everywhere complete the frigates were now a sheet of flame and the marauder craft drew away from them until with two tremendous explosions their magazines blew up and they sunk beneath the waters i should scarcely have believed it possible charlie said that three fine ships of war mounting a hundred and four guns could be destroyed by a fleet of pirates however numerous well tim there is no doubt that these natives can fight when well led it is just as well as you see that we did not attempt to offer any resistance in that clumsy craft we were on board you're right there your honor they would have eaten us up in five minutes it makes my heart bleed to think of the sailors of those two fine ships i don't believe that a soul has escaped but in the small ones some may have been taken prisoners when the fight was over the craft in which where the captives ran alongside the flagship of the pirate leader and the captain reported to him the capture he had made fortunately tulagi angria was in a high state of delight at the victory he had just won and instead of ordering them to be instantly executed he told the captain to take them on to suwandrug and to imprison them there until his arrival he himself with the rest of his fleet and the captured dutch sloop sailed in garia and the craft in which charlie and his companions were imprisoned continued her course to the island stronghold of the pirates suwandrug was built on a rocky island it lay within gunshot of the shore here when kanhagi angria had first revolted from the authority of the Mahratta kingdom, the ruler of the Deccan had caused three strong forts to be built in order to reduce the island fort. The pirates, however, had taken the initiative and had captured these forts as well as the whole line of sea coast. 
a hundred and twenty miles in length of the country behind twenty or thirty miles broad extending to the foot of the mountains on their arrival at suwandrug the prisoners were handed over to the governor and were imprisoned in one of the casements of the fort the next day they were taken out in order to work and for weeks they labored at the fortifications with which the pirate was strengthening their already natural strong position the labor was very severe but it was a consolation to the captives that they were kept together by charlie's advice they exerted themselves to the utmost and thus succeeded in pleasing their masters and in escaping with but a small share of the blows which were liberally distributed among other prisoners native and european employed upon the work charlie indeed was appointed as a sort of overseer having under him not only his own party but thirty others of whom twenty were natives and ten english sailors who had been captured in a merchantman although closely watched he was able to cheer these men by giving them a hope that a chance of escape from their captivity might shortly arrive all expressed their readiness to run any risk to regain their liberty from what he heard the pirates say charlie learned that they were expecting an attack from an expedition which was preparing at bombay the english sailor were combined in a casement adjoining that occupied by charlie and his companions the guard kept over them was but nominal as it was considered impossible that they could escape from the island off which lay a large fleet of the pirate vessels one morning upon starting to work they perceived by the stir in the fortress that something unusual was taking place and presently on reaching the rampart they saw in the distance a small squadron approaching they could make out that it consisted of a ship of forty-four guns one of sixteen and two bomb vessels together with a fleet of native craft the pirate fleet was all getting up sail it's a bold thing tim to attack this fortress with only two ships when the pirates have lately beaten a dutch squadron mounting double the number of guns ay your honor but then there is the union jack floating at the masthead do you think the creatures don't know the differ but the dutchmen are good sailors and fought well tim i think the difference is that in the last case they attacked the dutch while in the present we are attacking them it makes all the difference in the world with indians let them attack you and they'll fight bravely enough go right at them and they're done for look the pirate fleet are already sailing away and do you think the english will take the fort your honor i don't know tim the place is tremendously strong and built on a rock there are guns which bear right down on the ships if they venture in close while theirs would do but little damage to these solidly built walls suwandrug ought to resist a fleet ten times as strong as that before us sure then your honor and we will have to remain here all our lives do you think no tim i hope not besides i think that we ought to be able to render some assistance to them and how will we do it your honor you have but to spake the word and tim kelly is ready to go through fire and water and so is hossein ye may be sure of that seeing that the pirates were now mustering round their guns and that the ships were ranging up for action charlie thought it prudent to retire hitherto no attention had been paid to them but it was probable enough that when the pirates blood became heated by the fight they would vent their fury upon their captives he therefore advised not only the native officers but the sailors to retire to their casements which as the guns placed in them did not command the position taken up by the ships were at present untenable by any of the garrison presently the noise of guns proclaimed that the engagement had begun the boom of the cannon of the ships was answered by an incessant fire from the far more numerous artillery of the fortress while now and then a heavy explosion close at hand told of the bursting of the bombs from the mortar vessel in the fortress charlie had been thinking of the best measures to be taken to aid his friends Even, ever since the squadron came in sight and after sitting quietly for half an hour he called his officers around him i am convinced he said that if unaided from within the ships will have no chance whatever of taking this fortress but i think we may help them 
the upper fort which contains the magazine commands the whole of the interior but its guns do not bear upon the ships where they are anchored probably the place at present is almost deserted as no one pays any attention to us i propose with tim kelly and the ten english sailors to seize it we can close the gate and discharge the guns upon the defenders of the sea face we could not of course defend it for five minutes if they attacked us but we would threaten to blow up the magazines if they did so i propose that tomorrow morning you four and hossein we should strip to your loincloths and just before it becomes light go along the walls and stop up with pieces of wood the touch holes of as many of the cannon as you can it would not do to use nails even if we had them no one will notice in the dark that you are not marauders and if you scatter about you may each manage to close up four or five guns at least it is i know a desperate service and if discovered you will be instantly killed but if it succeeds the pirates scared by discovering just as our ships open fire that a number of their guns are disabled while we take them in the rear from the fort behind may not improbably surrender at once at any rate it is worth trying and i for one would rather run the risk of being killed than be condemned to pass my life the slave of these pirates who may at any moment cut our throats in case of any reverse happening to them the four native officers at once stated their willingness to join in the plan hossein did not consider any reply necessary with him was a matter of course to do whatever charlie suggested the latter then went into the next casement and unfolded his plan to the sailors who hardly agreed to make an effort for their liberty the fire continued all day unabated and at nightfall when a man as usual brought the captives food he exultingly told them that no damage whatever had been affected by the guns of the fleet in the evening the party cut a number of pieces of wood these measuring by the cannon and the casemate they made of, of just sufficient size and length to push down with a slight effort through the touch hole when pushed down to their full length they touched the interior of the cannon below and were just level with the top of the touch hole thus it would be next to impossible to extricate them in a hurry they might indeed be broken and forced in by a solid punch of the same size as the touch hole but this would take time and would not be likely to occur on the moment to the pirates the skewers for this is what they resembled were very strong and tough being made of slips of bamboo the prisoners had all knives which they used for cutting their food with these the work was accomplished towards morning the five natives with the skewers hidden away in their long course and their turbans twisted in mahratta fashion stole out from the casements charlie had ordered that in case they should see that the ships had drawn off from the position they occupied on the preceding day they should return without attempting to carry out their tasks he himself with tim joined the sailors and first ascending the ramparts and seeing that the ships were still at anchor abreast of the fort he and his comrades strolled across the interior of the fort in the direction of the magazine they did not keep together nor did all move directly towards the position which they wished to gain the place was already astir large numbers of the pirates thronged the interior groups were squatted around fires busy in cooking their breakfast numbers were coming from the magazine with powder to fill up the small magazines on the wall others again were carrying shot from the pyramids of missiles piled up here and there in the courtyard none paid any attention to the english prisoners presently a dull boom was heard there was a whistling sound and with a thud followed by a loud explosion a bomb fell and burst in the open space this was the signal for action the pirates in a moment hurried down to the bastions overlooking the sea and the englishmen gathered in a group near the entrance to the magazine beside their knives they had no arms but each had picked up two or three heavy stones a minute after the explosion of the shell the cannonade of the ships broke out it was answered by only a few guns from the fortress and yells of astonishment and rage were heard to arise a moment later five natives ran up to the group of englishmen their work had been well done 
and more than three-fourths of the gun on his sea face had been rendered temporarily useless. Charlie gave the word, and with a rush they entered the upper fort. There were but two or three men there who were just hurrying out with their bags of powder. These, before they realized the position, were instantly knocked down and bound. The gate of the fort was then shut and barred, and the party ran up to the bastion above. Not a single pirate was to be seen there. The six guns which stood there were at once loaded with grape, and a heavy discharge was poured into the crowded masses of pirates upon the bastions on the sea face. These, already greatly disturbed at finding that most of their guns had in some way been rendered useless, were panic-stricken at this sudden and an unexpected attack from the rear. Many of them broke from their guns and fled to shelter. Others endeavored to turn their cannon to bear upon the magazine. The wildest confusion raged. At last some of their leaders rallied the men, and with yells of fury, a rush was made towards the magazines. They were received with another discharge of grape, which took terrible effect. Many recoiled, but their leaders, shouting to them that the guns were discharged and that there were but a dozen men there, led them on again. Charlie leaped upon the edge of the parapet and shouted, If you attack us, we will blow up the magazines. I have but to lift my hand and the magazine will be fired. The boldest of the assailants was paralyzed by the threat. Confusion reigned throughout the fortress. The fleet kept up their fire with great vigor, judging by the feebleness of the reply that something unusual must be happening within the walls. The gunners, disheartened by finding their pieces useless and unable to extract the wooden plugs, while Charlie's men continued to ply them with grape, left their guns, and with the greater portion of the garrison disorganized and panic-stricken, retired into shelter. A shell from the ships falling on to a thatched building set it on fire. The flames rapidly spread, and soon all the small huts occupied by the garrison were in flames. The explosion of a magazine added to the terror of the garrison, and the greater portion of them, with the women and children, ran down to the water and, taking boats, attempted to cross to Fort Goa on the mainland. They were, however, cut off by the English boats and captured. Commodore James, who commanded the squadron, now directed his fire at Fort Goa, which was being feebly attacked on the land side by a Mahratta force which had been landed from the Mahratta fleet, accompanying the English ships, a few miles down the coast. The fort shortly surrendered, but while the Mahrattas were marching to take possession, the governor, with some of his best men, took boat and crossed over to the island of which, although the fire had ceased after the explosion of the magazine, the English had not taken possession. The fire from its guns again opened, and as Commodore James thought it probable that the pirates would in the night endeavor to throw in large reinforcements, he determined to carry it by storm. The ships opened fire upon the walls, and under cover of this, half the seamen were landed. Those ran up to the gate and thundered at it with their axes. Charlie and his companions aided the movement by again opening a heavy fire of grape upon the guns, which bore upon the sally port, and when the gates were forced, the garrison, utterly dispirited by the cross-fire to which they were subjected, at once laid down their arms. End of chapter 15Chapter 16 of With Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. A Tiger Hunt. Commodore James was greatly astonished at the easy success which he had gained. The extraordinary cessation of fire from the sea face and the sound of artillery within the walls had convinced him that a mutiny among the garrison must have taken place but upon entering the fort he was surprised indeed at being received with a hearty english cheer from a little body of men on the summit of an interior work the gate of this was at once thrown open and charlie followed by his party advanced towards the commodore 
I am Captain Marriott, sir, of the company's service in Madras, and was captured three months ago by these pirates. When you attacked the place yesterday, I arranged to effect a small diversion, and, with the assistance of these five native officers, of my soldier servant here, and these ten men of the merchant service, we have, I hope, been able to do so. The native officers disabled the greater portion of the guns during the night, and when you opened fire this morning, we seized this inner work, which is also the magazine, and opened fire upon the rear of the sea defenses. By dint of our guns, and of menaces to blow up the place if they assaulted it, we kept them at bay until their flag was hauled down. Then, sir, Commodore James said warmly, I have to thank you most heartily for the assistance you have given. In fact, it is you who have captured the fortress. I was by no means prepared to find it so strong, and indeed have come to the conclusion last night that the force in my command was wholly insufficient for its capture. Fortunately, I determined to try the effect of another day's fire. But had it not been for you, this would assuredly have been an ineffectual as the first. You have indeed performed a most gallant action, and I shall have great pleasure in reporting your conduct to the authorities at home. The sailors had now landed in considerable force. The garrison was disarmed and taken as prisoners on board the ships. Very large quantities of powder were found, stored up, and a strong parties at once began to form mines for the blowing up of the fortifications. This was a labor of some days. When they were completed and charged, a series of tremendous explosions took place. Many of the bastion were completely blown to pieces. In others, the walls were shattered. The prisoners were again landed and set to work, aided by the sailors. The great stones which composed the walls were toppled over the steep faces of the rock on which the fort stood, and at the end of a fortnight, the pirates' hold of Suwandrug, which had so long been the terror of the Indian seas, had disappeared. The fleet returned to Bombay, for it was evidently wholly insufficient to attempt an assault on Geria defended as that place would be by the whole pirate fleet which had even without the assistance of its guns proved itself a match for a squadron double the strength of that under the command of commodore james the rejoicings at bombay were immense for enormous damage had been inflicted on the commerce of that place by this pirate hold situated but eighty miles from the port commodore james and his officers were fettered and charlie marryat had his full share of honor the gallant sailor everywhere assigning to him the credit of its capture charlie would now have sailed at once for madras but the authorities wished him to remain as clive was shortly expected to arrive with a considerable force which was destined to act against the french in hyderabad the influence of Bussy with the nizam rendered this important province little better than a french possession and the territory of our rivals upon the sea coast had been immensely increased by the grant of the five districts known as the northern sirdars to Bussy. it was all that the english could do to hold their own around madras and it was out of the question for them to think of attempting single-handed to dislodge Bussy from hyderabad between the Nizan, however, and the Peishwar of the Deccan, there was a long-standing feud, and the company had proposed to this prince to aid him with a strong English force in an attack upon Hyderabad. Colonel Scott had, in the first place, been sent out to command this expedition, but when Clive, wearied with two years' life of inactivity in England, applied to be appointed to active service the directors at once appointed him governor of fort st davis and attained for him the rank of lieutenant colonel in the royal army they directed him to sail at once for bombay with three companies of the royal artillery each a hundred strong 
and three hundred infantry recruits upon his arrival there he was to give colonel scott any assistance he required that officer however had died before clive arrived upon reaching bombay clive found that events had occurred in the south which would prevent the intended expedition from taking place the french government had suddenly recalled duplex the great man whose talent and statesmanship had sustained their cause on his return to france instead of treating him with honor for the work he had done for them they even refused to repay him the large sums which he had advanced from his private fortune to carry on the struggle against the english and duplex died in poverty and obscurity in his place the french governor had sent out a man by the name of gotchen who was weak and wholly destitute of ability at the time of his arrival the english were hardly pressed and a strong french fleet and force were expected on the coast when however mr sanders proposed to him a treaty of neutrality between the indian possessions of the two powers he at once accepted it and thus threw away all the advantages had struggled so hard to obtain the result of this treaty however was that the english were unable to carry out their proposed alliance with the peshwa against the nissan and buzi upon clive's arrival charlie at once reported himself to him for a time however no active duty was assigned to him as it was uncertain what steps would now be taken finally it was resolved that taking advantage of the presence of clive and his troops and of a squadron which had arrived under admiral watson the work commenced by commodore james should be completed by the capture of Jeria and the entire destruction of the pirate power the peshwa had already asked them to aid him in his attack upon angria and commodore james was now sent with the protector and two other ships to reconnoitre Jeria, which no englishman then living had seen the natives described it as of enormous strength and it was believed that it was an eastern gibraltar commodore james found the enemy's fleet at anchor in the harbour notwithstanding this he sailed in until within cannon shot and so completely were the enemy cowed and demoralized by the loss of suwarndrug that they did not venture out to attack him after ascertaining the position and character of the defences he returned at the end of december to bombay and reported that while exceedingly strong the place was by no means impregnable the mahratta army under the command of ramaji punt marched to blockade the place on the land side and on the eleventh of february seventeen fifty six the fleet consisting of four ships of the line of seventy sixty four sixty and fifty guns a frigate of forty four and three of twenty a ship called a grab of twelve guns and five mortar ships arrived before the place beside the seamen the fleet had on board a battalion of eight hundred europeans and a thousand sepoys the fortress of geria was situated on a promontory of rock a mile and a quarter broad lying about a mile up a large harbour forming the mouth of a river the promontory projects to the southwest on the right of the harbour on entering and rises sheer from the water in perpendicular rocks fifty feet high on this stood the fortifications these consisted of two lines of walls with round towers the inner wall rising several feet above the outer the promontory was joined to the land by a sandy slip beyond which the town stood on this neck of land between the promontory and the town were the docks and slips on which the pirate vessels were built or repaired and ten of these among which was the derby which they had captured from the company lay moored side by side close by the docks when the fleet arrived off the place charlie marriott had been sent by clive as commissioner of the mahratta army a party of mahratta's horsemen came down to bombay to escort him to charlie at which place the mahratta army was assembled for their march 
He was accompanied by Tim and Hossein, who were, of course, like him, on horseback. A long day's ride took them to their first halting place, a few miles from the foot of a splendid range of hills, which rise like a wall from the low land from a vast distance along the coast. At the top of these hills, called in India, Gorts, lay the plateau of the Deccan, sloping gradually away to the Ganges, hundreds of miles to the east. Are we going to climb up to the top of them mountains, Your Honor? No, Tim. Fortunately for our horses, we shall skirt their foot for a hundred and fifty miles till we get behind Jeria. You wouldn't think that a horse can climb them, Tim said. They look as steep as the side of a house. In many places they are, Tim, but you see there are breaks in them. At some point, either from the force of streams or from the weather, the rocks have crumbled away and the great slopes, which everywhere extend halfway up, reach the top. Zigzag packs are cut in these, which can be traveled by horse and pack animal. There must be quantities of game, Charlie said to the leader of the escort, on the mountain sides. Quantities, the Mahratta said. Tigers and bears swarm there and are such a scourge that there are no villages with miles of the foot of the hills. Even on the plateau above, the villages are few and scarce near the edge. So great is the damage done by wild beasts. But that is not all. There are numerous bands of dacoits who set up the authority of the Peshwar at defiance, plunder travelers and merchants going up and down, make raids into the Deccan and plunder the lowland nearly up to the gates of Bombay. Numerous expeditions have been sent against them, but the dacoits know every foot of the hills. They have numerous impregnable strongholds on the rocks, which you can see rising sheer up hundreds of feet from among the woods on the slope, and can, if pressed, shift their quarters and move fifty miles away among the trees while the troops are in vain searching for them. I suppose there is no chance of their attacking us, Charlie said. The decoit never fights if he can help it, and then only when driven into a corner, or when there appears a chance of very large plunder. He will always leave a strong party of armed men, from whom nothing but hard blows is to be got in peace. The journey occupied five days and was most enjoyable. The officer of the escort, as the Peshwar's agent, would have requisitioned provisions at each of the villages, but Charlie insisted under one pretense or another on buying a couple of sheep or kids at each halting place for the use of his own party and the escort. For a few copper coins, an abundant supply of fruit and vegetables was obtained, and as each night they spread their rugs under the shade of some overhanging tree, smoked their pipes lazily, the very excellent meal which Hosan always had prepared. Charlie and Tim agreed that they had spent no pleasanter time in India than that occupied by this journey. Charlie was received with much honor by Ramaji Punt, and was assigned a gorgeous tent next to his own. People in England, Mr. Charles, said Tim that evening, turn up their noses at the thought of living in tents. But what do they know of them? The military tent is an uncomfortable thing. And as for the gypsy tent, a decent pig wouldn't look at it. Now this is like a palace, with its carpet underfoot and its sides covered with silk hangings and its furniture fit for a palace. Father Murphy wouldn't believe me if I told him about it on oath. If this is making war, Your Honor, I shall be in no hurry for pace. The Mahratta force took up its positions, beleaguering the town on the land side, some weeks before the arrival of the fleet, Commodore James with his two ships blockading it at sea. There was little to do, and Charlie accepted with eagerness an offer of Ramaji Punt that they should go out for two or three days tiger hunting at the foot of the hills. Well, Mr. Charles, Tim said, when he heard of the attention. If you want to go tiger hunting, Tim Kelly is not the boy to stay behind. But sure, ye honor, if the creatures will lave ye alone, why should you meddle with them? 
i saw one in the cage at arcot and it's a best i shouldn't wish to see on a long road in a dark night it had a way of wagging its tail that made you feel uncomfortable like to the sole of your boots and after looking at me for some time the baste opened its mouth and gave a roar that shook the whole establishment it's a baste safer to be let alone than to meddle with but we shall be up on top of an elephant we shall be safe enough there you know maybe your honor tim said doubtfully but i mind me that when i was a boy me and my brother peter were throwing sods at an old tomcat of my mother's who had stolen our dinners and it ran up a wall ten feet high well your honor the tiger is as big as a hundred tomcats and by the same token he ought to be able to run up a wall a thousand feet high tim he can't do that indeed i question whether he could run up much higher than a cat we are to start this evening and shall be there by midnight the elephants have gone on ahead at sunset the party started it consisted of ramajee punt one of his favorite officers and a score of soldiers an officer had already gone on to enlist the services of the men of two or three villages as beaters a small but comfortable tent had been erected for the party and supper prepared the native shikari or sportsman of the neighborhood had brought in the news that tigers were plentiful and that one of unusual size had been committing great depredations and had only the day before carried off a bullock into the thickets a mile from the spot at which they were encamped the saints preserve us tim said when he heard the news a cat big enough to carry off a mouse in her mouth as big as a bullock it seemed almost impossible tim but it is a fact that tigers can carry in their mouth full-sized bullocks for considerable distances and that they can kill them with one stroke of their paw however they are not as formidable as you would imagine as you will see tomorrow. in the morning the elephants were brought out charlie took his place on the front of a howdah with tim behind him three rifles were placed in the seat and these tim was to hand to his master as he discharged them ramajee punt and his officer were also mounted on elephants and the party started for their destination it's as bad as being at sea mr charles tim said it does roll about tim you must let your body go with the motion just as on board ship you will soon get accustomed to it on reaching the spot which was a narrow valley with steep sides running up into the hill the elephants came to a stand the mouth of the valley was some fifty yards wide and the animal might break from the trees at any point the ground was covered with high coarse grass ramajee punt placed himself in the centre assigning to charlie the position on his right telling him that it was the best post as it was on this side the tiger had been seen to enter soon after they had taken their places a tremendous clamour arose near the head of the valley drums were beaten horns blown and scores of men joined in with shouts and howls what on earth are they up to mr charles they are driving the tiger this way tim now sit quiet and keep a sharp look back and be ready to hand me a rifle the instant i have fired the noise increased and was plainly approaching the elephant fidgeted uneasily the baste has more sense than we have said tim and would be off if that little black chap a straddle of his neck didn't keep on patting his head presently the mouth pointed silently to the bushes ahead and charlie caught sight for a moment of some yellow fur apparently the target had heard or scented the elephants for it again turned and made up the valley presently a redoubled yelling with the firing of guns showed that it had been seen by the beaters ramajay punt held up his hand to charlie as a signal that next time the tiger might be expected suddenly there was a movement among the bushes the tiger sprang out about halfway between charlie's elephant and that of ramajay punt 
it paused for a moment on seeing them and then as it was about to spring forward two balls struck it it sprang a short distance however and then fell rolling over and over one ball had broken a foreleg the other had struck it on the head another ball from amaji punt struck it as it rolled over and over and it laid immovable why didn't you hand me the next rifle tim charlie said sharply it was clean out of my head altogether to think now and you kill it in a moment the tiger is a poor beast anyhow i've seen a cat make ten times as strong a fight for its life holy moses the last exclamation was called from tim's lips by a sudden jerk a huge tiger far larger than that which had fallen had sprung up from the brushwood and leaped upon the elephant with one fore for he grasped the howdah and with the other clung to the elephant's shoulder an inch or two only behind the leg of the mahout charlie snatched the rifle from tim's hand thrust the nozzle into the tiger's mouth just as the elephant swerved round with sudden fright and pain at the same moment the weight of the tiger on a howdah caused the girth to give way and charlie tim and the tiger fell together on the ground charlie had pulled his trigger just as he felt himself going and at the same moment he heard the crack of ramaji's punch rifle the instant they touched the ground tim and charlie cast themselves over and over two or three times and then leaped to their feet charlie grasping his rifle to make the best defense he could if the tiger sprang upon him the creature lay however immovable it's dead tim charlie explained you needn't be afraid and no wonder your honor when i pitched head first smack onto his stomach it would have killed the horse it might have done tim but i don't think it would have killed the tiger look here charlie's gun had gone off at the moment when the howdah turned round and had nearly blown off a portion of the tiger's head while almost at the same instant the ball of ramaji punt had struck it in the back breaking the spine death had fortunately for tim been instantaneously the tiger last killed was the great male which had done so much damage the first a female the natives tied the legs together placing long bamboos between them and carried the animals off in triumph to the camp the elephant on which charlie had ridden ran some distance before the mayhap could stop him he was indeed so terrified by the onslaught of the tiger that it was not considered advisable to endeavor to get him to face another that day ramajee punt therefore invited charlie to take his seat with him on his elephant an arrangement which greatly satisfied tim whose services were soon dispensed with i'd rather walk on my own feet mr charles than ride any more of those great bests they're uncomfortable anyhow it's a long way to fall if the saddle goes round and the next time one might not find a tiger handy to light on Two more tigers were killed that afternoon, and, well pleased with his day's sport, Charlie returned to the hunting camp. The next day, Hussein begged that he might be allowed to accompany Charlie in Tim's place, and, as the Irishman was perfectly willing to surrender it, the change was agreed upon. The march was a longer one than it had been on the previous morning a notorious man-eating tiger was known to have taken up his abode in a large patch of jungle at the foot of an almost perpendicular wall of rock about ten miles from the place where the camp was pitched the patch of jungle stood upon a steep terrace whose slopes were formed of boulders the patch being some fifty or sixty yards long and thirty deep it is a nasty place ramajee pump said to get him from the beaters cannot get behind to drive him out and the jungle is too thick to penetrate how do you intend to proceed charlie asked we will send a party to the top of the hill and they will throw down crackers we have brought some rockets too which we will send in from the other side we will take our places on our elephants at the foot of the terrace 
the three elephants took their post at the foot of the boulder-covered rise as soon as they had done so the men at the top of the rock began to throw down numbers of lighted crackers while from either side parties sent rockets whizzing into the jungle for some time the tiger showed no signs of his presence and charlie began to doubt whether he could be really there the shikaris however declared that he was certainly in the jungle he had on the day before carried off a woman from a neighboring village and had been traced to the jungle round which a watch had been kept all night suddenly uttering a mighty roar the tiger bounded from the jungle and stood at the edge of the terrace startled at his sudden appearance the elephants recoiled shaking the aim of the riders three shots were however fired almost at the same moment and the tiger with another roar bounded back into the jungle i think the rajah said that he is badly hit listen to his roarings the tiger for a time roared loudly at intervals then the sounds became lower and less frequent and at last ceased altogether in vain did the natives above shower down crackers in vain were the rockets discharged into the jungle an hour passed since he had last been heard i expect that he's dead charlie said i think so too rama j punt replied but one can never be certain let us draw off a little and take our luncheon after that we can try the fireworks again if he will not move then we must leave him but surely charlie said we might go in and see whether he's dead or not a wounded tiger is a terrible foe the ramage answered better leave him alone charlie however was anxious to get the skin to send home with those of the others he had shot to his mother and sisters it might be very long before he had an opportunity of joining in another tiger hunt and he resolved that if the tiger gave no sign of life when the bombardment of the jungle with fireworks raid commenced he would go in and look for his body end of chapter sixteen